Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, uh, special occasion at uh, the Norwegian Pavilion uh, at Frankfurt Bookmesse, because we are going to now uh, launch a Norwegian book series in Chinese. It's already been launched in uh, China, in Shanghai, and Beijing, but because this uh, amazing translation project of Norwegian literature is connected to the Guest of Honor project also. Uh, we wanted also to make it uh, uh, presented here for you in the pavilion. Uh, Norwegian literature travels around the world these days uh, in uh, amazing uh, amounts and uh, it's uh, fantastic to see how Norwegian literature uh, reach out, uh, reach the international readers. And um, one of the most uh, extraordinary projects this year was the launch of 10 Norwegian books that came out in Chinese. Uh, it's the first time that such a high number of books from Norway has been translated to Ch Chinese in one project. It's actually the biggest translation project of Norwegian literature yeah in China since the translation of Ibsen's work. And in this uh, <coughs> event, we're going to talk about some of the books in this series, uh, the experiences from the launch in China, and we are so lucky to have two of the authors here, Roy Jakobsen and Hanne Ørstavik. Uh, and it's um, uh, two very good uh, representatives of the project because uh, they have both written a whole range of novels uh, they are great storytellers, and uh, uh, they are uh, among a very good uh, list of authors in the series. The other uh, authors are Osne Seierstad, Torvald Sten, Lin Nullmann, Per Pettersson, Thomas Espedal, Gunnar Stålesen, Kjell Askilsen, and Herbjörg Vassmo. So it's a, it's a great list, and this is due to the uh, selection of the Chinese Publishing House, uh, Shanghai Translation Publishing House, uh, which we are so happy to cooperate with uh, on the, from the Norwegian side. Um, we have also together with us the vice director from uh, Shanghai Translation Publishing House, uh, Mr. Chao Wu Ping, and we are delighted to welcome him, him first to uh, to say uh, some words uh, about the project from their side. Welcome, Mr. Tzu Ping. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to join you today, together with Mr. Roy Jakobsen, Ms. Hanna, Ostavik and our friend from Nora to present this anthology of contemporary Norwegian literature to you. Uh, Shanghai Trans Publishing House was founded in the year 1978. We are the largest uh, comprehensive publishing house in China, specializing in translation. And we have always believed in literature as an acknowledged medium around the world for cultural communications. During our 40 years of publishing, we have brought many contemporary foreign literatures to Chinese readers, yet this anthology is still one of the most special program we ever made. Those 10 titles presenting the highest achievement of contemporary Norwegian literature is the most influential in the comprehensive project in China till now. <coughs> they each have their own unique style, but all together bring us the beauty and the vitality of Norwegian literature nowadays. We've already launched this anthology in China this August during Shanghai Book Fair with Roy and Margaret join us in Shanghai. It has received with wide attention 
not only among press, but also in terms of general readers. And we are truly honored to be a part of this year's Guest of Honor program here at Frankfurt. We hope this anthology would provide better understanding between Norwegian and China, <clears throat> and witness more further collaboration between our two countries. Last but not least, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our cooperators, NORA, the Embassy of Norwegian in China, and the Norwegian Consulate in Shanghai and Guangzhou. Without your support, this program could never be accomplished. Thank you again for having here, and the best luck with the rest of you for the book fair. Thank you. Thank you for your nice words. Uh, then we would like to uh, ask the authors about uh, their books. And you can see the whole series on display here on the tables. And uh, we also must admire the covers. They are really beautiful. So it's a great honor to be published by uh, your publishing house, I guess, and I would like to ask Hanne about that. Uh, your, uh, the title in this series is the book uh, Love that came out uh, some years ago. Uh, could you tell us a little bit uh, about the book and how you uh, experienced to, to be translated not only to Chinese but on a general basis? Yes, uh, the novel Love in Norwegian called Kjærlighet. Uh, it's here in this beautiful, this one. Isn't it beautiful? And um, uh, it's a novel about uh, a, a mother, uh, a single mother and her son, Jon. Uh, it takes place one winter evening and, and, uh, and into the night, a very, uh, and it's at the very, very north of Norway, situated. Uh, and, um, and the novel follows mother and son uh, during these hours of, of, of cold when they both go out into, into the night. And, and what I wrote this novel when my, my daughter was just a newborn child uh, 24 years ago. So it's <laughs> It's an old novel, and I'm, I'm so grateful that it's still it's still alive. Uh, and uh, I, the the question, it's called love. The word love is never mentioned in the novel, and I think really, uh, I wrote it when my daughter was newborn, and, and and the question I really took with me into the novel was the question I had with her when she was newborn. I mean, how can I? ever be sure that she knows that I love her. Uh, what is love? Uh, and this book was an investigation of a mother and a son and their longing for love. Uh, yes. But, and how is it to be translated? That is wonderful. That is just such a big, such a gift. Um, uh, and, and now it's, uh, well, and how it has been, Margit wanted me to say something about how it has been received in, in other countries. Um, in a way, you, you should think that it is such, a spe because it takes place in the very far north and the coldest the part, in, in, in it's really a winter, a snowy book. Uh, coldness, uh, darkness, everything. So you, but but I really think that this novel, uh, in its, it is very simple. It follows this mother and son, and I think it 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 is something that you can connect to wherever, wherever you live. And I think the question of the novel is is the question I think we all fear inside us. I mean, what if there is nothing? What if there is nothing? Where 
we really longed for something and someone to be. So, so I think it's, it's, and now it's out in Chinese. My father was born in China in 1935 by missionary parents. So I feel that the, no the novel has come home. <laughs> And I'm very grateful. And, and I met my Korean, i just say this very quickly. I met my Korean publisher yesterday. The book has just com come out in Korea. Uh, that for us is kind of close to China. <laughs> you know, it's not. And, and she said that it's already kind of the first uh, edition is already sold out. And, and, it has, and, and I think that is wonderful. It means that, I mean, people really kind of can connect to a book from, from far away, and I think that is, that is a great gift. Thank you. Thank you. And then we also ask the same question for Roy, uh, who was there, actually, to, to launch the, the book. And uh, your book was uh, Vidunderbarn, uh, Child Wonder. When, uh, uh, when I listen to Hanna now, I think uh, I thought uh, I have written the same book. <laughs> at, at least it's the same, uh, some, some similar settings uh, about uh, a boy and his mother, with different na names of course. Uh, it's a, a coming of age novel um, taking place in Oslo, a working class uh, suburbia of, uh, of uh, the capital city of Norway. And uh, they, um, they have to take care of a little sister that appears on page 16 in this novel. It's called Child Wonder, and there is something strange with this um, with this little girl, and she uh, uh, managed, or uh, uh, what shall I say, she uh, the boy has to take care of her because of her strangeness, and through his um, his solidarity and his uh, misconceptions and his love to this strange little creature, he actually uh, managed to grow up too quick with all these different kind of uh, of difficulties that's connected to growing up too fast. It's about losing one's innocence, I would say. Uh, I was actually in China, and of course, it, there, there was there, this is a great honor. It was fantastic. It was it was uh, uh, we were uh, spent a week in Shanghai with some beautiful people who did some amazing work trying to spread this uh, uh, literature from this very, very, very tiny country on the other side of the globe to this very, 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 very big country and, and uh, a re readership like, uh, I don't know, uh, 1.3 uh, billion or something like that. It was so amazing. Uh, I did not feel like coming home. I felt like coming to the moon. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but met uh, a lot of very nice and interesting people. And I also had the opportunity to sit on a stage like this and talk to, to some Chinese critics. And I was really amazed. Uh, first, they did uh, the, the sessions twice as long or three times as long as we usually do in Norway. So I was totally exhausted. Uh, but uh, so many interesting questions, so, uh, so many interesting things to discuss on literature and, uh, and uh, the different countries. When you do travels like this, you, uh, whether you want it or not, you, you uh, serve as some kind of an ambassador for your own country because the questions turn up all the time. How rich are you? How much fish do you, do you, do you export? Uh, how's the winter like? How about the northern light? And stuff like that and, and vice versa. So the, I, had, I had a really, really great time communicating with, um, with the Chinese um, uh, readership during this week, more than a week actually. And um, uh, I'm very honored, uh, and uh, I love it. Thank you very much. And uh, it seems uh, it's a common topic, yes, in uh, in the two novels. It's something between yeah, uh, children and parents, and maybe this is uh, also something that is interesting for the Chinese uh, audience. Could you? say something, do you already have some uh, uh, response from readers uh, back to the publishing house? Uh, just as Marguerite mentioned in her speech at the very beginning, China has a history of publishing Norwegian literature for over 100 years. And uh, Ibsen, the playwright, was the very first one. And uh, he is still popular in China and uh, still very active on stage in China now. But uh, for contemporary Norwegian literature, 
uh, most audience are not so familiar with. So when we launched this anthology this year, many readers, they gave us their very strong encouragement and uh, wish us could publish more from your country with more uh, writings from the young generation. Yeah, That's so we are lo so lucky and so honored to have that. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, um, the um, uh, the um, you, your books uh, that has been translated now, uh, they are also translated into to German and uh, a lot of other languages. Uh, are there some differences in the way uh, your books are received abroad, Roy? Well, uh, my Chinese is not fluent, so um, uh, I can't uh, actually say s uh, s something intelligent about that. But um, uh, uh, to, to, to come to a, new, uh, to a new language, to be published in a new language, is always breaking new ground, and you always uh, get dif uh, different questions. Uh, f for, for instance, uh, there is this topic, this very, very common topic in uh, in. Uh, in uh, in China today is a one child policy for instance and I, I always uh, got the questions from the audience and from the critics about uh, the characters in my book because this is a single mother and uh, uh, living with her with, with her brother and they try to make comparisons and allegories and uh, and uh, uh, the, yeah the, the, there was a we have a very m many interesting comparisons to to this uh, to this situation one, one child, one grown up, and the communication and the misconceptions that's going on between them. Uh, none of them uh, being fully able to understand, the boy not fully uh, uh, able to understand his mother, and his mother not fully uh, capable of understanding his, uh, he, he, her son. And uh, even greater problem with a little girl, even though she identifies with her. Um, and um, yeah, there, there were, uh, uh, w when I came, I. I looked at all the differences, but during this week, uh, I also uh, had an eye opener for for the similarities, the conditions of being a human, whether you are chi Chinese or, uh, or or Norwegian. There are so many, there are so many things that connect us, and uh, it's really amazing to experience that. Yeah. <coughs> also, would like to mention that uh, Roy Jakobsen has uh, uh, his latest books, uh, the tr the trilogy. Uh, which is uh, published by Kaplan Dam in Norway. It's also uh, released in German now, and it's also going to be uh, published in in Chinese. It's a very it's a different story. It's uh, a more historical topic from the hardship uh, of Norway. What do you expect uh, from the? Response well, in China. My, my expectations are great. <laughs> I must just <laughs> tell you a little uh, anecdote about this. I was um, uh, I, I had the um, the ability to um, the pleasure to to visit the book fair in Shanghai, and I was interviewed on stage uh, there like this, and uh, I got the question of uh, how whether I looked forward to go to to Germany this 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 autumn to visit wor the world's uh, biggest b uh, book fair. And I have been it twice or three times before, and I had to tell the guy at the Frankfurt Book Messe, is nothing compared to this. The book fair in Shanghai, with a, a city with 27 million people, I think three of them were in uh, inside the, <laughs> uh, uh, the 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 book fair uh, all the time. It was so amazing, a sea of people. My new book. Uh, uh, I, have, uh, I have, I have, of course, uh, expectations, uh, uh, and uh, it's a historical novel. I, talk, I have been talking about it for a whole week now in here in Germany, uh, traveling around, uh, around on some so-called Lesungen uh, that I love here in this country. It's a historical novel, a little uh, starting up uh, a, a, a woman. A little girl in the beginning is the main character, and I'm follow following her from the very, very poor uh, uh, past of uh, my country about 100 years ago, 
uh, until she grows up. And she, I have her live through all these difficult phases of, from uh, abject poverty, po poverty through war, to after war, the aftermath, uh, coming to terms with the past, and then the oil and the riches and stuff like that. It's um, uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a big book and a very very strong woman. So I'm looking forward to it. I know that the Chinese women are very strong. So I'm I'm I, I'm I am hoping to be able to flirt with them with, with my character. So we will we will see. Thank you. I also want to ask uh, Hanne about, uh, and you can also comment. But uh, you also published uh, uh, a novel, your newest title, Roman Milano. I just also wanted you to comment on. What has happened uh, since you published uh, Liebe until your recent book? That's a long story. I, I, I would, I, I, can I rather say something about what, uh, how it has been received? Charlie had to love the Chinese uh, now in different countries. I think it's so interesting because uh, um, if, if, if I go with this novel with a single mother and her son, if I go to like uh, countries where where women really have a hard time being a mother, uh, a single mother. That is o often a, po a topic that they that they really want to discuss. Um, also, because I, I think that the deep the deep topic of the novel, in a way, is so silent and painful. So we kind of tend to discuss things that are really able to that we can that we have words for, but. Now it has also recently come out in Italy, and in Italy, they have this this uh, they have this big illusion about mother love. I mean, la mamma italiana. I mean, you you, you can't. I mean, and then to have this the mother character in this book who is so little uh, of the traditional mother uh, to them that is really really kind of. Uh, it's almost like a taboo, uh, and I think that it's so. It's so. So it's re it's really interesting to have the book come out in different countries, and I'm really curious uh, of uh, of how it will be received in in China. Uh, yes, hmm. in these aspects too. Very nice. Thank you so much. I will like to uh, pose a last question because. Uh, in the run-up to the book fair uh, with Norway's guest of honor, we we had a lot of uh, great uh, media coverage, articles about Norwegian literature in the media all over Germany. It's fantastic. And in the Spiegel, we had an article about five outstanding Norwegian authors. Uh, and uh, the article quoted that Norwegen is one of the literary centers of our time. And I like that sentence very much. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, why do you think it is like this now, Hanne? Well, uh, I don't know if you ever heard about the Norwegian uh, literary support system that we have from the government that's called in Norwegian Inköpsordningen. Uh, the, the Norwegian, how do, you call, how do you say that in English? Purchasing system. The purchasing Sorry. system. That they, the uh, the state of Norway buys thousand copies of every book, uh, literary book that is above a certain level of quality, and they are di distributed to the libraries and uh, so the libraries and and uh, yeah, uh, yes, so the readers get access to the books, uh, which is kind of a triangle. Uh, the books are published. The publishers can take risk. They can publish things that are not not only what they think will sell, but what they think is really good quality literature. And also, what my publisher said uh, 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 not long ago uh, that I found really interesting. He said, uh, uh, "You have to a publisher have to publish what you don't know. What you don't know what is. I mean, this is a this text is intriguing. I like it. I don't know what it is." So I have to publish it, and I think that is so interesting. So um, I'll I'll answer quickly. Uh, so I think this, uh, the publisher can publish uh, risky things, without you know, with support, yes, <laughs> without going bankrupt. The pu uh, the writers get paid for th thousand copies. We get paid, that's good, and and the readers get get access to the books. So I mean, it's a 
it's a brilliant solution and it has existed for 60 years so that uh, so that we have had a long time to to nourish uh, to nourish writers who who who, are, who write things that are not commercial but that interesting and i think that's Thank you. beautiful great yes and also it's also because the norwegian writers write outstanding books of course and you are two good examples of that. Thank you so much, Hanne. Amen. Hanne Østervik and Roy Jakobsen. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Suvuping. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Taryn Bjornstad. I am the president of uh, the Norwegian Writers for Children and Young uh, Adults. And um, I am very proud and honored to be presenting for you today Eivind Torsetter. He has become one of the most celebrated and cherished writers for children and young adults in Norway. He's also an illustrator with the same very high standing. His books are translated. They travel all over the world, uh, winning prizes. And today you're here with us. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we will be uh, talking about uh, trolls and fairy tales and sailors yes yeah and uh, text and drawings and uh, the graphic novel mm. 
and uh, the adventure of the very famous now, but uh, yet humble and maybe a bit shy or just very relaxed, maybe, Mulegut, also called uh, Hans, I believe, here in Germany. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he's quite a peculiar character. Who is he exactly? Yes, that's what I'm trying to find out. Uh, who is uh, Mulegutten or Hans? And uh, that's why I make books about him. And uh, I think of Hans or Mulegutten as a character that, uh, um, yes, he can he can be put into different roles. In one book, he's inside a fairy tale. In another book, he's out. Uh, on a sea travel, and I, I think, um, yeah, as I say, he's a bit quite relaxed character. He maybe a bit shy, but also very curious. And uh, where I'm going is, uh, I'm trying to find out what, uh, where is he going this time, and I try to follow him. He can do almost everything or anything uh, with the same expression. <laughs> it's just all right. Yes, I'll he's go all right. sailing. Happy go lucky. Happy go lucky. Um, I want to ask you one more question before you start reading for us, because then you will lure us into the world of, uh, of the Mulegut or the Mulusis. Um Because you're an, a very good illustrator, and also you write, I want to ask you, is it text or drawing, or drawing or text? What comes first for you? What carries your ID mm. first and, and best? Well, for me, it is always the drawing that comes first, and uh, it has always been like that. And I think uh, some people think find that a bit strange that uh, I make the stories with drawings, but uh, think about it. We all did this uh, as a child. We started to draw before we started to write, and you have to draw before you can write. And for me, the fastest way to get into a story is drawing it, and then after a while, the texts start to pop up, and the characters start to speak, and uh, I follow up with text, but always the drawing first. So um, that's the easiest way for me, but for others it's different, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah, we all did that as children, we and then we forget. Yes, and some, of us, never some of us continued. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think we would just enjoy listening to you a little bit and, uh, and get to know the, the, the Mulegut a bit better. Please, please read. Yes, um, I'm, well, this. Uh, book is based on a Norwegian fairy tale by Asbjørnsen and Mo, and I place my character inside this fairy tale and take use the fairy tale as a, a springboard for my own story. And here, uh, the main character is inside the mountain of the troll, and he goes inside. He finds an elevator, takes the elevator up. And uh, I'm going to do a little bit of reading now in Norwegian, a couple of pages. Vår kjære vene, hvem er du? Hvorfor har du kommet hit? Ta dem ro, vevere prinsesse. Jeg skal redde dig. Fra trollet? Ja, ja. Det er mange som har prøvd seg på det. Men ingen kommer levende ut herfra. Nej, det trollet som bor her er det ingen som blir kvitt. Jeg kan jo vise dig rundt før han tar liv av deg. Hø, hø, hø. Du sier ikke stort. Jeg er sulten. Har du noe mat her? Vi har grønt. Skal si du likte grønten? spiser nästan lika mycket som trolle. So in this scene the main character meets the princess in the story which is uh, maybe not a typical princess and uh, you can see them here in the troll's kitchen. Of course everything is very large in the troll's kitchen and uh, it was quite I quite enjoyed drawing uh, inside the almost say apartment or the mountain of the troll and uh, come up with ideas of how it would look inside the troll's uh, uh, home, so to speak. Yeah. And this um, girl, yes. <laughs> that shows up in, in, in all the books, doesn't she? Yes. And here she's a princess. Uh, in another story, she's a, a waitress. 
yes. or, or, or a bartender or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, she's quite similar. And she's not a person that needs to be rescued. No. Um, uh, she's quite cool and also she's the she's same cool, relaxed. Uh, yes. And she's got uh, maybe more of a direction than... Uh, Mulegutten has, and uh, so they are good together, I think, and something happens when I bring them together, I think, so they continue in the next book, uh, she got another role, and I think of my, uh, my characters as uh, ac actors that I can put into different situations and uh, see how they react, but uh, I think uh, Mulegutten and this princess, they need each other uh, in, uh, in the books. And when reading all, all the books, um, when, when seeing the Mulegut, he's kind of very neutral all the time. Uh, yes. And the same actually with the girl or the princess. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet a lot of the other characters are more complex and very detailed mm. drawn. Yes. Why is that on purpose, of course, but uh, can you explain to us a little bit why, yes. why you've done it like that? It was not something I thought about much about when uh, creating the characters, but I can see that afterwards, that if you have a character that is a bit simple, you can, as a reader, you can put something of yourself into it, and you have to use your imagination more than if you have a very complex character. And uh, uh, also, yeah, something there, I think, which is interesting to, to experiment with. And I want to talk to you about uh, the book as a format. Is it for you telling stories or making books? Uh, for me, it's telling stories, I think. Because uh, when I work on projects, I always start with the drawing. And sometimes it turns into a book. Sometimes it might turn into a drawing that hangs on the wall, but it's also a story. But then you tell stories in a different way, because in a book, you have some rules that you follow. If you have a painting or a drawing on a wall, you will read it differently. Uh, but it's about the same thing, but, uh, but in a different format, which decides a little bit of how you read and how you create it, I think. And also, uh, your books is kind of, uh, to me at least, a mix between a graphic novel and a picture book. Some of your spreads are like beautiful picture books mm -hmm. and and the next one could be almost like sketches to uh, mm -hmm. to um, a, a more um, a comic book or, or a graphic novel and yes. it's a mix all the time <coughs> is that also something is that the form that you play with or does yes. it just happen as you I think that's a good with the picture book that you could put so many things into the picture book and you don't really have that many rules uh, you can play with other uh, with cartoons, for example, or with graphic novels, you can put that into it. And um, I think with the graphic novels, it's a different way of reading, maybe. Uh, you're more effic effective in the way of reading. While picture books, you can delve more with the images. And I like both of those. Sometimes you need a bit more speed when you're reading. Sometimes the reader can dive into the pictures. And I like to combine the two. Uh, and when you show us uh, some of the spreads are almost, you don't have them here, I, I think, but some of your spreads are just like sketches. Uh, is that yes. to show us, wh why, why do you do that? Why do you use a page on, on very? It has very much to do with the process, uh, how I am drawing, because I don't really sketch before I start to draw. I start on the original and I draw, and I use either use it or I don't use it. So I make a lot of drawings and then I put them together and uh, see what fits together. And uh, I like uh, to see the, uh, how, how shall you call it? This, you can see the traces of the hand. I like that uh, because uh, it creates some sort of illusion also that this is something that is made, but you have to believe in it. Uh, you have to put something in of yeah. yourself into it as a reader to believe it. And for me, it becomes more genuine when I when I, I get to know you better when mm -hmm. I, I can see your sketches in the book. Yeah, there it are mistakes and there are things going in different yeah. directions, but I, uh, I fi find that interesting as well to use uh, chance in the creative process. Yeah. Um. Here you can see um, uh, Mulegutten. Uh, there's a, uh, I sometimes like this in books when something which is very banal almost happens and of course this never happened you never see this in the fairy tales that the main character is going to the toilet for example but here I used 
five, six pages to tell that Mulgutten is going to the troll's toilet, so you can see him <laughs> sitting there uh, because he's a bit ner nervous before they're going to confront the troll. Uh, and here we can see the troll. And um, this is the way I'm drawing this. Yes, side. this is a very different troll from what's what I'm used to. This yes. uh, because, and uh, could you tell me why he's like a mix between a devil and ghost and everything scary? Yes, he's a bit hard because he's changing all the time and he's more like uh, you can't really get a hold on him. And uh, I wanted to make a troll that was really scary, and. Uh, uh, I tried out a little bit and I found this character which is maybe a little bit ghost-like, a bit devilish, a bit this, here and there. Yeah, this yeah. is a troll that eats people because there's skulls and bones and everything yes, definitely, lying yeah. around him. Yes. Who is your reader? Who is the reader? That's... Uh, yes. I, I f hope the reader is someone who is cur curious and uh, that uh, brings his or her imagination into the book and uh, uh, the reader could be a young person, it could be an old person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, do you have like a normal job? Do you go to work in the morning? And Yes, I have, have a normal job. Uh, and um, I go to work 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 to 4, and I sit at my desk and I make drawings. And uh, this is my workspace. And uh, I think it's, for me, it's a very normal job. And uh, I have a lunch break, and then I s continue to do my drawings. I'm curious about the process when you start. Where do you start here? Is it like on a white paper? Yes, I start on the white paper, and um, usually I have um, some ideas uh, when I'm going to work in the morning, what I'm going to draw, and I start drawing them. And uh, um, here you can see some of the drawings from uh, from the sequel to this book called uh, Mulysses in Norwegian, uh, which is just out in uh, Germany. And um, uh, and this yes, these are the some of the original drawings. And uh, I make a lot of drawings and I put them together and I see okay, these three four pages go together. There's a sequence here and this goes together and I puzzle it together and start make, uh, start writing and try to place it together, have some meetings with my editor, get some some uh, clever tips from my editor and um, yeah, it's a bit here and there and um, putting it all together really. So it's um, uh, I want to be as free as possible in the start of the process and I can narrow it down to and be more critical in the end. Uh, but that's important for me to have the freedom in the beginning, uh, not to stop myself and to try out ideas that maybe are stupid, just to see. And sometimes an idea is stupid in your head, but you, when you get it on, down on the page, it's, it works. You never know. Mm -hmm. uh, you, um, you started as a, an illustrator and you've been illustrating a lot of books for other artists or writers and you still do. Yes. And. Uh, I have asked you before, why is that? Because you're such a good writer as well. Mm. Why don't you just make your own books all the time? I think when I finished like with a big project like this, it's uh, nice to continue drawing, but go into something else, that uh, a world that I couldn't create myself, but uh, that I can be a part of. And uh, it's nice working together with good writers. I really enjoy that. And uh, also, it's a bit different doing my own books and uh, doing illustration for my own books and for o others. Because uh, when I work uh, with uh, other people's text, uh, I can work with the images a bit different because sometimes I can even experiment more with the images because the text is already there and the story is almost there. So uh, with my images, I, I find that the storytelling is so much in the images which uh, sometimes decide very much how the images could be to tell the story. So, so I, l I like doing both, and uh, a mix between this is uh, perfect for me. Mm. They're very lucky. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
I want to ask you about all your characters. If you can go back to where you have your workspace and yes. just the blank paper. Because uh, in Ulysses, especially the band in Ulysses, there's a band there on a, on a cafe or in a, in a bar. Yes. Uh, like a, and uh, <laughs> all the characters are mixed between people and animals. Yes. Uh, what happens in your head when you find all those different characters? Do you know, oh, today he will be a mix between a person and a giraffe, or, or he will be... There are so many mm. funny, strange characters, and, and, and they're, um, they're more um, uh, detailed than the Mulegut and the girl. Mm. So you must spend a lot of time creating them. Yes, uh, a lot of these uh, characters, uh, because I have all that a sketchbook with me, and I sit and draw and make some characters. The people on the bus, you see? Yeah, people on the bus and people around, and uh, sometimes I can go back in my archive and find a sketchbook and uh, look for a character, and maybe there he is, and I can use him. So uh, very often the character I have drawn in the past sometime, and uh, yeah, this character I is perfect for this this kind of situation. Because the characters, to me, it takes me into the nonsense literature, yes. where things are just wild mm. and just happening. Yes, Can I, yes uh, I quite like that. And I like surrealism, and I like this. Uh, uh, I like it when, when it's not, uh, when it's something that is uh, beside you. Yeah, almost, it's bizarre. Yeah, and creating your own world, which is a parallel to this world, mm. in a way. And, uh, yeah. But the fairy tales, is it relevant today? Mm. The, the old fairy tales that you yeah. you work with, are they relevant today? Is it? Yes, I think they're relevant, but we have to tell them again in new ways. I think uh, uh, because that's a part of the fairy tale tradition. You have to; it always has to change, and it has to be uh, put in new situation and told in different ways. So, uh, I think it's relevant, and I think for me the fairy tales they um, they um, give. They speak so much to my imagination, uh, and uh, I think they're incredible. Do you use time on research at all? Is it research or imagination for yeah, you? Imagination. I use my imagination. I, uh, when I did um, the new book, which is out now in uh, in German, Hans Dist uh, in Sea, Mulisses in Norwegian, uh, uh, I, I was thinking. Yeah, I want to take my characters out on a sea travel. Uh, I'm from the countryside. Uh, I'm not used to traveling by boat, stuff like that. Uh, but I always wanted to go on an exotic sea travel as a child. S and I thought, yeah, I'm going to put together three characters that has never been on a boat before and send them out on this expedition without using any references or finding any uh, in literature or anything. I'm just going to use what I have in my head and uh, all the cliches version of this uh, in a way and uh, see what happens. Uh, and I often use this way of working, uh, this limitation uh, when I'm working. Yeah. And I find, yeah. Um, humor. <laughs> There's a lot of humor in that book. Mm -hmm. uh, um, do you use that uh, as a tool, um, or does it just, is it the, <laughs> well, it, it's so much fun, small situation in mm -hmm. it. I think it comes natural to more you? natural also when I'm drawing. I do it unconsciously. Uh, if it's a scary drawing, I'll always put something humorous into it, and I like this mix between uh, that it can be scary, it can be humorous, it can be a lot of different things. And it's one little detail in that book, I, because the Mulegut, he buys some animals to bring on the on the ship. Yes. To keep him company or, or mm. something. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know what kind of animals it is. No. But And then, then they leave it on an island. Mm -hmm. On the last page, there's a lot of them there. Yes. I was laughing so, <laughs> so much. Yeah, that's yeah. a little detail that uh, maybe not every reader see, but uh, when you look for it, and uh, you can see. And I like that... Uh, that <laughs> that uh, details like that that yes. you have to search for. There's a lot yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So you can read actually the book many many times. Yes. Yeah. I have another question. We have time, haven't we? Yes. Um, and that's um, some of the reactions to your book has been that it, it's a kind of a, a Scandinavian feel to it, mm -hmm. uh, to your drawings. Mm. Wh what do you think of that? It's, that's interesting. Uh, 
I, I wouldn't think that myself because my background is uh, I did my illustration uh, education in England, so I was more inspired by maybe English uh, illustration and a lot of European illustration and art. And uh, uh, but I guess that's also if you look for something, you maybe find it, and maybe there are some. Uh, some traces that I don't think about uh, from my background growing up on the countryside maybe uh, there are some things that I unconsciously maybe put into the drawing or the mood or I don't know uh, but uh, yeah it's interesting to hear that yeah mm. I didn't see that so much maybe in the first one the troll one because yes. that's uh, but not in the no. Ulysses so mm -hmm. much maybe mm -hmm. maybe do you work digitally as well? Do mm. you 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 work with the pen and pencils, and you can see that in yes. your drawing. Yes. Do you also work digitally? Do you? Yes, I work digi digitally, and I edit a little bit. I put the book together because I do when I do my own books. Also, when I'm illustrating, I'm doing the whole book. I'm also doing the design and the typing and stuff like that, and. Um, uh, but usually I work with my hands. Most of the work is by hand, so 80-90% is by hand. And uh, mostly the editing is done digitally and putting it together. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, but I quite like doing both, but I really enjoy drawing with my hands mm -hmm. and using my hands as tools. Uh, one question about the Mule, uh, Gutt or Hans. Uh, where did you find him? How did he come to you? With the big nose and the mule means the 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 horses or the cows uh, nose. Mm -hmm. uh, the mule boy is mm -hmm. then <laughs> he's a bit kind of a sad character as well. Yes, well, um, some years ago I made a book uh, called uh, the Hole, uh, which is a book uh, with the hole poked through the book, and I needed a character for this book, and I tried first with a human character and didn't work and uh, I found in an old sketchbook I found this character and I he spoke to me and that's usually how I find the characters they have to be something with them that is interesting and uh, yes I want to see place this character into this situation and see how he reacts mm. Mm. and get to know him and uh, yeah he's um, still an interesting yeah. character to uh, to draw so I'm continuing to yeah does that mean that we will have yes, another book? Uh, I'm working on a new book that hopefully will be out uh, next year ah. and uh, this time uh, he's uh, kind of uh, working uh, with the dinosaurs as a curator for dinosaurs <laughs> and, All right. uh, he's going also this time on a trip we are looking uh, forward Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, I believe you will be signing some books over at the yes. table there with mm -hmm. a with the light. Yes. For the one that's uh, interested. Thank you. And thank you so much. We could talk about this all day. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for having me. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for listening.
Hello. Welcome to this session of uh, slam poetry and short stories. One of the goals of the Guest of Honor project has been to bring forward new authors, new voices of all genres of the literary field. That's why Nurla started up a cooperation with the Foundation Talent Norway. This is a foundation that facilitates various programs to help young artists in the beginning of their career. And through their, their projects, they offer a unique laboratory to develop new talents within all parts of culture. The three young artists that you'll meet today have been taking part in various programs supported by Ta Talent Norway. The first author or the first artist you will meet today is Anna Kaisa Partapuli. She was born in 1994 and is a Swedish Norwegian Sami slam poet. She was awarded the Young Artist of the Year Scholarship at the Ridu Ridu Festival in 2018, and she'll read a poem to us in Sami. So please, Anna Kaisa. Hello, I'm Anna Kaisa. I'm going to read a poem that's called uh, In Sami Idi Puhta Igo Daite. In English, it means uh, the morning will come, won't it? And the title and the inspiration to this poem is from an old traditional yoik that was uh, gathered and written down in the area that my ancestors are from around 200 years ago by the priest Anders Fjellner. Baby Nate Lohti. A yoik where the daughter of the sun is seeing the future of the Sami people and ends with a prayer the morning will come won't it and I got inspired by this because I was thinking here we are and we are the Sami future and I don't know I think I might still be waiting for that morning the son of the daughter saw the colonization and the thieves and you know, this whole uh, indigenous package. And so this is my continue to her prayer. And yeah, I will um, try to translate it, but uh, just please don't take it so serious. I've done it myself. Manne baby is a fighter. Baby Luitan, Gumpe Vuitan, Dalet Eitan, Visu Sitan, Visu Valdan, Ike Gitan, Idi Puata, Ego Daite. Tuus lay rocked on the jacket. O to go stall out Alge sees a bucket, buggy, do eri chop with Iko Deke, Sigalga Husi Gayru, the carpet, Iko seen, Matte, the seen, Latti, if what the moose at your minute, if me met to get, better by the father, he was a missile and touch a moose at, they lag at the Meredi, your licka, the good door, the Shivara duck. The good door, Lucita sees the bucket, the good door, it often visit over the nut to me alone to got to me. Go regret it, I'll do it, the good door, it chaga. By coming lame at us, oh, the cousin, oba, who am I the lager, don't me to you, that's what a naga, your octo. The Dariaga, haga, yes, the swallaga, eat the huolas, chucky, pull me, put it to the wallanut. Stalo, the father, me to it, the rita, the aina may see the warren, mean sit a let, much it, the ahat. Ja pitjiun, vahat, japmimat, vahat, mille tapmujun, lapmujun, slavat, helveha haavit ja kuorus, jätä kaavat. Märkun kardi chaaji valde, viisu valde, viisu polde, viisu polde, tie vain alde kärkilei, lavusi ja suolatuvan, asfalt heri juvun, potju pagun juvun, juvun, vaimut juvun, kolepuvun, kielämät. Ätämi kardi te potuko olmut, haritsi et, etsäset, paatsit etsäset ja mobaitsan, imaste, alma. Kalma, kirko, eana, galla, havde hus halma, verten baajil, oppa, koska ka loppat, ja koes, kalgi muu veljat, ja oppat, vonjasti. Siis aate valdi mu niskai, ja boonjasti, kui tole sama avekidas, kui javkahid mu eetami, kui siin haaladi mu havkahid, ma rohtu paukahid, võiga mind mu taga sinni kuldal mu saukasid, sinni kuldal mu tiiftai, sinni kuldal mu rohkusid. 
kas tuodrast allu leiu märrid on pohtusi ja puhtis pursa kalge jursad tai kuhtunid teid ei saada kossige tuhtadit min ähtnamat olge siin tuhtadit kautseloogi alkul leime tuorvai killan stillan võsta leimet nagu teimet muudu tahti saame tikki jaagime atali vähki mitside Muutule, kui saame tiigi saada unna härva tärvahid ministerid, muhti pääsa jätnudid, nagu kõige võistalase staada jätnudid ja ahti kõige valimasta viisud, min ähtnemid ja aike kõige riivedot ja vaari kõige teevedot pegga millu, kui ne puhumid iveres ville, kui laavud alid neid on, nii kui ta oled pillihun. Staada olmuide mallasin millijun. Teive loita. Staalud pohted. Saamid sohted. Mut staalud, mille kohte saab me latsjai, staalud salli. Staalud aski, tõdu paski ja mis uudi kaska, näeme tjaskid, kaskid, nuppi, nuppid, staalud paitsi tjauge saala, minne tjaga. Algi kondi välja ei täämed, ätki huomed, ahte roomed, staalud suolada min oomid ja min koodid. Kus taata luentu mähtsi, iile min äätamid siivini tähtsi ja staata, iile min pohtsi kähtsi, iige suotsi ja rihka randsi, iile et min adsi ahtsa arran nõskan, äänan nõskan, meitsi kuskan, sanda ruskan ja mõn suskan, et see on vaimu. Mõne siis saa tureda aimu, aimu, mille mid kohu võin rifti riiva, pohtsi on ju võin äätamid ja huksen parti puudi meegu, millu parga ei koivun algan, tohtu jalgan, ruukida ja masin palgan, kui võin vuonat, võrus vuonat, potku on hiilad, potku on suonat, saame ei pahtsa mitside kuunad tuus leiduhtud on jahked must allule teegi parren parren äätna meid allasi saga ka ahtnud ei piinimi ja suhtas tallami kes tallule võsame olmu mallasid see on imaate visa kvassige kallalid saamid villid vaisi pallid massi mis ta allu lihtnas hallasid ja meid tee ja siin potsui piined et tea lämus lea siin ruudid tiined et rifti palkesid ja rihtui alkahidle alki kui mannil saada eetjus palkahid ja heidi vaida lämes mida mitte on kalkalit nagu jehtnja tarra, sparra, märra, marra, arra idada riigi ära, riia pan tšerru arran, varra Ja arran varra ja olmus karra. Olmus ii ääle. Peive loita, kumpe pohted, staalu iite, suota kohted, staalu valde, staalu aite, ja ta valded, eike hoite, ja ta porred, eike heite, ja ta kasked, eike luite. Ja kui pitualud soodi võite, ja kui peivi ei saa paite, ii teid puhta, ii koo taite. Thank you very much, Anna Kaisa Partopuli. Roskva Koritsinski was born in 1989 and is the writer of two collections of short stories and one novel. And she is this year nominated for the uh, Nordic Council's Literary Award. Uh, and she is also taking part in Nurla's program, New Voices. Uh, Roskva will read one of her short stories for us. Peace. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to read uh, a whole short story, but I'm going to read an excerpt from a story called um, Historia non Henne, uh, the story of the hands. Uh, and this story is the longest one in this book. Yeah, I'm like Biden. I have not yet seen the world. Uh, and it's about a middle-aged man uh, who leaves his wife and his small children uh, when he falls in love with a young girl who is a drug addict and that he, in his work as a drug counselor, uh, was supposed to help. Uh, and the story is told from his oldest daughter's perspective uh, as she kind of investigates his life trying to understand who he is. Uh, and I'm going to read in Norwegian, and I think the text is going to be in English on the screen. 
And the book is also in German, like you can see in front of me. När julaften glir över i första juledag sitter du sammansunket i kinnsoffan med tunga ögonlock. Du slår om dåliga vitser, snubblar i ordn. Stemorn min sender dig dels bekymrade, dels nej, nu är inte fejlste. I started the wrong place. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. Det är vinter. Du är 47 år gammal. Dagen för julaften inviterar du en av klienterna dina till fira med oss. Hon är 21, fem år yngre än mig. Hon verkar hjälplös, slik erfarna människor utan språk för sina erfarenheter, gärna virker hjälplösa. Hon har två farliga exkärster och en liten datter. Nu är det högtid och en tränger ett sted att vara. Hon sitter taus vid bordet. Hon spiser lite. Du och stemorn min får en rövin i gave. God jul och tack för allt står det på kortet. Vinen är av dyrt märke och kommer i många nu flaske. Klienten smiler med reguleringstenner, skamfull över sin egen stolthet. Vinen har en slags lås på sig, en treleke som utfordrar mottagarens logiska sans. En stor ring ska genom en smal sprekk, där något speciellt som vinmonopolet har ställt i stand i förbindelse med julen och som ingen av oss klarer att lösa. Vi öppnar en kartong vin i stedet. Efterpå står du ute på trappen. I lyset fra lampen og ved inngangsdøra sine snøfyllene og vugge fra side til side på det samme punktet i luften. Du holder rundt klienten din mens hun røyker. Du har bestandig hatt så store vinger. Når julaften glir over i første juledag, sitter du sammensunket i skinnsoffan med tunge øyelokk. Du slår om dårlige vitser, snubler i ordene. Stemorn min sender deg dels bekymrede, dels iskalde blikk. Klienten sitter med beina opptrukket i en av lenestolene og smiler usikkert. Hun har opplevd verre. Hun tåler dette. Jeg spiser mer kake. Alle har sluttet å drikke for å kompensere for din tvilsomme adferd. Du, som bestandig har vært så profesjonell, som har kjørt ut om nettene og forhindret folk fra å skade seg selv, du som bestandig har tatt på deg litt mer ansvar enn arbeidsbeskrivelsen tilsier, men aldri så mye at det har virket som en overskridelse. Omsorgen har aldri virket suspekt. Nå er du dritings og må hjelpes til sengs. Klienten skal overnatte på sofaen i stuen. Før du legger deg, mumler du fram en beklagelse. Du sier at du nok var mer sliten enn du selv hadde forstått. Du ser på henne. Hun ser på meg. Jeg kikker opp på bildet som henger over sofaen. Det fremstiller oss barna liggende opp av hverandre i en stabel. Du ligger i sengen om natten. Du svever like under taket. Du er flammen som brenner for å kvitte seg med oksygenet. Du er menneske som spiser for å se talerkenen tom. Du har elsket voldsomt for å bruke opp kjærligheten. Du raller som en blind dranker gjennom likk og forelskelser og kjærlighetserklæringer, gjennom barnefødsler og giftemål for en dag å bli fri. Du vet ikke fra hva. Bare det, å bli fri. Du vil også ha et annet sted. Det er om våren. Du er 17 år. Du ligger på magen i gresset. Foran slottet patrullerer gardistene. Du tar et drag av sigaretten og blåser på raktfullt mot de pinnerette unguttene. Du kjenner en dyp misnøye ved alt som heter systemer, rutine, alt som heter vane og orden. Du har forsøkt å skrive om det i en skoleoppgave, men det ble så banalt. Et slags angrep på hverdagsmenneskene, på konformiteten. Språket ligger bestandig så langt unna følelsene dine, så langt unna alt du innbiller deg at du egentlig forstår. Du hadde villet skrive om hvordan du som barn, etter å ha ryddet rommet ditt, kjente deg lykkelig. Det lå en lovnad om forandring i synet av dette rommet som plutselig var et annet, liksom du allerede hadde beveget deg videre mot noe nytt. Men allerede etter noen dager slepte alt seg tilbake mot sitt utgangspunkt, 
Bøkene veltet ut av bokhyllen. Lekene lå strødd ut over gulvet. I vinduskarmen stod glass og kopper, bunnfall. Du ville skrive om hvordan det hadde vært da du fremdeles spilte fotball. Den svine følelsen i lårene etter at du hadde løpt opp over bakkene i byen tidlig om morgenen. Hvordan kroppen din var stram og tynn i speilet. Tilfredsstillelsen i det. Men likevel en fornemmelse av hvor lett alt sammen kunne glippe. Musklene glippe. Leddene stivne. Kjøttet blir løst. Du måtte fortsette å løpe oppover bakker, trapper, i sirkler utenfor kombihallen. Men hvorfor løp du? Hvorfor spiste du når du igjen skulle bli sulten? Hvorfor vaske deg når du ikke for alltid kunne være ren? Du ville skrive om hvordan du av og til så for deg og lukke deg inne på et rom. Slutte å rydde. Slutte å klippe håret. Slutte å bevege deg. Du ville beskrive den murrende følelsen av at forandring paradoksalt nok bare kunne inntrøffe sånn ved å slutte å handle. Hauen av rot som fortsatte å vokse, kroppen som ble dekket i mugg, stadig nye bakterier som blomstret opp. Det var utvikling. Det var forandring. Du formulerte setningen i hodet og ble bedrøvet. Det fantes ikke der det du følte. Det var som at du ville bare si at du ville forandre deg. Du ville bli en annen hver eneste dag. Du ville våkne opp til en annerledes verden. Du ville at livet skulle være noe som ustanselig vokste og skiftet form. Du orket ikke tanken på denne pendelbevegelsen. Du reiste deg. Du tente en ny sigarett. Det var varmt i været, over slottsplassen lå luften tung og dyrende. Du vandret nedover mot sentrum. Du hadde hull i olabuksene og langt hår. De late skrittene dine virvlet opp støvet. Du er dette bildet. Du er ungdommen. Du er det uflidde, sultne, kritiske, lykkelige. Du har hender overalt, men du vet ikke hva du griper etter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hiroskwa. That was very nice. The last one out uh, today of our three young literary performers is uh, Shanin Masika Lukusa. She's a narrator and spoken word artist, and she's also multilingual and creates and performs in both Norwegian, English, Persian, Chiluba, Swahili, and Norwegian Sign Language. So please. run out of places to hide and to store your pain. Take my hand. And when all your holiness have drained, I will read you poetry as honestly as I can. I will let all the cracks of my voice reveal that I have been and certainly am exactly where you need me to be. And when reality gets really real, let my words swoop you up your feet into a world where heroes are made with sobbing as a superpower. And when you begin to go towards your last hour, I will meet you there as if it was the corner store with our favorite candy constantly on sale. And I will tell you that this is how love is made. Yes, I will tell you that this is exactly how love stays. Now, I have um, a bit of a dilemma that I hope that you guys can help me with afterwards. But I'm going to tell you a story. You see, I have a friend, 
And one day she came up to me and told me that she was in an abusive relationship with life. It keeps beating her up and pushing her down from heights. And despite the constant beating, she tells me that she can't leave him. You see, his fist helps her breathe in. They are like oxygen. But then again, I cannot start to comprehend how her worst enemy could at the same time be her best friend. But she loves and tells me that ever since their marriage, his leverage has been that her body was a bongo drum. She's gotten so used to the rhythm that she feels numb. She laughs again and tells me that whatever his soul is made of, his and hers are the same. You see, you can't have love with a bit of pain. The softness of her voice caresses and lingers the whole ways of my ears. And her words paints pictures of whatever he is and I hang these pictures on the walls of my eyes. Therefore, it doesn't come as a surprise when one day she passes by with his purple like black blue eye. And when I ask her why, now I am really colored, is her only reply. And then she tells me to relax, relax. You see, his slap sounds like African symphonies, and he gives her wings, and he sets her free. And when his hands are upon me, she says, even the church bell rings. And she how love is supposed to feel for all of us. You see, what he feels for her, it's more than lust. It's desire. And I envy her. But then, then I remember that she is in an abusive relationship with life. It keeps beating her up and pushing her down from heights. And her lipstick might be bold and she might lash it up with Maybelline. But I truly believe from deep within that with her, there's no in between. She loves unconditionally. You know that phrase, until death do us part. She lives that literally. So if you dusted her heart, looking for fingerprints, you would only find his fists. Now you tell me this. Since she is in an abusive relationship with life, if I asked her to leave, would that be... Would that be suicide? Thank you. Thank you very much. This, um, this was uh, the end of our program. Uh, we, um, you have the possibility to uh, buy a book by uh, Roskva Koretsinski and have it signed at the signing table. So, thank you.
one. And we just start because we don't have that much time, so uh, let's roll. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with uh, two of Norway's most accomplished writers, Vigdis Hjort and Helga Flatland. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to introduce them uh, shortly for everyone who doesn't uh, are not that acquainted with their work. Uh, Vigdis debuted in 1983 and first made a name for herself with highly successful children's books. Uh, but since the 90s, her main focus has been novels for adults. She had been a well-known author in Norway for a long time when her book Will and Testament was released in 2016 and skyrocketed her fame into new territories. I made that up. <laughs> Um, um, and Will and Testament is about four siblings, two summer houses, one terrible secret. When a dispute over her parents' will grows bitter, Bergliot is drawn back into the orbit of the family she fled 20 years before. The novel uh, got great critics in Norway and is now uh, a big success also in the US. And uh, Paris Review wrote, Will and Testament is a compulsively readable novel, one, one that turns questions of shame into weapons against silence. Uh, the debate that followed the novel is one of the biggest literature debates that has been in Norway after 2000, and, is co and it coined the term Virkelighetsliteratur, <laughs> reality fiction, and uh, made it into a big debate team in Norway. We're going to talk about that a bit later, but firstly, my the other uh, author, Helga Flatland, you debuted in 2010 with Believe is to Come, Rise with the More, Stay if you can, Leave if it must, I love the title, <laughs> which she was awarded several literary awards for and has since then published five more books. The last one, En Moderne Familia, was published in 2017 and was the third most sold book in Norway that year. In English, that's called, uh, the title is A Modern Family. and. Um, it's about when Liv, Ellen, and Håkon, along with their parents and children, arrive in Rome to celebrate their father's 70th birthday. A quiet earthquake occurs. Their parents have decided to divorce. The Guardian called A Modern Family a thoughtful and reflective novel about parents, siblings, and the complex and often challenging ties that bind them. As you surely know, uh, the famous quote of Tol Tolstoy, he said in Anna Karenina, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And they are also a lot more interesting to read about, I would say. <laughs> um, Helga, uh, what made you, uh, what was the reason you wanted to write about a family in such a big conflict? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I think families are sort of a grateful literary subject because it's uh, inside the family. The family contains all the big emotions, right? And all the big relationships. You have lovers, you have marriage, you have a friendship, you have siblings and a parent-child, not to say at least. And I think it's, it's uh, sort of... Uh, and then in all these relationships, you also have huge emotions. And I think it's interesting to see how we relate to our family and how the family forms other relationships in our lives. Like um, the early attachment style uh, in the family, for example, to your parents or to your siblings, forms the way we relate to other people later in our lives, lovers or friends. or uh, And so for me, that's probably the reason why, because I'm interested in how we, uh, in, in human relations actually, and, and in reactions to that. So that was um, my uh, starting point, and then I wanted to, first of all, A Modern Family is a novel about siblings, first, uh, foremost, and, and for me the sibling relationship is very interesting and complex, so that's uh, my, uh, my yeah, I think we're going to talk a bit more about the sibling complex because uh, Vigdis also uh, has a lot about that. But firstly, Vigdis, um, why did you write this story now? Uh, what was it that made you feel that this is now what's burning? This is the important, or not now then? I've been writing about um, uh, this kind of topics before, mm. uh, but I've been, you know, circling around it 
But at one point, I decided, now I have to <laughs> do it, you know, right on. And thinking about that, um, this art, um, artist making these sculptures, they have, you, they have this stone, and they have, you know, <coughs> on it. And that was the feeling I had. And now I have to, <coughs> not only, bop, 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 bop. so that's why. Yeah. And the sibling uh, uh, theme is such a long, I mean, it starts with Cain and Abel almost. And uh, uh, it's so potent. And why, isn't it fascinating, or how, why can't we uh, free ourselves from these roles we have uh, as grown-ups. Why, why, what is it in the sibling rivalry or like that even happy siblings, like friend, who are friends, still feel, because I know that, <laughs> these tensions in the way of the grown-up. What are your thoughts on that, like this? Uh, I think that, uh, as Helga said, that, you know, when you are born, you are so dependent if your mother and father don't take care of you, you die. Mm -hmm. So you have these eyes on these people, you know, they are like gods in your life, and you are so dependent. And, and that's uh, how you, you teach to be a human being. And then suddenly there will be a, a sister or a brother, and you should share these gods with them. So that's a kind of, uh, but s still in, in good families, siblings can join to to make a front towards the parents if they're not good, for example. But in damaged families, like the one I'm writing about, the mother and father are in a way, conscious or unconscious, um, they are, you know, they, they are, they, they hindered it and they, they made it, make it difficult for for the siblings to to join to be a, uh, to be together. Yes, and isn't this also fascinating? How so much of this is done without the awareness of the p uh, of the parents? Or maybe they they are aware, yeah. but they don't care. Or they uh, they you know they some parents they like to be gods. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they don't want to to be human beings to to. So they are some mothers, for example. They are so they uh, love to be queens in the children's life, and when the children want to, you know, separate because they have to. Mm. Uh, no, I want to be queen. Oh. Mm. So they they try to be be king and queen all the life, and that's difficult. It makes it very difficult for the for the children to to be free, as you're talking. About. Yeah. Uh, Helga, how do you have? Uh, are you <laughs> do you have any thoughts on this? <laughs> or about what 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 is the most important thing about the sibling theme for you? Like, well, I I think Vigdis uh, said it uh, the best. I, I I think you you sort of are born and and you have to compete for the same attention the, the attention to survive actually, and that forms how we relate to our siblings, of course, in later in life, and then you can be more grown up and more intellectual. Uh, in towards it, but but you still have that competing sort of role in in between your siblings, and I think it's interesting because you're also sort of um, sharing the same references, the same framework, the same uh, genes, and and you turn out to be widely different human beings, and that's also uh, in inter interesting to me because I have three siblings myself, and we are widely different and we are competing a lot but we're still very close friends mm -hmm. so I, I think that's an interesting relationship have you read each other books yes yes yeah. <laughs> uh, what i love this book <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I love helga <laughs> and what what could you get out of the other one's book was it like themes because you've been working so intensively with this both of you was it still like things oh that's the thought i haven't thought about or how did you read the other one's book uh, Helga, do you want to say? Yeah, sure. I, uh, in all these books, I, th I th think thoughts I haven't thought think well, uh, <laughs> very <laughs> thoughtful, thoughtful. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think new thoughts. Uh, and in in uh, what's it called in English? Will and Testament. Will and Testament. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, I thought about the the family in a different way, and also the sort of um, grown up uh, look on 
yourself as a child and, and how you um, can sort of step out of your childish role and but still uh, be in it sort of? Mm. Can you say that? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we say we can say that. <laughs> now, uh, what's interesting for me in, in Helga's book is that, you know, uh, in my book, uh, my last novel, uh, Will, and uh, Will and Testament, um, it's about a damaged family. And the family has been damaged yes. for, for, uh, for 20, 30 years. And but, but in Helga's book, there's, you know, it's a kind of happy family. Mm. It's a kind of, they are, you know, uh, but this er earthquake you know, mentioned the, that the parents suddenly want to, to divorce. It, it's, um, it's probably more difficult to describe a happy family's earthquake mm. than a damaged family. So it's, very, it's a very intelligent uh, work. Um, it's very interesting for me <laughs> to have this experience <laughs> reading about a happy family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, happiness is always uh, hard to write about, actually. Yeah. Happy yeah. people don't make that, uh, it's not as entertaining, and it, you don't have anything to sort of survive. Yeah. So, so happiness is, is almost and impossible to describe. And it can be super annoying. Yeah. That, that as well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stop being happy. <laughs> um, as we talked a bit about, um, your book, Big this started this great debate in, uh, in uh, Norway about what are you allowed to write in a book? Um, this is too close to reality. Um, this shouldn't be allowed or should it be allowed? Can you do whatever you want in a book? All these questions and then they have been like, we're still debating them. Um, but you gave your characters different names it's not Vigdis, it's Bergliot. And wh were you, how surprised were, were you of uh, this I, I was reaction? very surprised. And I think that, you know, people that uh, was on the other side <laughs> in the debate, they don't know their his literary history. Mm. And the novel has al always been very close to, to reality. Dante in Divina Commedia, he's, you know, he's places his enemies with an, uh, real names in different uh, um, um, stages in, in the, in the um, in hell, hell. Yeah. yes. <laughs> and, and you have the letter novel in, in France. You, it, it's always been that. But maybe because now we have everybody can write. Everybody can write about their own life, their blogging. <laughs> but the novel in 400 pages can't tell this whole story of a whole family. Mm. You know, from this meeting here, they could be, we could write thousand novels. Six volumes is not enough uh, to, to, <laughs> to, to, to write a life. Yeah. Of course not. When you want, even if you want to write about your life, if you have, when you start, have you written one sentence, uh, you have, you know, you have Already so lied. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so, so uh, a novel is form and language, a literary structure. Mm. So, you know, I'm just, ah, oh, don't you know this? Can I just have one example? Yeah. Each, uh, talking about Karl Ludwig um, who is, uh, who does something that I don't use names of existing people. But, you know, in Norway, we are four, five hundred um, writers. And they are divorcing all the time. <laughs> and you know, uh, uh, regularly after one year after a divorce, they are writing about the divorce. <laughs> and of course they are uh, a lover or a mistress or a wife or a husband that you know, oh, you're writing about me. But because these novels are selling in 200 X, nobody cares. Mm. So when Knausgård does what he, uh, does. Yeah, he's a Norwegian writer. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, it's because of the, the voice, the literature. It's, it's the power. Mm. It's not the grep. It's not the it's not the literary grep. Yeah. Uh, what to say. Yeah. 
it, it's it's how the uh, emotion he he managed to and it's uh, not a thing that he re he writes about real uh, real characters. It's uh, it's the way he does it that makes people it interested. It it's the way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, Helga? And I would also like your book about the family was then uh, released two years or just one year after uh, Vigdis. Uh, I you were the year after. Yeah, 2017. Yeah. yeah, so I guess you were already long in the, in writing your book when that debate started. But how has that kind of... Did you think about this? Oh, what, how are people going to read my book now? No, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think about that because people can read my book any way they want. And and I think I, I'm, I'm very sick of this debate. Mm. Uh, and I'm tired of it. And I think it's sort of uh, not that interesting anymore. Um, but I... Uh, I, d I don't think, as we said, it's not the writers who have changed their subject or uh, their way towards the literature. It's the landscape around us that have changed. And, and uh, I can't do one single interview with Norwegian Press uh, launching my, my novel without people asking me, oh, are, are your parents divorcing? Or is this you? Or how much of this is your story? Mm -hmm. And when I said all of it and none of it is my story because I wrote it, it's true for me, and it, but it's not real characters. I made it up. And for me, writing is also about making things up, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and I um, think... Yeah, I, I think it's sort of. Uh, I think we have to move on now. But but, of course. But that seems hard for yeah, the yeah, it, it does. Yeah. And and I think also that we have we have now a society that are so reality oriented yeah. that my novels are less interesting to people than me as a person. Mm. So doing interviews um, and trying to discuss. My literary work uh, is hard because everybody wants rather to discuss me and how I live and how much is true. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I 50 think fifty percent, sixty percent. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah they, it's almost like that. Almost percentage. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. still, I've asked Helga. Are yes, you piercing? I know. <laughs> I know. I know. So I and I, I partly blame this generation for <laughs> this development. Yes. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so you don't think it, it doesn't affect you in your writing? or um, It doesn't affect my writing, but it, it definitely affects the way I talk about it because I'm uh, starting to get annoyed, right? So, yeah. so you can hear it just now that I'm like, oh, do we have to go there again? <laughs> yeah. But of course we do. And, and then I would answer the same thing over and over again that, that I think it's not that interesting. The I and we have to be able to discuss the themes in the literature and not the person or the motives behind it mm. uh, from the author's perspective. So I think, yeah, I th we I'm looking forward to the day we can discuss literature uh, in without uh, asking how much of it is true, wi mm. which also is a very weird question. Yeah. What is truth then? Yeah. Yeah, that's very philosophical. But let's talk then a bit about your characters. <laughs> and how would you describe the three siblings in your book? Because they are kind of the main, or especially the two girls, the women. Um, what was the main, how did they come alive for you? What, was, what did you want to them to be? Or well, I wanted them to uh, represent, uh, as Vigdi said, a sort of... A, um kind of? Uh, no, but... Uh, 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 yeah, look uh, that they look like a, a, a happy family uh, yeah. and a well-functioned family. And yeah, indeed, in the start, yeah. Yeah, and and they just do in the start of the novel, and that the uh, importance of the sisters' relationship are that they are dependent on one another, and mm. and they love each other, and they and if you would could ask them, they would say, oh, we're very very close. And when the so-called crisis hits them, mm. uh, and they're facing this divorce, and everybody has to sort of find their new roles, the communication between them, and the sort of uh, their relationship is tested somehow because they do not know how to uh, relate to one another uh, anymore. Mm. So they have to sort of redefine their relationships and their roles. So for me, the si the sisters are interesting in one way, and then their brother, who is far behind them and, and uh, sort of in a different age and a different gender is uh, interesting in another way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And um, yeah, the test in your book, Vig, this that has kind of already, they failed the test as a happy family. And uh, so what was the main, um, with the siblings there, it's already ruined. How, uh, uh, how could you bring them together if it's of course the will, but what's, what does that stand for? What, what's the thing that's like burning here in your novel? What's no, it, it, it's, you know, um, uh, Berglott, the main character, <coughs> her father has abused her as a child. And uh, you can imagine when she's, uh, com she's, uh, she's uh, uh, confronting her, her mother and father with this, uh, she doesn't talk with, with her siblings about it, but her mother and father are, of course. And, you know, how to deal with that. Mm. You can't be a happy family after that, even though if you believe her or not, belie believe the father, it's ruined all. Mm. Uh, so, so um, uh, Berglott is, um, it's, you know, uh, she's a kind of alone mm. when the novel starts. Yes. But her brother, and you know, in the, um, in the beginning of the novel, um, the father and mother has uh, given two summer houses to the two youngest sisters, mm -hmm. and then the brother, the uh, eldest, he has, he has, you know, also, his, he's not seeing his family much. Uh, then he contacts Berglott and asks her to, to fight for these yeah. summer houses. He uh, asked yeah. her to fight yeah, his and fight and too. You know, and she has always said, I don't want anything, mm. but after a lot of uh, anxiety, she's, you know, going out with him on the battlefield. And from that on, it's fight, not yeah. tea party. <laughs> I was wondering when I read your novel too. Did you do? A have you done a lot of research, like in the psychology field, about family? Or read a lot of it because I think it's so uh, <laughs> smart in that way. It's telling so much about the psychology of families, or or how or repressed memories, all these things. It seems so knowing. <laughs> oh, I'm 60 years old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, uh, but what has what was for this book? You you love to write about, or you write very well about all the writers, um, like Bertolt Brecht. We talked about <laughs> mention him. And um, uh, who did you have an inspiration no writer, or who did you re read while writing this book, if you remember? Um, I no, I, I don't. I don't read. Um, I read and I, r I write, and I, I, that's two separate. Mm. Um, still, of course, when I'm writing, all my readings are, you know, it's in my hands uh, yeah. and in my, my head, but I don't have a kind of model. No, um, no. Another mo uh, mm, novel as a model. Mm. Then I wouldn't, why should I do that? Why should I write a new one? Yeah. They're already. <laughs> Uh, but do you do you do not write uh, read as much when you are when you are in writing mode? Yeah, and I read when I don't write, and yeah. I write when I don't read. Ah, ah, it's yeah. uh, you too, Helga. Yeah, same for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <nice. laughs> um, yes, this is very short uh, times. But uh, do you have? Would you um, add anything further to about? your book, something that we haven't uh, discussed? Or? Well, there's a lot of things about <laughs> my book we haven't described in 25 minutes, but uh, no, I think we're, uh, we're good. We're yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Are you big this? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about uh, when I was uh, reading Helga that when I was very much against uh, the, um, that Norway should be a member of the European Union, and then somebody said, yeah, if, you are m if you're not satisfied with the Union, you be a member and fight to mm. change it. Mm. And I think that would be like to marry, to fight f against the marriage from inside. <laughs> 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 That's the thought I had when I read Helga. End note. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. And there will be, uh, both writers will sign their books now. Um, right around there, I think. Yeah, and they are for sale outside at the library.
Ja, ich begrüße Sie zum nächsten, zum nächsten Programmpunkt. Das geht hier Schlag auf Schlag. Wir haben jetzt genau 12 Uhr, High Noon, also der richtige Zeitpunkt für eine Krimi-Präsentation. Ähm, ich habe zwei recht unterschiedliche Krimi-Autoren neben mir sitzen. Beides natürlich Norweger, wie sich für diesen Pavillon gehört. Zu meiner Rechten ist Günnar Stolesen. Er ist äh, Jahrgang 47 und hat schon 1975 angefangen, Kriminalromane zu schreiben. Inzwischen sind das mehr als 30 Bücher. Am bekanntesten, auf jeden Fall bei uns am bekanntesten, sind die Bücher um den etwas eigenbrötlerischen Privatdetektiv Wark Wehen. Das ist auch verfilmt worden, zum Teil unter dem Titel Der Wolf auf Deutsch und dann auch unter dem Titel Wark Wehen. Und äh, Günner hat für seine Bücher schon zweimal den größten norwegischen Krimi-Preis gekriegt, den Riverton-Preis. Und ja, der Hintergrund von, von dir ist, du hast mal irgendwann Sprachen studiert vor langer Zeit. Und das ist wahrscheinlich so der zentrale Unterschied zu meinem anderen Gast, nämlich Jörn Lea Horst, der auch äh, Krimis schreibt, aber äh, von Hause aus eigentlich äh, wirklich Polizist, also Kriminalkommissar war und dann, ich sage jetzt mal, die Seiten gewechselt hat und ähm, 2004, was sagen wir da? 2004 den ersten Krimi geschrieben hat und äh, 2013 dann tatsächlich den Polizeidienst quittiert hat und seitdem nur noch Bücher schreibt. Nur noch ist jetzt relativ, weil Jörn Leo Horst ist einer der Autoren, die am, in Norwegen am meisten verkauft werden. Er schreibt auch Kinderbücher und auch so Kinderkrimis. Und ähm, die Serie um seinen Kommissar Wisting hat inzwischen auch 14 Bände und ist in 30 Sprachen übersetzt. Und auch er hat schon den Riverton-Preis bekommen. Damit Sie jetzt nicht nur über Krimi-Autoren und sonstiges hören, wollen wir jetzt ein bisschen auch einen Eindruck geben, was sind das für Bücher. Und die beiden lesen jeweils äh, so eine halbe Seite auf Norwegisch, damit sie mal den Originalton hören. Und ich lese dann ein bisschen länger noch was auf Deutsch, damit sie auch dann von dem deutschen Text was haben. Und anschließend werden wir dann ein Gespräch führen mit den Autoren. Das machen wir dann auf Englisch. Das ist dann einfacher für alle. Okay. Starten wir mit den... Yeah, I will read a central uh, part of uh, this book that is out in German now as Todes Murder, but the Norwegian title is Dödens Drabanta, uh, The Consorts of Death in um, English. And this is the Norwegian version of why the title is Dödens Drabanta. Det var begynt å mørkne da jeg nærmet meg osen, der gaula var strage falt som et fall med brudeslør mot fjorden. Høyt oppe over fjellene var månen dukket opp, jordens bleke drabant, fjern og ensom i sitt evige kretsløp rundt alt kaos og uroen her nede. Det slo meg at den likevel ikke var alene. Vi var mange som drev og kretset ubenhørlig rundt det samme kaoset, den samme uroen, uten å kunne gripe inn og gjøre noe med det. Vi var alle dödens drabanter. Ich lese jetzt nicht die gleiche Stelle, sonst wäre es ja langweilig, sondern ein bisschen was vom Anfang, dass so die Einführung von dem Buch klar ist. Und ähm, der deutsche Text, den ich hier lese, der ist nicht von mir, sondern von zwei Kollegen, nämlich von Gabriele Harfs und Nils Schulz. Erst bei dem grün gestrichenen Transformatorenhaus, gleich oberhalb von Sandwigslin, sah ich sie. Sie kam auf mich zu, in Jeansjacke und Hose, mit Sonnenschein in den Haaren und einer Schultertasche, die an ihrer Seite baumelte. Als sie mich entdeckte, blieb sie stehen und wartete auf mich, während sie kurzsichtig hinter den ovalen Brillengläsern die Augen zusammenkniff, wie um sich davon zu überzeugen, dass ich es wirklich war. Ihre Haare waren kurz geschnitten und dunkelblond, mit einem grauen Firnis, der bei unserer letzten Begegnung noch nicht vorhanden gewesen war. Wir umarmten einander kurz und wechselten einen leicht verwunderten Blick, wie alte Freunde das eben tun, wenn es unmöglich ist, die von der Zeit hinterlassenen Tätowierungen wegzudiskutieren. 
da sie mit scharfem Messer ins Gesicht und andere Stellen eingekerbt sind. Sie lächelte rasch. Tut mir leid, dass ich ein bisschen zu spät komme. Meine Mutter, manchmal braucht das Zeit. Kein Problem, sagte ich. Sie zeigte auf eine Bank. Vielleicht sollten wir uns setzen, es ist schön in der Sonne. Okay. Du möchtest sicher wissen, warum ich dich angerufen habe. Ja, nach so vielen Jahren. Das waren doch nur zehn. In meinem Leben ist in diesen zehn Jahren viel passiert. Ach, sie sah mich abwartend an, aber ich sagte nicht mehr dazu. Du wolltest etwas Wichtiges mit mir besprechen? Ja. Sie legte eine kleine Pause ein, während wir uns setzten. Erinnerst du dich an Janni? Ich zuckte zusammen. Und das fragst du? Naja, das war eigentlich eine rhetorische Frage. Ich meine, ein halbes Jahr lang war es ja fast, als ob er unser Kind wäre. Das ließ sie erröten. Aber ich hatte es nicht deshalb gesagt. Es war schließlich so gewesen. Janni, sechs Jahre alt, 17 und jetzt? Was willst du mir erzählen? Sie seufzte leise. Er ist, ähm, er ist in Oslo auf der Flucht, wird wegen Mord gesucht. Oh, verdammt. Schon wieder? Woher, woher weißt du das? Ja, war ich schon wieder und das ist noch nicht alles. Ach, er hat eine Art Todesliste hinterlassen. Eine was? Oder jedenfalls hat er einige Namen von Leuten genannt, an denen er sich rächen will. Hm? Und einer davon bist du. Was? Ich? Ja. Ich brachte kein Wort heraus, ließ meinen Blick langsam wandern hinüber zum Büfio und ein Vierteljahrhundert zurück in der Zeit. Vage merkte ich, wie die Sonne mein Gesicht wärmte, und aber innerlich spürte ich Frost, den Frost, der auf irgendeine Weise immer da war, der niemals ganz losließ, den Frost aus dem vergeblichen Jahr. Soweit zu dem Buch und jetzt switchen wir zu... Jörn Lee Horst, der liest uns auch ein Stück aus seinem und dann stelle ich das dann auch auf Deutsch vor. Ja, yeah, well, the Katharina Code is called uh, Wisting unter der Tag der Vermissten, I believe, in, in, in Deutsch. Um, and this is the first novel in what I call uh, the Cold Case Quartet. This is the first story of a total of four cold cases that Wisting is going to solve. And it starts like this. Pappeskene stod i bunnen av kleskapen. Det var tre av dem. Visting dro fram den største. Den var i ferd med å revne i det ene hjørnet, så han måtte bære forsiktig, mens han bar den med seg ut i stua. De fire klaffene i lokket var tredd over under hverandre. Han åpnet dem og tog ut den øverste ringfermen. Den var svart med en falmet merkelag på ryggen. Katarina Haugen. Han la den til side, tog ut en rød perm merket vittner 1 og to andre perm merket vittner 2 og vittner 3 i samme farge. Så fant han det han ville se på. Permen merket kleiver i veien. Pappesken inneholdt alt som var skrevet og gjort i Katarinas saken. Han burde strengt at ikke hatt sakspapirene hjemme, men de fortjente ikke å ligge nedlåst i et arkivrom. Der de sto i bunn av kleskapet, ga de ham en påminnelse om saken hver gang han hentet fram en ny skjorte. Die drei Pappkartons standen auf dem Boden des Kleiderschranks. Wisting zog den größten heraus, der an einer Ecke eingerissen war, und trug ihn vorsichtig ins Wohnzimmer. Die vier Deckelklappen des Kartons waren ineinander gesteckt. Wisting öffnete ihn und nahm den obersten Aktenordner heraus, der schwarz war und einen vergilbten Aufkleber auf dem Rücken trug. Katharina Hügen. Er legte ihn zur Seite und zog nacheinander drei rote Ordner mit den Aufschriften Zeugen 1, 2 und 3 heraus. Gleich darunter entdeckte er den Ordner, nach dem er gesucht hatte. Er trug die Aufschrift Claver Way. Die Pappkartons enthielten alles, was im Fall Katharina Heugen dokumentiert worden war. Wisting hätte die Dokumente eigentlich nicht mit nach Hause nehmen dürfen, doch andererseits war niemandem damit gedient, wenn sie in einem verschlossenen Archivraum lagen. Auf dem Boden des Kleiderschranks hingegen erinnerten sie ihn jedes Mal an den Fall, wenn er ein frisches Hemd herausnahm. Katharina Heugen hatte im Kleiverwey gewohnt. Das schlichte Einfamilienhaus war aus verschiedenen Blickwinkeln fotografiert worden. 
Es war auf allen Seiten von Wald umgeben und auf einem der Fotos glitzerte im Hintergrund ein See, der Kleivertjan. Das Haus lag auf einer kleinen Anhöhe, etwa 100 Meter von der Straße entfernt. Es war braun mit weißen Fensterrahmen und einer grünen Tür, die Blumenkästen vor den Fenstern waren leer. Beim Durchblättern der Akte kam es Wisting so vor, als bewege er sich in einem Geisterhaus. Katharina Heugen war nicht mehr da, doch auf dem Fußboden des, Wa des Windfangs standen ihre Schuhe. Graue Joggingschuhe, braune Stiefeletten und Holzschuhe neben den großen Sandalen und Arbeitsstiefeln ihres Mannes. An den Garderobenhaken hingen drei Jacken. Auf der Kommode im Gang lagen ein Kugelschreiber und eine Einkaufsliste, ein ungeöffneter Brief, eine Zeitung, einige Werbebroschüren und ein halb verwelkter Rosenstrauß. Drei Klebezettel hingen am Spiegel über der Kommode. Einer mit einem Datum und einer Uhrzeit darauf, ein zweiter mit einem Namen und einer Telefonnummer und ein dritter, auf dem drei Großbuchstaben vermutlich irgendwelche Initialen und einen Geldbetrag verzeichnet waren. AML, 125 Kronen. Katharinas Koffer lag geöffnet auf dem Bett. Er war gepackt und sah so aus, als hätte sie geplant, lange wegzubleiben. Zehn Paar Socken, zehn Unterhosen, fünf BHs und so weiter. Die Auswahl der Kleidung wirkt so unpersönlich, als wäre der Koffer eigentlich von jemand anderem gepackt worden. Oder für jemand anderen. Die Aufnahmen aus der Küche waren besonders rätselhaft. Auf der Arbeitsplatte standen ein Teller mit einem Butterbrot und ein Glas Milch. Der Stuhl, auf dem Katharina Hölgen immer gesessen hatte, war etwas vorgezogen. Auf dem Tisch lagen ein Kugelschreiber und das, was mittlerweile als Katharina-Code bekannt war. Wisting spähte angestrengt auf den Code, eine Ansammlung von Zahlen, die über drei senkrechte Linien verteilt waren. Niemand hatte bisher herausfinden können, was das bedeutete. Neben Spezialisten von der Polizei hatten unter anderem Kryptologen vom Militär die mysteriöse Mitteilung untersucht, ohne dass irgendjemand einer Lösung näher gekommen war. Der Code war sogar Experten im Ausland vorgelegt worden, doch auch sie konnten nichts anderes als eine sinnlose Zahlenkombination darin erkennen. So viel zu den Auszügen aus dem Buch. Das zweite ist von Andreas Brunstermann übersetzt. Ähm, Günther Stolissen ist schon sehr lange als Krimi-Autor aktiv. Und ähm, so, jetzt habe ich meine Zettel in der richtigen Reihenfolge. You're writing since 1970. And uh, if you see all these crime novels, what has changed during this time? Well, I published my first uh, crime novel in Norway in 1975. And uh, it's clear that the world has changed in uh, this uh, period. Uh, Norway has changed a bit, uh, not because, uh, mainly because of that we found petrol in the North Sea in the 70s. And uh, are today one of the richest country in the world because of that. And of course there is a lot of technology that uh, has uh, changed uh, during this uh, period. And Uh, the first book, that was about two uh, police officers, but uh, from 1977 I have written 19 novels about Valgve, my private detective, and I'm very happy that I have a private detective because he don't have to follow all the uh, development of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the technolo technological the thing that uh, Jörn has to work with, with DNA and uh, watching the pattern of mobile phone, uh, and all that. Like Vim, he just go and visit people and speak to them and look into their eyes and see, are you telling the truth or are you lying? And uh, as he is a good psychologist, uh, in the end of the book, he knows who has been lying for him. And that's mostly that is most of the people. <laughs> so you feel much freer because he is a private investigator and not a police officer? Yeah, and that was uh, a literary uh, 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 choice too, because my biggest inspiration as a writer came from the American writers like Raymond Chandler, Ross MacDonald, and also of course the first big couple of Swedes, Sjöval and Valu, and there was a combination of the, the way of watching society that you find in Sjöval and Valu, and the literary style of uh, Raymond Chandler 
and, Ro and Ross MacDonald with a lot of poetry in the text. I'm, I, I look upon myself as a literary crime writer. I, I try to lift the language up to uh, the same level as uh, uh, ordinary writers of novels uh, use, but of course it is also, uh, I hope, a good uh, and exciting uh, crime story as, uh, which is the motor of the, of the story, which brings it forth. You said you have written 19 books with Swag Leom as your main person. Can you present him to us? What is he for a person? Well, the, he is inspired by the American uh, detectives like Philip Marlowe and Lou Archer, but uh, I thought it would be too much of a copy if I made uh, gave him the same background. They have been working as a police worker or in the district attorney work. Uh, so I looked around in the Norwegian society in the 1970s, and I saw a new uh, sort of people growing up, and that was the social workers. And of course, Norway is a welfare society. We have a lot of, of social work in, uh, in Norway. And I found that a man who had uh, worked in the, in the protection of children would be a good background for a private detective to have because a lot of children, they ran from their home. They are fugitives. They are going into the drug uh, milieu. They are going into prostitution. And uh, as a social worker, he would have the experience of going up and looking for these children. He had to work with the police in, uh, in that uh, capacity. And then uh, I thought w when I made of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a fictional character because there are uh, rare in the 70s really no uh, real de private detectives in, uh, in Norway. Today, uh, there are several because it's retired policemen like uh, somebody they, uh, is writers, others are private detectives. But, uh, but uh, um, at that time, it was a clearly fictional uh, form of presentate a detective, but it is a long tradition and crime fiction is a traditional way of writing. We go into a style and into it. I very often compare it with being a jazz musician. We are playing the good old tunes in a new way every time. Okay. We all know the films uh, with Vark Veon. How does it feel to see your main person in a film and does it fit your, your ideas? Well, uh, a lot of people have told me that uh, Vagvim in film, he is much prettier than uh, Vagvim in, uh, in the books. But I have to uh, answer them, where in the books uh, do I tell you that Vagvim is an ugly character? He, he looks quite well, I think, in the books too. And uh, Tron Espen Seim, who plays Vagvim in the films, he was 34 when we made the first film. And Vagvim was 34 when I wrote the first novel about him. Because, but he is a uh, he is a chronological hero, so he gets older from book to book. And uh, the last one published in Norway, he is a young man of 61, 62. Uh, but of course, that is quite different than uh, the hero in the, in the films. But uh, the most important problems for people in Bergen, especially, was that uh, Trond Esmussein was speaking the Oslo dialect. And uh, that was quite wrong. That was much more wrong than he was looking a bit, oh, han he was a bit handsome. A question to you, Bern. Um, my brother-in-law is a police officer, and I talked with him about you and uh, changing the roles, and ah. he couldn't imagine to do so. So, um, how does it feel to write about crimes you theoretically should investigate? Um, <laughs> um, well, at least I got to solve all the all the cases. That is a kind of relief, uh, and there are times when I. Uh, miss being a detective. I, I, I miss being behind the police barriers. I, I miss being inside, taking part. Uh, I, I miss being a part of the news, not just reading about uh, the, uh, in the newspapers, uh, just to see the headlines. But that doesn't make me long to go back. I'm quite satisfied with, with uh, my work today. Can you benefit from your work as a police uh Officer for it? Absolutely. I, I think that is my strength as a crime author. I, for many years, my uh, job was to go behind those police barriers, to go in, in footsteps of unknown uh, murderers, uh, to see how those people had left behind uh, their traces. And for many years, it was my job to, well, first talk to the people who have been victims of serious crimes, often only the people who have left behind in murder cases. And for many years it was also my task to talk to the people who have committed these crimes, to 
interrogate the offenders. So to stand uh, like st to stand face to face with other people's um, uh, fear, uh, remorse, anger that is that has been quite that, that brings I think that brings uh, a kind of authentic nerve into my stories, a sense of true crime in my novels that I might be hard to come up with if you haven't. Uh, been in those shoes yourself. And the latest novel, um, the Katarina case in UK title, um, is the first one in the um, uh, cold case series. Uh, and it's inspired by my own cold case that uh, was solved just after uh, 15 years after I left the force. And um I think William Wisting is much freer as you has been as police investigator. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you because uh, being a detective in the Norwegian police force is quite different than being a um, uh, policeman in, in Germany. Uh, I think the Norwegian police det uh, detective are freer. Of course, in in my novels. Uh, visiting, he is traveling out to crime scenes and uh, out in the field. My real job was pretty much inside uh, in my office. So, so in that case, uh, in that, that way, he is more free than a normal detective. That is true. And uh, what about the reaction from your ancient colleagues? Well, um, this series now has a total of 40 novels in, in Norway, and for the first three or four novels, I didn't hear anything. Nobody was saying at least not to me that uh, I was saying anything but this is uh, well this is on strange in somehow but because when you are a success and a success especially abroad then uh, your colleagues th then the Norwegian they, they want to be a they, they are proud of you and then they are stepping forward and, and, and saying good things about you but today uh, I get good feedbacks from police colleagues and also from even the, the Minister of Justice is one of my readers, uh, because in these novels, uh, I'm writing true police procedure, uh, the way the work is done, and that is somehow building up the trust to the Norwegian police. Um, a question to you both. Um, can you explain before there are so many crime novels from Scandinavia or from Norway? Well, there are uh, several answers to that. The first is that we have a very long tradition of crime writing in Norway. Uh, we uh, used to say that uh, the first uh, modern crime novel was written by a Norwegian two years before Edward Allan Poe wrote the murder in the uh, Rue Morgue. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, and we had a, a big tradition around the turn of the last century with Stein Riverton, who was very popular in Norway and all the Scandinavian country and even here in uh, Germany. And then, of course, it started again with Sjövalle Valle, the Swedish couple writing from 65 to 75, and my generation, which is the first generation who really started to write modern crime fiction in, uh, in Norway. We were inspired very directly by Sjövalle Valle. And you can see in most of the world, it has been Swedish writers who has been the front runners. It was Sjövalle Valle, it was Henning Mankel, it was Stig Larsson. But in, when you look upon, upon the Scandinavia from other countries, it looks more or less the same. So today, uh, UNESPO is perhaps the, the biggest name uh, selling from the Scandinavian countries. So we have a, uh, we have a long tradition in writing this uh, fiction during the last 30, 40 years. Are there some uh, typical aspects for Scandinavian crimes? No, uh, that is hard to answer because, seen from within, these crime novels are very different in, in style and plotting and characters. But I do see that from from uh, abroad, it, it look ha looks kind of uh, similar because uh, these writers from the uh, Nordic countries they have kind of the same political system uh, and, and yeah, and the same landscapes. So I can see that uh, they are look similar, but seen from within, they are very different. So if there is one thing in common, it's, it, it must, must be 
the weather. It's a lot of bad weather, cold and stormy weather in, in the Nordic countries. Uh, of course, uh, the weather and the dark nights in winter, yeah. but also very important, I think, is nature in all Norwegian literature, yeah, because nature, nature yeah. is <laughs> present all the time. If you stand in the middle of Oslo, which is our capital and the biggest city, you can see the green hills around the city. If you are in Bergen, you have six or seven or eight or nine <laughs> mount <laughs> mountains around the, around the city. So, uh, and in all books that you read that takes place in Norway, uh, a lot of chapters takes place out in the wild nature of Norway, up in the mountains, out in the woods, up along the fjords. So that is very typical, I think, for Norwegian uh, literature especially. Uh, when you go in a German bookstore to look at Scandinavian crime, sometimes there are whole yeah. fjords. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, what do you think about the covers of the German tr translations? For uh, normally you see a little red house by the sea. Well, I, I, yeah, you do. Uh, but I think, it, the, the, uh, after all, the German covers are a bit better than the, like the Asian covers or the Australian uh, and even uh, American covers because they always put snow into the covers. Even there is, n I have uh, stories that take part uh, during the summer, but the, it's snow on the covers. Yeah, <laughs> this one as well. But this one is in the autumn, but there's no sn there's no snow in the story. I'm have to disappoint you. It's a cold, cold, cold cover, but uh, no snow inside. But a, lo a lot of the covers in Germany uh, looks like tourist pamphlets for Norway. And yeah, I, yeah. Have, I have a very good uh, colleague in Bergen who has written several crime novels about a lawyer, takes place in Bergen, and we, he, his first, first book was published in, uh, in Germany. It was a reindeer on the front <laughs> cover, and he, he had never seen a reindeer in his life. <laughs> Yeah, um, I want to mention that the um, the books you can you can get there over at the outside. There is a stand, and uh, the two authors uh, will uh, give you signatures there mm -hmm. at the table. And um, last information: this one is published by Piper Verlag in Germany, and this one at Polar Verlag. So um, I hope you. We'll have fun reading this book, and uh, thank you for now. Thank you for us. Thank you,
right. Okay. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, little piece. It's going to be about uh, Bergen and uh, the literature of Bergen. Bergen is an, uh, a city in uh, west of Norway. Uh, the ones who were here, here with uh, Gunnar Stålesen uh, just now, uh, you've, uh, you've uh, spent a lot of time there in his books. But, uh, but now we will uh, talk about this one, which is called Hinter dem Regen. Zwölf literarische Stimmen aus Bergen. Uh, so this is an anthology uh, made uh, for the festival, basically, by a Bergen muni municipality, uh, presenting 12 uh, writers from Bergen, uh, translated to German. The it was my, I, I am the editor of the book and also a poet in the book. Uh, and I'm also a fictional character in the books of Thomas Espedal. Uh, described in uh, Bergeners, uh, which uh, m might some of you have read, because it's translated. Uh, so, and Cecilia and uh, Gunilla are also characters in this book, but we're not going to talk about that. But, but, but maybe a little bit. But uh, the idea here is to present. I mean, these two. Uh, writer Sarah Gunnell and Cecilia, they're, uh, they're famous uh, and they're translated and everything, but a lot of the people in here are brilliant writers. Ingve Pedersen, Fadik Hag and Katina Heiberg, minor writers, but fantastic voices. So, um, and you're all uh, happy to have a copy uh, for free at the book signing place afterwards, and where you also can get the books signed by us. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good offer. Free and uh, signed. Um, <laughs> let's talk about Bergen. As to if it's one thing that we love uh, in Bergen, let's talk about ourselves. Well, uh, Thomas, uh, they, they all have their own story towards uh, the city, but uh, I think we'll start with Thomas. Um, you, when you describe Bergen and, uh, as a place to live and write, you describe it as, a, as the most horrible place on earth. You really talk down Bergen a lot in your books. But you, there's also a romance there. Uh, uh, what, what keeps you staying? If you hate Bergen so much, why don't you go somewhere else? I will, Henning. I will, as soon as I can. <laughs> Immediately when I get the first uh, offer, I, I, w I will move. It's very difficult to live in Bergen because there is this romantic idea. It's a nice place for tourists and, and tourist arrives and there are too many of them. So I, I would all recommend you not to go because <laughs> the biggest problem in, in, in this city is like in Barcelona, like in Venice, uh, like in Palma, there are, it's destroyed more or less by mass tourism. So we are not here to, to uh, sell in Bergen but to sell the literature of, of, of Bergen, I think that's an important statement to, to, to make. And, and, and uh, yeah, it's impossible to live in Bergen, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, the rain, everything, we, we all know uh, that part of it. But, uh, but you also write a little bit in your essay, in this one, uh, that, that, you, that there is a lit literary community, a, f a sense of community. Uh, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, when I wrote my first book, in, in, in it was published in Bergen, there was a meeting among writers, and we were four. Four. We were four writers. <laughs> and and I, I was so shocked to see them that I moved to Copenhagen, which uh, I know that you also did. But uh <laughs> And now, 30 years later, we are a community of, of writers in, in Bergen. I think it's mostly because the uh, university, and there is a writing academy. And, and uh, this is what has made the city possibly to, to, to work in, because there are so many good writers in Bergen. One of them uh, is definitely Cecilia Löwe, one of the, the maybe the greatest playwright uh, in Norway, and uh, definitely the one of the top poets. Uh, and, um, but you left us for Copenhagen for so many years, and, and, and this you were in this uh, cosmopolitan uh, city, and, and you moved back to, to your roots. And, and, and how, how, is that, how would you describe the difference between Copenhagen and, and this little community of Bergen? When I was 
When I was a very young person, I, I worked in the theater in Bergen, Bergen in national, the National Scene, the first uh, Norwegian theater. Mm? Not in Oslo, in Bergen, yeah. And there I met an elderly actor who told me very seriously that Copenhagen is uh, the main city of Norway. And that I never forgot that because uh, the streams of not consciousness, but the, the, the two countries. I'm not romantic about that, but I mean, we have so much family and traditions together and the language. I, I'm always provocative and I'm saying Norwegian is Danish. The town, the, the, the coast, coastal town language is built on Dan the Danish written language. Yeah. Is that an answer? <laughs> it is an answer, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Gunnel, I'm surprised that you are even here. I mean, in uh, Thomas's book Bergenaus, you are described as a notoriously lost person, that that always with no sense of direction. Um, but you managed to find. Uh, you grew up in uh, Ørsta, which uh, is another coastal town of Norway, I guess. No, may maybe not. It's not coastal. It's uh, by a fjord. It's uh, on the. It's further northwest. Well, it's thirty. 300 kilometers from Bergen. But you live in Bergen and ha have done for, for uh, 20 years, perhaps. Uh, how, how does the city affect you? Uh, you've said somewhere that, uh, that you could write about anything, or, or, or it doesn't matter where you write. Or, or but still, I can see a little pattern in your books. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I used to say that I'm not very interested in place. When I'm writing, I'm I'm not I'm not too conscious about place. I'm very bad at description, I think. Um, <coughs> but I tend to write about either Ørsta, my hometown, or Bergen, where I live now. So they kind of creep into my literature, no matter what I do. And I think that's also something that has to do with I don't have to think, I uh, I don't have to imagine or invent anything. I'm just uh, in these places. But also, it's something to do with. Um, writing about something you know. Uh, and I think my hometown is something that I really know, but something that keeps puzzling me. There's something I don't understand about it, and I'm very drawn to it. Um, and the same thing I think is with Bergen. It's, 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 it's something that's uh, kind of rooted in me, uh, having lived there longer than I have lived in Ørsta. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it keeps puzzling me. And it's a uh, uh, and I also I agree with Thomas. Uh, somebody has to do it, <laughs> and and the rain is is horrible. Uh, the weather is terrible. It's just like it's so depressing. I feel like when you talk about the weather in Bergen, it's not it's not chit chat. It's not small talk. It's a huge existential question. <laughs> How do you feel today about the rain? <laughs> so so it's uh, but at at the same time I think it's a uh, it's a town with very. I don't know how to, to phrase this in English. In no way I would say we have very, uh, we have very low shoulders. <laughs> it's a myth, but it's also uh, true. It's not. It's not. Um, well, it's uh, despite of the rain. It's not a very stressful city. It's uh, you can be uh, you can be both anonymous as in a in a big city, but you also have people you know. Uh, so it's uh, yeah. I, I, even though it's hard to live in Bergen, I still love it, so it's something about that. Uh, in uh, this anthology, you're represented with uh, the beginning of your latest book in Norwegian, Presens Machine, the Presens Machine, or something, okay, in German. Okay, uh, Cecilia says I have to show it, so I'm going to show it. It's a very a special design. Yeah, <laughs> it's, present, it's called Present Tense Machine, or it will be called in English. But you've made an absolutely unbelievable <coughs> story, uh, in that in the sense that it's 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 uh, unrealistic, uh, in a sense. Yeah. But uh, but it is saturated in uh, Merlin piece. Mm. Would you would you tell us why you why you choose this uh, this as the scene? Well, 
Well, the story of the book is uh, it's about a mother and a daughter who live in parallel universes. So the mother one day reads, she is watching her daughter and uh, cycling in the garden. She's two and a half years old, and then she's reading a book of poetry, and she reads, she misreads a word. Uh, and doing that, the universe splits into two, and the mother and the daughter is drawn into each uh, universe. So that's the very not realistic um, kind of science fiction uh, plot of the novel, but they do exist in very recognizable universes. They are identical, uh, and they also are situated in Bergen. Uh, and I placed uh, one of these characters in Merlin Peace, which, which is one of the most beautiful, I think, personally, uh, parts of the city. Um, very um, wonderful atmosphere there, and I lived there for five years five of my most happy years, <laughs> despite of the rain. So I was trying to, because I had this historical uh, plot of the novel, I was trying to do something I'm not very good at. I'm trying, I tried to um, make it as concrete as possible and to describe the places and to make it familiar and recognizable, I hope, even for people who live in Bergen. So I was kind of trying to mix uh, or combine a very uh, abstract idea with a very uh, fundamental, uh, recognizable uh, scenery. Yeah. Uh, so there is uh, too many books uh, from Oslo. Everybody writes from the city Oslo. So you have to yeah. begin start uh, up again with Bergen <laughs> streets. Yeah. Cecilia, you live in a, in a quite particular part of Bergen. I mean, you live in a, inside a museum. Yes, I am uh, part of a big uh, the old town museum. <laughs> That's so true. It's true. It's true. It's called yeah. the Old Bergen, which is a museum uh, with with uh, old wooden buildings from from. Yeah, my house is uh, on the on the list. What happened? It's on conserv conservation. Uh, on the on the on the. Not uh, not to UNESCO, but but uh, you don't have you you cannot change it. Yeah. Oh yeah. But you live there with your with your uh, with your cats. Uh, well, I uh, I have only one cat left. You the lost image it. is fain fading away. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but they are uh, so old. After you uh, came back to us, uh, your productivity and the quality of your writing, uh, uh, everything is just exploded. The whole thing. Well, that is your words. Well, yes. Didn't I write uh, great, good enough before? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But no, um, no, the thing is that I, I started out as a, as a poet and novelist, um, so-called experimental novelist. And then I changed, because I had a great success with a novel, Sug, that was also in German as Zug, Order the das Meer unter den Brettern is the title. So it was translated, and I was in Frankfurt, and I sold it to eight countries. And then I was pan I panicked, and I started to to do the other thing I love, uh, namely to live in the theatre world. And I've written a lot of lot of plays. Mm. So, uh, but when I went to Copenhagen. I, I, I immediately started to, to go, go into a kind of uh, geriatric or childhood uh, farce. So I, I started to, to write poetry again. And that is, five, that is five volumes in one book. And some of it is in this Hinter dem Regen. Because uh, maybe because it's a little. It's about the moval, the, the moval from Copenhagen. So maybe it has something to do with Bergen also. Yeah. Moving home. And after, uh, after those, I, I wrote this. And that is uh, poetry around, prose po poems around uh, my love of visual arts, the visual arts. But these two books together is um, six volumes of poetry written since year 2000. And, and uh, the purple one there, uh, Vandre Utstillinger, uh, also got the, the book award. Circulating, circulating exhibitions maybe in English. Yeah. 
Ja. Yeah. Och det är också gott av de brage prisen. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest prize, literary those, prize in Norway. So. Is, uh, the brage prize is the biggest uh, prize diploma. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other one is as big as that because it's the critics uh, award. And it even got the, the award before it came out. So that's <laughs> oh. so it's, uh, it's just, just a rumor of the book. Yeah. It is just the text. It's not the uh, carton yeah. <laughs> that got the prize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What, what 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 about you, Thomas? If you had uh, you you said you could never live in a, a place like Oslo or something, but but your your fiction or or your your prose has has really sort of been rooted in the city of Bergen. Uh, is there any is there any chance? Uh, would you what would happen with you if you if you if you moved to Austria? And and, and 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 sat there uh, the rest of your life. Would it? Would it I, I, I don't. I don't know actually. But the thing is now, for the last twenty years, my writing has been uh, collective. I used to write my books uh, alone, in Copenhagen or, or different places. It's it's always a part of a writer's work to find the right place to write a better book than what you are able to write. So searching for the right place is a part of your job. And when I arrived back in, in Bergen, there was already a milieu, a collective milieu. And you introduced it to me because you, you were used from the uh, writing academy to work in, 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 uh, in communities where writers read each other, criticized each other, came with readings that were on a very high level. And I was invited into a group and then I learned really how to work in a, a collective and we were lucky at that time because there were so many good uh, writers because of the writing academy uh, Knauskov was there and, and Lars Ramsley was there and Bjarte Breitag was there and Christina Ness was there at the period and, and Katrine Knudsen was there and, and, and you were there and we were all there and there was this discussion this certain energy in the city and it was very isolated because of the weather because of the climate you have to spend your time inside doing your work, doing your reading. So I, I, I learned a lot of, of from this period, working together with, with other writers. And I'm very dependent on that now. Mm. That's a very creative per- period. It, 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 I, I lived in a one-room flat, and I basically just bought a, a, a sofa, for a, for a room for eight people around the table. That was the whole thing, and a mattress in the corner. So So that was, so the whole, my whole room was filled with uh, with writers uh, every week, and uh, it was quite a quite a. I, uh it, it changed the writings. It, it changed my writings. I think it's changed your writing. This discussion: what do we really not what what you want to do, but what do we want to do? What can we do with literature in 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 Bergen first and afterwards Norway? And it seems to have been succeeded because they read us in, in Germany. <laughs> Gunnel, you are sort of the the uh, a mystery. You're the Joker in this in this uh, literature milieu because uh, we never see you. You're you're a, you're a, uh, all all the we, we meet in bars. We 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 s- we have uh, all these chats, but but you're never there. You're you're you're. A no, I like to be very mysterious and uh, and also I'm lost all the time. So that's why you can't <laughs> see me. <laughs> No, but it's uh, Bergen. Has, uh, I have I have uh, children now. I don't. Uh, I'm uh, I'm at home <laughs> with my children, so that's why I'm so mysterious. Uh, so uh, and Bergen has uh, in that way changed for me. I have kind of two two different cities. The one where I studied and I moved to Bergen to study literature. We had one of the greatest um, uh, academies of uh, comparative literature with fantastic professors and and. Um, and a fantastic uh, student group. People would move to Bergen actually from, from Oslo to study there, which is everyone in Bergen. Mm. <laughs> we have the best uh, institute. I don't know how it's now. I think they're still pretty good. <laughs> mm. And we have also the, crea- the Academy of Creative Writing where I actually teach now. And Cecilia has also taught for many years, which also draws people to Bergen. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think it's a very dynamic and, uh, and vibrant uh, environment for for young writers actually uh, still 
Um, but for me, as a, I moved out of the city when I had children and uh, kind of show up sometimes <laughs> <laughs> when the weather is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, don't, I don't intend to be mysterious, it's just uh, part of my nature. Well, um, <laughs> Thomas, uh, Bergen has almost no publishers. For, for a city of that size, it's, it's quite incredible. Uh, all the publishers are in uh, in Oslo, so we just send our manuscripts. So you even take the, to take the train to to hand them uh, the, your manuscript from your old typewriter. Um, but 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 this is a, there's a distance there, and we actually live free of uh, the publishing world. Uh, do you think that has something to do with uh, with the atmosphere? I, I think so because we learned a lot from the music scene. The music scene in, in Bergen is very different from that in Oslo. We've been told because people help each other. So there is a lot of competition. You will, in, I, will I will guess it will be in, in all big cities that there are, when there are seven or eight publishers, there is seven or eight collectives and, and not always a mixture of, of, of writers from these different publishers which we don't have to, to, to consider in, in, in Bergen. So it's, it's my uh, feeling that everyone helps each other. So trying to promote each other and having these discussions and, and, and taking care of, 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 of uh, each other. So when, when the young writers come, I mean they come from Oslo, some from Copenhagen, some from Sweden even to go to the academy, I think they are very well taken care of. We, we give them cigarettes and a lot of alcohol and, and we learn them to fight, and 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 and, and, and then they become uh, good writers, most of them. Mm. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's I, I give them carrots. <laughs> <laughs> the healthy but you choice. Also, I have to say, you also provide them with a scene. I, I, if, if I'm allowed to say that, you have this poesy dig, which yes. is which is very open to young writers who can come and, and read their uh, yeah. material, which is also very important. In Bergen. Uh, 150 people s show up to hear a poet that nobody has heard about. It's, it's that kind of place. And, uh, and uh, so when I, I do this poesy poetry uh, nights, and uh, it's wildly popular with the younger crowds also. Uh, so it's uh, uh, yeah, a, a good place for, for writing poetry, as we can see from the, 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 the new books of uh, Cecilia all the time. Uh, yeah. Do you allow me to, to read a small poem yeah. from Bergen? That would be a, the perfect ending, but yeah. do we have a, a, a translation for I it? Could you read it? I can spontaneously, perhaps. So you're going to read in Norwegian? I read in Norwegian and then in English. Would that be okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bier er vakrere med fjell. Når jeg går langs kajene, ser jeg barnet mitt i alle bølgene. Hun sier hun liker Norges døgnrytme. Jeg ser barnet mitt i skogen. Hun løper hen til fjellsiden som til en mann. Jeg ser barnet mitt i bølgene. Av og til, av og til kommer hun syklene. Bier er vakrere med fjell, sier hun. Uh, I will try and... Uh, I'm not sure. There is a new thing coming here now in okay. uh, two minutes. So yeah. I think we have to actually... It's my moderation job. The, the to title is, Towns is more beautiful with mountains around. That is Bergen. That, uh, that is the perfect ending. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, um, and uh, believe it or not, this book with uh, the writings from these people and Thomas's essays, my essay and poetry, is free, and you can get it at the bookshop. And, uh, and uh, they will even uh, the famous ones of us will uh, sign uh, their books also. Yes.
OK. Timule okte ja misle korra gile vood oppe nuppe peal kos kos juige mõtte da mun tan tahle gärga mingi ja tu ei omistele bot kolmat eh ka minguldel. Eh it's one o'clock we're uh, in for the freedom of expression series uh, today we've gotten to the Sami part of it and uh, I just heard that the, another Sami event uh, just uh, ended so I guess there'll be people moving over from there to here so uh, so we'll uh, I think I'll do it the way we do it used to do it in the radio that we just keep small talking till people find their places and, <laughs> and can talk about the weather in Frankfurt and how nice it's been here and how happy the Sami are for the huge turnout and the interest we s feel for, for, for our literature and what we're doing. Uh, but but <laughs> talking like this also steals away without the time we have. So, so I guess we, we, just, uh, we just start our program. And, uh, and uh, what we're going to to uh, do is uh, I have a brief, very brief introduction and then we're having a conversation here on, uh, on freedom of expression seen on Sami terms. I want to start with a myth and a very brief myth, uh, a very, very brief retelling of a Sami myth. Because when the great creator created the ancestors of uh, what were to become the ancestors of the Sami, uh, he or she knew about the hardships that the people would uh, endure. So in order to give the Sami something to believe in, some comfort in life that uh, would ensure them that, uh, that there still is a future for the Sami people, he or she, the, gr the great creator, put a living and, ha a living and beating heart of a two-year-old reindeer cow in the middle of the earth. So every time the Sami felt their existence threatened, we could just lay our ear to the ground and listen from, for the heartbeats from below. And as long as we could hear the heart still beating, we knew there would be a future for the Sami people. That connection is important for the Sami as an indigenous people because that ties us to the earth. That makes us, also gives us a, an enormous responsibility to keep up this uh, connection between Mother Earth and the people. So as indigenous peoples, we are put on this, this earth to remind all everyone else about the importance of oh, keep, oh, 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 keeping this connection, of oh, treating Mother Earth in a, in a beautiful way. And telling this to the Western world, which use, is used to just exploit her and utilize Mother Earth is really the thing that indigenous, is the indigenous message to the Western world. And this is why we need freedom of expression in order to reach out with this important message. With me here uh, for this conversation, I have uh, two wonderful uh, Sambi artists, and, uh, and they are everything, multi-artists, uh, uh, Madhan uh, Sada, who is from Guadagaino, which is uh, one of the main municipalities, uh, Sami municipalities. Uh, that's also where the Sami University of Applied Sciences is uh, situated. Uh, Maritan uh, is an author and a visual artist. She's been uh, very uh, essential in, uh, in establishing the, the uh, Taita Tallu, the uh, uh, artist collective in in Guadagaino, and she is an activist, and uh, we'll get into that later in the conversation. Why she turned into an activist? Nilja Solberg is from Otsjoko, uh, which actually is on the Finnish side of the river Dietnu Tana, which is the border river. In the majority of society, it's regarded as a border river between Norway and Finland. In Sami connection, it's a con com way of communication between uh, and over across the river. So, uh, so he lives in Otsujoko, 
and, uh, and uh, that's then on the Finnish side. But uh, he is represented by a, uh, by a Norwegian uh, publisher. Uh, Niljas is, an, uh, is a musician, uh, a poet, uh, uh, an actor, and so on, and so on, and definitely also an activist. So, uh, uh, in comparison, or, or just to continue from what I for, from this myth and, and the, the necessity of, of explaining this important message to the Western world, how do you feel uh, in in your work that we, we do we manage to get across to get the message across to the Western world, and do they listen to us, Maritan? <laughs> First of all, I just wanted to make a brief comment about uh, the labeling. Uh, you call me an activist. Uh, me, I don't consider myself an activist, but my work, which I see necessary to bring forward in the different ways I do, are very often considered activistic from the viewer's point. So this is just something I wanted to clarify, because I don't do this just to rebel or um, it, this is an, a language of the heart and the soul and how it becomes is a product of circumstances, political and practical daily circumstances. Now having that clarified, you asked Hello? Yeah, you asked me if, um, if we managed to get our messages through, through our um, artistic practices. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I think it varies and it depends. Um, with my last project, I definitely feel that the message has gone through quite clearly and loudly. But the question is, um, is anyone listening? Is anyone reacting or is it just... Um, somehow glorified in, in a visual or artistic sense. So this is uh, a quite difficult situation, I would say, um, in terms of practicing uh, freedom of speech, uh, but where does it lead us? Yeah, exactly, because uh, already back in the uh, late uh, 60s, early 1970s, a very famous Native American uh, author and professor, uh, Wayne DeLoria Jr., wrote, wrote a book uh, meant for the white American audience, where he put the title of the book, We Speak, You Listen. Uh, he, uh, he's, he sold more than a million copies of the book, so it probably was also read, but, but still the U.S. didn't change any of its politics towards, uh, towards uh, Native Americans. And is that what we are experiencing in, in, in Norway as well, that we have the freedom of expression, but, uh, but what about the authorities? Do they pay any attention to what we are saying? Yeah, and um, me and you, we were talking very briefly about this the other day, and you asked me, um, what is, what's, what's the help in this freedom of speech if no one is listening? And I've been thinking and, and been quite frustrated about that for a long time. And every time I go into, you know, investigating the answer to that, I have to say, I'm going to jump a little bit from, you know, the literature uh, into the visual arts uh, in terms of my work. But the freedom of speech, um, Yes, we are working towards changing something, but until that happens, um, I feel more and more that the freedom of speech is important for protecting uh, a sanity, basically. Because if you're screaming and screaming and everyone allows you to scream but no one listens, then, um, yeah. I, I tend to art um, sort of as a th therapeutical uh, way of dealing with a very difficult situation in my family against the Norwegian government. And um, 
And on many occasions, I've been thinking, what would I have done if I didn't have this freedom to express myself through uh, visual arts or words? And, and then I of oftentimes think about my colleague, another very talented artist uh, from the Swedish side of Sami, Anders Sonna. He's made a lot of work addressing this um, general oppression on people, on human beings, that if he said on some occasions that wonder if I didn't have my art, how would my reactions have come out? And I very often think about um, you know, minorities or um, smaller populations, indigenous or no indigenous, but when you are under severe oppression uh, and there is no way out, you can have uh, quite dramatical and dangerous effects. So for me, it's very important to, re to remind of the many important aspects of having this liberty, despite the fact that no one is actually listening in Norway or I think in, in the rest of the Sami countries. Yes, because that is the, the curse of, uh, of a minority that, uh, that uh, you, you are still depending on the understanding of the majority. And you need to reach out to the majority in order to get the support that, that is needed. Uh, and how do you, how do you get that? Because uh, we, we have the Sami parliaments now, the Sami politically elected bodies that uh, get some funding to produce, for example, school material in Sami, which is naturally a good thing. But on the other hand, it's in Sami, and it's not, no, no Norwegian is able to read that. And the national curricula for school, they don't have anything about the Sami. So, so, the, so the knowledge about Sami people, Sami culture in societies in general is very small. So, uh, so does that mean just, uh, do you feel that this, in a way, is a pressure, it's pushing Sami art uh, into becoming political, even though the slogan is that you shouldn't uh, uh, mix art and politics? Uh, it means a lot of things uh, yeah, it's a big discussion this this fact that there's not for example in schools uh, in uh, on a le nationwide level there is next to nothing taught about uh, the Sami people while there is much more information about other indigenous nations all across the world I experienced this when I was uh, uh, I was studying in high school in, in uh, Tampere, southern Finland, and uh, history as one of my main theses. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the high school, read about uh, six, seven books of history, world history. And one of the books was actually completely dedicated to indigenous nations. And there was a page or a page and a half about the Sami people, while, as I said, much more about other nations. And this is. I mean, w one cannot think, but the only conclusion is that this is politics. It's not a coincidence. And this, of course, brings... Um, uh, you could say that it, it, it sort of puts more value on, uh, on, uh, on, on the art that we do or, or uh, it gives more attention, but at the same time we are in a situation where we need to school everyone else with the basic knowledge. And uh, oftentimes, instead of discussing our art, we have to you know, go through the basic things. How many Sami are there and where do they live and that we actually exist, we are a nation. And um, things like this and uh, many thoughts came to my mind when you were talking. I'm trying to remember them, but... Mm, yeah, because yeah, one of the things I wanted you to comment on is exactly this, because uh, I, th I int intentionally mentioned you are from the so-called Finnish side of, of Sápmi, but you are from Sápmi, the borderless Sápmi. But because uh, the death is important in the sense of, of uh, indigenous peoples and the local people losing their rights because of, a, of an agreement made between Norway and Finland where the, where the local people actually weren't consulted at all, or they 
well, to some extent, can you give a brief account of what happened and why, why that really was so terrible uh, seen from the local point of view and the Sami point of view? Yeah, so the states of uh, Norway and Finland came up with uh, regulations for fishing on this transporter river, Detno, where me and you come from. And, uh, and the Sami representatives were completely, I mean, usually they, they do let the Sami representatives in the discussion, so in order to, to sort of uh, uh, show that, that we have uh, heard the local indigenous nations, but this time they partly e didn't even do that. They were completely left out. And um, mm, this is what, uh, this is uh, a very central thing. I mean, uh, I would say that uh, when it comes to freedom of speech that we, we get heard and there are a lot of common people who listen, especially nowadays, I feel more and more, but does it affect the decision making? That's another discussion. And uh, very often it doesn't. Uh, and uh, decision making on land use, that's a huge, huge discussion. It definitely is. And uh, like uh, one of the famous uh, uh, First Nations scholars, uh, Tayak often er, or always says it's all about the land, and and that is actually the discussion f with, within the Sami group as well with all this windmill, all this so-called green colonization going on as well as well. So, uh, but I don't know if was that what you wanted to comment on it. No, I just wanted to go back a little bit to stressing the importance of um, liberty of expression, not only speech, but um, my latest project, the Pilosatmi, um, you know, it's not without reason that I, I traveled with 200 bloody heads to the district court in Tana. Um, it was basically, I had to use this expression to even get a voice in the public platforms because as a minority, um, your local issues are not really interesting in a, na a nationwide or global debate. Maybe in many cases a global debate might find it more interesting. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, for I, I feel that from a Sami perspective that we have to use freedom of speech or expression on so many levels, just to pierce through uh, a public silence, um, to present realities and facts from, from the Sami perspective, and starting like Pailo Sami has also been so much uh, educating people, because uh, education has been sort of lacking at all levels in society. And my uh, experience has been that as long as people are informed or that they know a story from both sides, not only the, um, the one presented from the governments uh, through you know, mass medias, then, um, then there's very much, um, uh, how do you say it? As of folk people care they engage if, but you know, how can you care or how, how can you go into uh, any debate or engagement without information? So I think um, Sami arts and expressions, artistic ex expressions have, have helped not necessarily on our political issues like the forced slaughtering of our reindeers, the land grabbings for, for financial profits, um, the, the loss of fishing rights, but we are forcing through information and understanding, and I think this is a starting point for any change anywhere, that you need to have a basis of information. And this is where I feel art is very powerful, despite the fact that we are a very small population. Yes, uh, and uh, what is... Uh, what comes through the art is uh, that, I mean, one, one uh, interesting thing is that when uh, a Sami 
uh, well, people who are culturally active uh, keep on uh, expressing the the uh, the needs and the the oppression that we face daily. Uh, we often get comments like, "Well, uh, what are you complaining about? You have all the, you have equal rights to 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 the other other people in in the Nordic countries. All the all the rights, including freedom of speech." But uh, the question is, I mean, it is true that we have we have the 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 equal uh, I I theoretically equal situation to 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 the Norwegians or the Finns, for example if we want to live as Norwegians and if we want to live as Finns but when we want to live as Sami people then we get to places where our traditions are criminalized so we, we, we don't get to yeah, that's when it becomes different that's when, uh, when equality is not really the word that I would use to describe our situation Yes, because you mentioned that um, that uh, you don't reach uh, the politicians. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, every time we have uh, talks like this and panels like this, people already who have a positive attitude already will are the ones showing up. So, so, so the people we really needed to speak to, they aren't. They are never present. <laughs> so, not complaining about the you who have turned <laughs> come here, but <laughs> we're very happy for you. <laughs> But anyway, because that is that, that's what, that's also one of the problems that uh, that we th things are changing. The, it, lots of the Norwegian institutions that work with art and, and literature they, they are very positive to Sami representation. But then to uh, to <laughs> in sense <laughs> exactly. <laughs> When it comes to, to to politics, it's not not it's not the same. We, we have the same, but we only how there you go. I am saying, uh, is there something wrong with this, Mike? Uh, yes, I'll try hers. Uh, now, so when, when it gets to politics, we, we have the Sami parliaments, so as I mentioned, they, they are elected by the Sami, they are the Sami voice, but, uh, but on the other hand, they just have an advisory uh, status towards the Norwegian and Swedish and Finnish government. The Russian Sami don't have more than, they have an, uh, have an association of their own, but, but not a parliament in that sense. And parliament actually also is a, is a euphemism or, or, or something like that. It's, it's actually, it is elected by the people, but on the other hand, everything, the money allocation and so on are decided by the law, by the national <laughs> authorities, not the minorities, the authorities. So, so it's limited the freedom of, of, of our pol political system as well. So, uh, so, but on the other hand, do you feel it's a bit uh, unfair that artists have to take the role of, of politicians in a way, to, to, to use arts in a political sense? Well, this is where we uh, now come back to what I initially started with, the fact that I don't consider myself as an activist. I do it out of a sincere need. And this need uh, arose especially, I'm grown up in uh, Fala, reindeer herding district. This is where uh, uh, Hammerfest, city of Hammerfest is situated. So for a long time, uh, I have had a very close track of how uh, the land struggles start and how quickly they escalate and, and become a critical um, threat to a survival of um, my community and culture in this area. And then this is when I wrote my books and this is where I made this um, visual Utstilling <laughs> ex exhibition called Oivemodzit, uh, madness, very bad translation, but yes. Um, and then what happened, this was after I saw these maps uh, that the government presented through medias after I think more than a decade of um, investing 100 million crowners into this project that we honestly believe was aimed to sort of 
make conditions better for the population in the northern areas. And when then the results finally came, I saw maps. They were only talking about maps, and the maps were pierced with red dots uh, signalizing wherever they had found minerals or gold or whatever in, in across Sami region. And I thought to myself that this, if this is really happening, then we have no place to go, we have nothing left. So this is what really triggered me to, to actually stop working as a journalist, as I did before, because I felt it's too limited. The voice and the sort of format of journalism is too limited. And I needed, um, I couldn't stay objective anymore. If this was simply impossible. So um, being working for years with this thematics of battling to, to you know, protect the land, then all of a sudden we have the forced slaughtering of our reindeers on top of this, argumented by uh, us being the villains in the story and destroying these same lands. So the government was arguing that they are doing this for the benefit of us in order to protect a future for us as Sami reindeer herders. So this is where the situation became mental, you can say. <laughs> So on the one hand, we were fighting against the, the mineral and industrial destruction of our lands. And on the same time, the government was um, forcing slaughter upon our livelihood. And um, it went to a very critical stage where, um, this is too long of a story, but please, if you're interested, go into my web uh, page. You can find a lot of information. But my point was that these are sort of the situations. When I was telling you about the 200 reindeer heads, bloody raw reindeer heads that I traveled with to the, to the court where my younger brother, he was then 23 years old, he went to court against the Norwegian government to protect his livelihood and to protect his rights and our collective rights as Sami reindeer herders. Um, this had to be done because, because the whole system works oppressively. So the medias uh, had no information about the reindeer herding situation, probably nothing about laws, I might dare to say. <laughs> so and if, if I tried to just contact medias, they w there was either no interest or, um, or I felt we didn't have credibility against the established sort of narrative from, from the official um, and government side. So art really becomes for me not something to rebel with, but something that is so like a desperate voice in order to establish a fair debate based on, um, on information from both sides. Exactly, so art out of necessity in that sense. Uh, our time is out, so uh, I was going to ask Niljas about this, is the rhetoric or, or the green rhetoric and what the threat that means to us, but let's uh, just have that as a cliffhanger. And because it's also the situation of the, of the indigenous peoples and the Sami people of the northern countries, that we, this, there are all the situations are unsolved. So, so ending this uh, conversation with a comma, and then continuing at another event is an exact I, I, in uh, a very uh, representative and uh, I forgot the word a very very good way of ending it. So thank you both for showing up. Thank you for coming. And the can stages. I just also say one last thing? Since we were talking about uh, changing things, uh, I I feel very conflicted being here, you know, <laughs> uh, with our message, but. Um, Change has to start somewhere, and I, I just want to thank Nola for including Sami uh, voices uh, on this stage, even though I haven't participated in the celebrations along the week, but um, thank you. We will uh, keep um, taking these kind of stages and opportunities uh, warmly 
uh, with gratitude and seriousness. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good day to you all. We will now invite you to a literary walk through landscapes, places, history, and stories from the county of Oppland in Norway. A county that has inspired writers to produce some of their greatest work, such as Henrik Ibsen and uh, Per Gunt, Sigrid Unset, and uh, Björn Stjerne Björnsson, both Nobel laureates in literature, lived in Oppland, and more recently, Lars Mütting with his book, The Bell in the Lake, a novel that plays a key role in this year's book fair. And of course, many, many more. <laughs> and in Oppland, we are uncovering a great story. We have been assisted by researcher, author, and professor in Norwegian religious science, Mrs. Gru Steinslav. She has traced the great stories about Norway for decades, 
such as in her book, The Myths on Which Norway Was Built, or in Norwegian, Mythne som skapte Norge. She has written us a piece for this book fair, and that, that's called På Spore av en stor fortelling, Tracing a Great Story. And this, this booklet, this here is available now in both Norwegian and German. So please help, you, help yourself um, for a copy. And of course, it's, uh, it's free of charge, like everything else in Norway. <laughs> so we will now give you a taster of what we have to offer of myths, stories, places and landscapes. Of course, all countries, they have some great old myths, deep myths and stories. And in Norway, the old myths and stories often, very often, lead to Oplam. And particularly to one specific mountain area that we call Dovrefjell, or Mountain of Dovre. And Dovrefjell, the mountains of Dovre, forms a vast mountain plateau in the heart of the country. Its unique flora and fauna have survived since the last ice age. And almost 1,000 years ago, a story was written about the origin of the Norwegian people. This old story, it goes like this. In a far, far north, where snow, ice, and coldness ruled, there lived a mountain king, a Jotun. His name was Fornjotr. And in Norse mythology, Jotuns are nature spirits with superhuman strength. Fornjotr. He had three sons, ocean, wind, and fire. And one of his sons had three children, the daughter, Gue, and the sons, Gur and Nur. One day, Gue disappeared, and her brothers set out to search for her. Gur manned his ship, and he searched along the coast. And Nur, he waited until winter and set out on skis. He followed the inland from north to south. He searched high and low for his sister, Gua. And finally, he found her, of course, in the mountains of Dovre. She had married a Jotun, the original inhabitants of the mountains. And also Nur, he settled and married a female Jotun. And according to this myth, this is where the Norwegian originate from. So uh, is it any wonder 
that, uh, that skiing is Norway's national sport when we all originate from a skier. Hmm? Well, the myth about the skier Noor is the overture in the oldest known historical text about Norway, a remarkable work that was written in the late 1100s and has the title Historia Norvegia. And it's remarkable because everyone in Europe was in agreement that history and culture had originated in the south, in the antique and biblical areas around the Mediterranean. And this author, this anonymous author, he swapped the Mediterranean for the Arctic Sea. It is the outermost north that forms the backdrop for the creation of Norway and Norwegians at the mountains of Dovre. The Norwegian Icelandic history was first put in writing in the 1100s, 1200s and 1300s. And that is such as Fagersina and Flateja Bok. And last but not least, Heims Kringla, a collection of sagas of the early Norwegian kings written by the Icelander Snorri Sturlason. And that is one of Norway's most important literary works. And these stories, myths, and history are often intertwined, or as you can say, myths becomes history, or history becomes myth. Such as the story about Harald Hor Fagre, Harald the Fair Hair. He lived around 850 until 930, and he was the first king giving the honor of unite Norway into one kingdom. It is said that Harald, who lived in the very south of Oppland, as a five-year-old, was dramatically taken by the Jotun Dovre to live with him in the mountains of Dovre for 10 years. Harald learned how to ski, survive in the harsh mountains, and fight off dangerous animals and creatures. He learned how to take care of himself, and he became stronger. But one day, the Jotun told him that his father was dying. And he said to Harald, you are going home now. You will take over the kingdom. And I'm telling you, you shall not cut your hair until the country is fully united and under your control the Jotun said. So Harald went home. He let his hair grow until the country was united, just like the old Jotun had commanded. And this gave him the name Harald Hårfagre, the man with the long hair. So this is a hero myth about how the first king came to power. And of course, a different version of this story about a king who was tested in the mountains is found in a saga about Håkon Håkonsson. It is in the early 1200s, and a civil war is raging. Håkon was two years old and was the son of the late king. The boy had to be saved to protect the throne and the kingdom. The enemy was after him. The child was on the run, but he had great help. Some fearless skiers called Birke Beiners. They kept him safe during a dramatic journey across dangerous mountains from Lillehammer to Rena. The boy survived and became one of Norway's greatest kings. Oh, is it any wonder that Norwegians are people of the mountains, always turning to the mountain and nature for our adventures and, and growth? Well, but of course we are not finished with the Harald the fair hair. In a different story, we read that Harald was back at the mountain of Dovre after becoming king, he celebrated Christmas at the king's estate. And in the evening, a Sami knocked on the door. His name was Svose. He asked the king to come to his tent not far away, and the king followed him. There he met Snöfrid, who was Svose's daughter, and she was the most beautiful woman that you could ever imagine. 
She offered the king some mead, that's a strong drink, and he took it all, as well as her hand. In the sagas, it says that the fire ran through him, and he wanted to sleep with Snurfrid immediately, the very same evening. But of course, Svose, her father, said no. They first had to get properly married, and this they did. Harald and Snurfrid got married and had four sons. This is a symbolic story about how Harald Fairhair included the Sami people in his efforts to unite Norway. And so, in the 1400s, Norway became a part of Denmark, a union called Denmark-Norway. The old literature about Norway and Dover was left to collect dust. But they lived on in local storytelling and folk tales. Norway left Denmark and entered a union with Sweden in 1814. And Norway now has got its own constitution. And the constitution was sealed with an oath. And then the old stories were dusted off. And the wording in that oath is united and loyal until the mountains of Dovre crumble. <laughs> so Dovrefjell, the mountains of Dovre, was again a symbol of Norwegian identity and throughout the 1800s was of great importance in the world of art and literature, particularly in the years leading up to 1905 when Norway became an independent nation. And that was a period of strong national consciousness, both in Norway and in Europe. And one who took inspiration from the old stories was, of course, the writer Henrik Ibsen. In his world-renowned poem, Per Gunt, he makes full use of local storytelling and ancient legends. Ibsen suffered several setbacks on home ground, and it was with a sense of bitterness towards his native land that he moved to Italy to write. And, well, there is, there is one scene in uh, Per Gunt that, well, probably is the most famous part of that work. And that is the scene, the wedding scene in the Hall of the Mountain King. Where Christian morals are turned upside down. Good is evil and evil is good. In a high-spirited moment, Per has entered into a relationship with a woman in green. That's the Mountain King's daughter. He is to be crowned emperor of the mountain, will marry the king's daughter, and will be giving half the kingdom. Well, yes, with Per Gunt in the hall of the mountain king, Ibsen, who himself was a national romantic in his younger days, he breaks mercilessly with national romanticism, and the self-praise he feels characterize the Norwegians. His revenge was Per Gunt, which wildly ridicules the national Dover symbolism. The drama makes fun of the Norwegians <clears throat> and displays the weaknesses of national boasting. And what is peculiar is that the Norwegian audience, who were the victims of this satire of every Norwegian, embraced the drama as a significant national work of poetry without taking 
the writer's irony into heart. So the premiere was the start of, of a national romantic Pergunt tradition that may have continued ever since, probably. <laughs> okay. We have had a look of our great stories. We will now show you what Opland has to offer of experiences and attractions. For example, the Pilgrim's Trail. The Pilgrim's Trail with St. Olaf's Way to Nidaros. Across the mountain of Dovre in the end. And also adventures around festivals, events, outdoor play, Per Günt, for example. And Lille Hamlet, the UNESCO City of Literature, and the annual Norwegian Festival of Literature with authors from all around the world. So now it's, it's fitting to, to end our journey where we started at the mountains of Dovre. But still, it continues to inspire. Most recently, via spectacular viewpoint towards the Snö, Hetta Mountain. The small structure is designed by the Norwegian architects Snö Hetta, a global player. Among their designs are the library in Alexandra in Egypt and the Oslo Opera House. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I have unreservedly boasted about who we are and, and what we have. So maybe I have fallen into the self-praise trap <laughs> that Ibsen wanted to put an end to with Per Gynt. Well, but still, what about the old stories today? Are they relevant beyond their heritage status? Hmm? Well, we think a sense of belonging and love for a community is a good starting point to create unity. And all of this we want to share with you.
Ja, das sieht ja aus hier wie Sexmöbel, oder? Ist das Mikrofon jetzt schon an? <lacht> Den mache ich jedes Mal. Herzlich willkommen, meine <lacht> Herzlich willkommen, der Herr und meine Damen und Herren. Am Dienstagabend um 18 Uhr wurde mit einem Hammerschlag von Kronprinzessin Mette Marit die Frankfurter Buchmesse eröffnet. Es hat allerdings zweieinhalb Tage gedauert, bis zum Freitag um 14 Uhr, bis die Wikinger endlich angekommen sind in den Roman von Jan Ove Eckeberg, den ich hiermit herzlich begrüße. Danke dafür, dass Sie uns das wahre Norwegen mitgebracht haben. Jan Ove Eckeberg. Vielen Dank. Und nicht nur das wahre Norwegen, sondern die Hauptfigur seiner im Heine Verlag erschienenen Romane, Harald der Dritte, ist, wie er mir vorher gesagt hat, something like uh, the role model of the Norwegian Viking itself. Could you explain this a little bit? Yeah, Harald's person and his life kind of um, is the essence of the Viking age. She He, he lives an extremely adventurous life and he is also caught between the heathen and the Christian era, you might say. Uh, his um, much older brother is Olav, later the Holy, and, uh, but he's kind of brought up in an old-fashioned way by a Viking legend called the Rana, the Kingmaker. And um, yeah, and he um, he um, he does all the things that the Viking did. Actually, he travels to Russia, to Byzantium, to Constantinople, and he fights for the um, Byzantine Empire in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Middle East, in the Balk Balkan states, uh, and he comes back and become the Norwegian king for. 20 years from 1046 to 66 where he tries to conquer England and when he um, he, he uh, dies at the Battle of Stamford Bridge uh, the Viking era is over for Norway so he's the last Viking king of our country and he um, he's, he lives an extremely adventurous life I think and and his life contains all the elements of the Viking period. Mm. Uh, and uh, when I read, I reread the saga about him, Snorri has written a saga about him, and he's also mentioned in his brother's saga. Uh, I thought, why haven't anybody used this life to, to make novels, to make uh, suspense novels? So I found out I would try to do that, uh, so I did. Mm. Mm -hmm. So there is three books so far. And it's too much to come, I hope. Mm. Hoch erfolgreiche Bücher in Norwegen, eine begeisterte Leserschaft, auch von, Kriti von, auch von Seiten der Kritiker hoch geschätzt, aufgrund der historischen Akkuratesse der Darstellung dieser Romane. Äh, das sind jetzt nicht irgendwelche billigen Krimi-Romane, sondern äh, die Details sind äh, äh, wissenschaftlich fundiert. Darauf werden wir später noch eingehen. Äh, und äh, Jan Ober hat gesagt, äh, das ist sozusagen dieser, äh, dieser letzte große Wikingerkönig steht für all das, was das Wikinger-Zeitalter ausgemacht hat. Äh, wie es in den Isländer sagt, ja dargestellt ist. Zudem gehört ja eben auch die Besiedlung Islands, wo dann die Isländer Sagas aufgeschrieben worden sind. Und einer der Autoren war Snorri Sturluson. Wir kennen ihn als Autor der Edda, also der, des Buches über die nordische Mythologie, ohne dass wir sozusagen die nordische Mythologie nicht kennengelernt haben. Und er hat eben eine eigene Saga über Harald den Dritten geschrieben. Ein fantastischer Stoff für einen, äh, für einen Roman. Um, it was a brutal age. It was, but I think, I think, uh, um, uh, you know that uh, certainly th the people 1,000 years ago lived different lives from us, uh, but they were human beings uh, with the same kind of feelings that we have. So for me, it, it's it's also uh, necessary to explore the personalities. Uh, of uh, the people in my books. It, it can actually be read also as a family saga in some way. 
uh, between these two brother, the one, the king, the older, and their common mother, uh, which is a very strong person, and he, he, she is also exceptional in Norwegian history. Uh, she's the mother, she's the only uh, uh, woman in Norwegian history who is mother for two kings with two different men. <laughs> That's some achievement, right? So, um, um, for me, it was also, um, yeah, I took, I, I took time to explore the family and, and the relation between, uh, the rela relations between the different family members. Because all history and all books are about human beings. Mm. It's not about battles or weapon or killing, but it's about human beings. And what interests readers and what interests human beings is other human beings mm. <laughs> and their life and thoughts and their experiences. Yeah. Und das ist auch eben, woran man sich äh, festliest bei diesen Romanen. Äh, die Lebensgeschichten von Harald, von seinem Bruder, von der Mutter. Sie haben ja gerade gehört, äh, die, äh, die einzige Frau ist, die zwei norwegische Könige geboren hat mit zwei verschiedenen, äh, verschiedenen äh, Männern. So, um, on what kind of, um, or what you, you had the saga and now you have to turn it into a novel. Yeah, there are several kind of sources uh, for my books. The sagas is kind of uh, a bottom, uh, um, what you can call the most important maybe, but you have archaeological findings uh, and you have the places. I go to all these places and I try to also feel myself on, for example, how does it feel to be very tired on the horseback? How is to sail in a windy storm and do these things to experience and try to not live a Viking life, but try to experience how they endured uh, these uh, situations and uh, try to get under the skin of my persons like mm. Harold. And mm. I looked for you know, acts, uh, human acts that can describe their personalities. Mm. For example, in the saga there is a story about Harold and his two brothers. He had two older brothers. And Olaf, the king, came and all these three kids were quite small, were like five to ten years old, something like that. And he took them on his knee and he asked the brothers, what do you want from the king? And the two older brothers, they said, well, I want a lot of farms, I want a lot of cows, I want to be as rich as my father. Uh, and um, Olaf, he, he put up a very ugly face <laughs> and they run scared and run and then you know Harold they put uh, this little kid on his lap and he said I want so many warriors that I can burn down all my brother's houses and eat all their cows and then Ola put up his ugly face and he took his beard <laughs> and did like this so and th probably it's it's a legend right but Snorri writes that to describe Harold's personality that he was a uh, uh, a very uh, a brave person and he, he was um, uh, probably also uh, he, he acted from time to time very spontaneously he was not as shrewd as one should think at least in his younger ages so, and he was uh, very proud of his family of his brother being a king and then when Olaf had to flee the country he was um, he was uh, the Danish king took over control of Norway. That's actually the uh, case for m many of the decades in the Viking era. The Danes are ruling, especially the southern part of Norway. Uh, he was very disappointed with his brother. And one, what happens between two strong personalities? Is one 15, 16 years old, and the other one around 35, 36. And he was so disappointed. Uh, he broke with his brother, but then eventually he's going with him into this big battle at Stiklastar, which is reckoned to be the start of Christianity in Norway then. He was 50 years of age, wasn't he? When what? He, he was 15 years of age. 15 years of age, and he was heavily wounded in that battle, and he, but he was 
he was taken into safety and was hidden for probably several months. And then he flew through Sweden and came to Russia first. He proposed to the wrong woman there, the, 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 the princess of this Kiev empire, the first Russian empire. And he, uh, the father kind of laughed of him and he got angry again because he was a very hot-tempered person. Uh, and he, uh, he, he moved further on to Constantinople then, where he entered this uh, Varagian guard, yes. this guard of, of Vikings, which was the personal guard of the Byzantine Empire, uh, Emperor. Yeah. So, and this is actual history, and we know a lot about this guard. So Sie merken, meine Damen und Herren, wie sich hier sozusagen eine Zeitreise in die geschichtlichen Zusammenhänge ähm, diese äh, Figur, wir, wir gehen mit ihm erst 15 Jahre alt, Harald der Dritte oder Harald der Harte, wie er auch in Deutschland genannt wird, 15 Jahre alt, als er mit seinem Bruder Olaf, dem, der später dann der Heilige genannt worden wird, 15 Jahre alt, in, als er in die erste Schlacht zieht, schwer verwundet wird, äh, ver äh, versteckt wird. Ähm, Sie merken, wie auf der einen Seite sozusagen geschichtliche, tatsächliche Ereignisse verbunden werden mit dem, äh, was gerade gesagt worden ist, mit psychologischen Darstellen. Wie war das Verhältnis der Brüder und allein aus dieser äh, gerade geschilderten Szene, wo Olaf der Heilige diese drei Brüder auf den, äh, auf, dem, äh, äh, auf den Knien hat und die fragt, was sie werden wollten, da zeichnen sich ja schon so herrliche Konfliktlinien ab. Da, äh, kommt man schon, da sieht man, was für Games of Thrones da äh, 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 in Entsta im, im Entstehen sind. Um, but this was, this is, in, on one hand, this is a brutal uh, part of time, but you refer to this time also as, as an enlightenment age. For Norway, it's an, uh, it's an age of enlightenment, uh, the Viking Age. It's uh, 250 years, which changes Norway forever. There is a, it's a technological breakthrough uh, around uh, the year of 1600, uh, uh, which is the longship. It's a sailing boat which can cross open seas. And with this ship, the Vikings sail first to Iceland, Greenland, North America. They sail into the Mediterranean and all the countries around it. And at the same time, with the same kind of ship, they go down the, Ru the big Russian rivers like the Dieppner, especially down to the Black Sea and further on. So uh, they go out, the Vikings go out and explore the world and they bring back home, uh, you know, uh, new uh, instrument tools. But most of all, the most important thing that happens is that Christianity comes to Norway in these times. And with it, uh, 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 you might say a competing ideology, the ideology of humanism and um, of Christianity and, and with also with um, Christianity, the modern language, the Latin alphabet. So Norway also goes from uh, a culture of uh, just telling stories to each other, uh, legendary culture to, to a written culture. And uh, It, it's the beginning of the Norwegian nation building, you might say, which end in, in the late uh, medieval times, around uh, 1250 uh, to the 1300. Uh, so it's a very exciting time. I myself um, is a political um, um, scholar. Uh, uh, political science is my major. Uh, and so it's very interesting to take a look at the Viking Age also from that point of view. I wanted to reveal this a little bit later. Ja, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, und man, man kann das sozusagen zum Ende führen. Die Tatsache, dass wir diese Quellen haben, die äh, Sagas der Isländer, sind ja einzigartig in der europäischen Literatur. Das sind ja realistische Romane. Es gibt in den Sagas, die ja nicht zu verwechseln sind mit dem, was wir Sagen nennen, es gibt in den Sagas keine magischen Figuren, keine Geister, kein gar nichts Übersinnliches, sondern es sind die Darstellungen von menschlichen Leben, oft konzentriert um einzelne Personen, was die, was die gemacht haben. Und die wurden aufgeschrieben 
im 13. Jahrhundert in Island, wahrscheinlich in Klöstern. Und so ist dann der Prozess, von dem jetzt gerade die Rede war, das mit, äh, den, äh, mit dem Kontakt, der durch die Wikingerzüge entstanden ist, mit der Christianisierung, mit den humanistischen Werten, aber damit auch die Schriftkultur, die damit nach Nor Norwegen gekommen ist, führt zu einem Kreisschluss, dass auf die Art und Weise alles aufgeschrieben worden ist. Um, we can talk about them, we can access them via their literature, but still, what can we not understand of the time? Where will it remain strange and inaccessible to us? It's a thousand years ago, so there is, of course, not possible to understand everything that happened in that age. But I don't write history books. Well, it, I have done that also, but not. No, we, we, we are talking non. You mean non-fiction history books? Yeah, non-fiction yeah. history books. I, I write. I write fiction, and and for me, then it's it's important that the. Um, that the, the time are de described in the right way, uh, the customs, uh, the way they talk, eat, their morals, and things like that. But the inside of the human being is the same. So uh, I can instinctively understand the relationship or interpret the relationship between the two brothers, between Harold and his men. He is... Um, Many men follow him um, through his whole life, uh, and he doesn't always treat them well. So what, what is his talent, uh, so to speak, of being the leader of men? And, and uh, what does his mother feel? It, this is the important things for me. Um, I think uh, if you take a look at the book, you might think it's just violence and a very brutal story. But it is also, but uh, and it's... Uh, It's a bloody um, uh, story, B of course it is. It was a bloody age, but it's also uh, a story about human beings and their relations and uh, the family. Mm. Yeah, one has to say, uh, this your German publishing house is, is a publishing house is famous, and this is a th this way. It's the way they present their yes, books. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, they present your book. I think the Norwegian one does not look. It, it's not that warrior-like. No. Yes, yes, yeah. No, it's yeah. a little more uh, mild in its form. Yeah, yeah, yeah genau. Yeah. Also, das ist natürlich hier, wenn Sie das Buch sehen äh, im Geschäft, dann denken Sie, wow, da kommt wieder so ein Krimi-Ding von Heine an. Tatsächlich, Sie haben ja gerade gehört, das ist ein Buch, es kommt den äh, Autor sehr, wie ich schon vorhin gesagt habe, auf die äh, Akkuratesse an. Nichtsdestotrotz, es äh, mangelt nicht an wirklich haarsträubenden, haarsträubenden äh, äh, Geschehnissen darin. Ja. Um, as I wanted to say, I wanted to reveal this a little bit later. What made you write about this? What was the start? How did you get interested in this? Um, I've written a lot of um, or several biographies about uh, politicians uh, and also historic people, Norwegians. Uh, and um, I wrote, I, 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 uh, I was a ghostwriter for a very famous Norwegian union leader. Uh, I kind of wrote his autobiography. And it, uh, after I've done that, I, I thought, I will never write about the living person anymore. Uh, if you knew the guy, you would understand <laughs> what I'm, He was the union boss of 800,000, 900,000 people. And it was a struggle to write his autobiography. And I thought then that uh, his name is Ingo Hogensen. He's very famous in Norway. We probably don't haven't heard about him, but but um, I thought then I would never write about the living person anymore. And uh, I've um, I, I I I then I had this ambition, probably very early, to write a novel. So I started out, and it took me seven years. I did other things. Uh, I'm writing all the time, but uh, took me seven years to get my first novel published, because I kind of had to de-learn everything I knew about writing biographies and books of history and, and uh, political things. Uh, and I've been a journalist for uh, more than 30 years, 
so both in papers and on television. So I thought I knew how to write, but actually writing a novel is very different from being a journalist. What's the major, major difference for you? Uh, it's a totally different angle. While you, as a journalist, you are to present a story as simple and um, write out as possible, right? But in, in uh, writing fiction, you have to go into the persons and let the story develop over time mm. and surprise your reader, uh, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a different game altogether. And it's not that simple to explain the difference right out, but uh, it's a big difference, I can tell you. Nichtsdestotrotz, Sie sehen auf jeder Seite dieses Buches, dass Sie hier in den äh, äh, vertrauensvollen Händen eines Mannes der Schriftkultur sind. Äh, Sie haben es gerade ge gehört, in Norwegen ist Jan Ove Eckeberg bekannt als Biograf. Und ich würde trotzdem sagen, dass diese biografische Schule doch sozusagen auch eine Schule des Schreibens gewesen ist, der Innensicht von Menschen, auch wenn sozusagen das journalistische Schreiben natürlich äh, sich unterscheidet von äh, allein schon von der Ausdehnung, der Art und Weise, wie man eine Geschichte entwickelt, von dem äh, von dem literarischen Schreiben. Hmm. But uh, to be, yeah, sorry, do you wanted to say something? No, 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 I agree, totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, good description. <laughs> um, the um, but still. To uh, be so successful as you are in, in Norway with, with these books, there must be something which speaks directly to us. And it's not, it, it cannot only be that there are family, it's that, that there are family uh, histories, uh, family stories inside, because there are lots of books with family. What, does it, what is it that maybe connects us with the Viking age? What attracts people to this? Yeah, I think. Um Uh, the, the Vikings are kind of a. Uh, uh, it's a lot of interests in the Vikings now, and uh, especially maybe in the entertainment industry, we see films, TV series, books, etc. I think it's something about the um, the, the way they they challenged life. Uh, if you talk with a person who's been in a car accident or something, uh, and they nearly died they will say, I never felt so alive. And, and that was, what, uh, we are intrigued by, by the Vikings. They, they, they sailed uh, over open ocean without knowing what was on the other side. They took enormous risks uh, and they explored the nature. They, they learned how to use the nature. So they, they didn't always fight the nature, but they used it. For example, they were, Uh, how, how did they find their way over open ocean? Well, they, 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 found, they found actually a stone. Um, it's, a, it's a quartz which collects the light. So they could, uh, even if it was gray weather, rain, gray weather, they could uh, actually find the sun and have a picture on in which direction they went. And it's a lot of examples. That's only one example how they, they developed technology actually to to travel over open seas that's one thing we're intrigued by that and uh, i also think if i am as to be a little free uh, that i probably many here have heard about sigrid unset she's the big storyteller in uh, uh, among the norwegian authors and she says i know i i, I never remember that quote Uh, exactly, but what she said is the human heart is internal. It never changes. And I try to, to have that, that as, you know, my uh, ideology when I write that human being is, the mm. heart of the human being is mm. forever. So I think what attracts most uh, I try to describe the Viking Age uh, as it is, uh, and I have also a history professor who reads my book yeah. to, to take out small things that could be not authentic, uh, and um, uh, I think that's one thing, maybe. But the other thing, I think it's a book about human beings living 1,000 years ago.
So I think that's also an attraction. You have mentioned um, you have mentioned fantasy, uh, and uh, people have told me that especially young people only read fantasy, often like this book. That that could be the first book they read. That's not fantasy, but the two genres are very different. While fantasy is is you you take different worlds, you put them together and you create a whole new fictional world, right? But this is uh, a world that have actually existed and is described as accurate as possible and also a person that have lived. So I'm happy to be, to be compared with the Game of Thrones, but it's, it's a totally different thing, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. didn't compare it, did, I didn't want it to compare. No, no. no yeah. as I, uh, I stressed it three times, the, uh, the <laughs> historical accuracy yeah, of sure, the book. Sure. Uh, but, um, noch dieser, dieser, der Kern, das ist natürlich höchst interessant. Die Art und Weise, wie die Wikinger sich den Naturkräften ausgesetzt haben, diese existenziellen Erfahrungen, die sie dabei gemacht haben und diese Vitalität, die sie daraus bezogen haben, vergleichbar, wie Jan Ecke-Berg gesagt hat, wenn Menschen einen schweren Unfall hatten oder knapp den Tod entgangen sind, dieses Gefühl, diese Vitalität, die man daraus bezieht, das ist vielleicht das, was, was uns an den Wikingern auf eine besondere Art und Weise anzieht. Und Sigrid Unset, von der Sie gerade gesprochen haben, die norwegische Nobelpreisträgerin des Jahres 1923, Sigrid Unset war die, überhaupt die dritte Frau, die den Literaturnobelpreis bekommen hat. Da waren es schon 27 Nobelpreise vergeben. Und Sigrid Unset hat ihren Nobelpreis bekommen für die, drei, die Romantrilogie Christian Lavans dort hier. Äh, eine, auch eben eine Saga, eine Geschichte aus der Sagawelt. Und in diesem Herbst ist neu erschienen äh, ihr Lieblingsbuch äh, Victis und Viga J in neuer Übersetzung von äh, Gabriele Haafs, auch sehr lesenswert. Äh, man kann sagen, sozusagen eine klassische Wikinger-Saga von 1928 und eine wunderbare Wikinger-Geschichte äh, gibt es hier zu entdecken. Ich würde zum Schluss eines bitten. Wir hören hier so, so wenig Norwegisch. We, we hear so little Norwegian here. Wir wollen das ja für Sie möglichst zugänglich machen, deswegen sprechen wir Englisch. Um, from all your, of your travels, you have been to all this place. Most would, of them, at least. Sorry? Most of them. Most of them. Yeah. Most of them. Yeah. Could you tell us the one which is the dearest to you, for where you have the, had the feeling you came the closest to Harald in Norwegian? In Norwegian? Yes, because I think then we can hear the sound <laughs> of your heart. There is the where man comes all the name Harald. Det er nok på hjemgården hans. En gård som heter Stein, som ligger ikke langt fra Hønefoss. Like ved den gården så ligger det en gravhaug. Eh, og der ligger Haralds eh, bestefar. Nei, unnskyld. Tipp oldefar. <laughs> Tipp oldefar blir det. Halvtaen svarte. Og han er da far til Harald Hårfagre, som regnes som den uh, første norske rikskongen som styrte hele landet. Da. Der vil jeg si, over de slettene så red han som ung gutt. Uh, han fisket i vannet der sannsynligvis. Han uh, var kanskje med på elgejakt. Uh, han sloss med nabogutten. Der vokste han hopp, og hans mor, for faren døde mens han var veldig ung, hans mor rerte over dette område, og jeg bruker å si om Åsta Gubrands datter at hun er en høvding i stakk. Hvis jeg er sjeften i skørts. Mm. Meine Damen und Herren, dieser Ort, den wir jetzt beschrieben haben, kommt in diesen Romanen vor. Sie haben gehört, das ist eine packende Lektüre für Sie, oder wenn Sie einem Jugendlichen in Ihrer in ihrem Bekannten oder Familie ein tolles Buch schenken wollen, da ist es. Da vorne wird es gleich signiert. <lacht> Hören Sie unbedingt jetzt mit einem Ohr zu, denn die, die perfekte Dramaturgie will es, dass jetzt schon das nächste Buch vorgestellt wird, das seinen Ausgangspunkt nimmt an einer Wikingerkirche. Vielen Dank, Jan-Uwe Eckeberg und ja. herzlich willkommen, Lars Mütting und Ebert Rothshagen. Danke, vielen Dank.
Guten Tag. Schön, dass Sie da sind. Ähm, wir haben auf der Bühne nicht nur Lars Mütting, der in der Mitte sitzt, sondern auch Agnes Rawatten und Are Kalvö. Und das Thema lautet Exotic Norway. Das hat mir einige Kopfzerbrechen bereitet, was ich denn nun was von Exotic Norway denken soll. But we have found a common thread. And the common thread is a big surprise since we are on a Norwegian scene here, nature. Um, I wish to introduce my guests to you. There is uh, Agnes next to me. She, her first novel came in 2007. If I have wrong numbers, you please correct me. In 2007, she has since published nine books, all of which were acclaimed, both novels and nonfiction, and she has received several prizes. Uh, in German, we have Das Vogel Tribunal, which came in 2013 in Norwegian and two years later in German. And the book we talk about today, you see it here in the middle, Ein kleines Buch vom Leben auf dem Land, was published this year. Agnes' translator is Julia Gschwilm. Next to her is Lars Mütting, which is one of the Norwegian authors I think most of you know and I hope have also read because he has been published with several books. One is Der Mann und das Holz, which is a non-fiction book about exactly that, the man and wood. And it was extremely successful. I think it's still the most successful non-fiction book in Norway, is it? Yes, yes. <laughs> Of mine, yes. <laughs> yes. And, but he has written novels since. One is uh, in German, Die Birken wissen es noch. The other one that we're going to talk about today is, um, is uh, Die Glocke im See, which is the first of three novels. Um, and it's in the 19th century and in the part of Norway where Lars lives himself. And uh, Lars novels are translated by Hinrich Schmidt Henkel. Vielen Dank. So that was Hinrich Schmidt Henkel who translates the novels of Lars Schmidting. And the third one in our round is Are Kalvö, um, which you might not know as well as every Norwegian knows him because he is the most famous and the most loved stand up comedian in Norway. He has uh, programs, he travels the country, people love him. Although he makes a bit fun of Norway, <laughs> which is uh, quite unusual for Norwegians to love someone who makes fun of their country. But since he's one of them, he's allowed to do that. Um, his new book is um, an attack on the Norway, Norwegian religion, which is nature, which is walking in nature. And its German title is very to the point. It's Frei Luft Hölle. And um, his translator is Wolfgang Butt. Um, I think I would like to have uh, talk about nature a bit. And um, Lars, your book is in the 19th century. And it uh, talks about uh, humans in a nature that is uh, where nature was still a place where you lived and worked. And uh, I would ask you to read a little piece just so we hear your Norwegian, your language, and then I have two or three questions for you. Okay. Uh, I will read a short and not very joyful story about uh, the re reality for women in Norway 400 years ago. And I will read in uh, dialect. Dörla mål. Fødselen var hard. Kanskje den hardeste noen gang, og det til bygd der barsland gjorde den andre rangen stridig. Mora var diger, men ikke for den tre av dagen i VR skjønte de at hun bar tvillinger. Og hvordan forløsningen gikk til, hvor lenge skrikene jalla i temmerstugga, og hvordan kvinnfolkene rundt henne faktisk fikk ungene ut, alt dette ble glemt. For det var for ille til å fortelges, og for stygt til å minnes. Mora revna og blødde til døde, og navnet hennes ble borte fra historien. Men det som ble huksa, 
for evig. Det var tvillingene og skavanken dømmers, for de var i hopvokse fra hoftene og ned. Men det var jo alt. De pusta, skrek og var freske i hugge. Takk for det, Lars. If you don't speak Norwegian, we have a very bonus for you, for you will hear three very different versions of Norwegian spoken within the next 20 minutes or so. Lars, can you tell, me, uh, tell us a little bit about the book? It starts with a very dramatic scene, and it shocked me when I read it. I so hope so. Is that, is that <laughs> going on like that? Is that the book? No, this is uh, the beginning of uh, a old legend that's been told in my hometown for nearly 300 years. Uh, and this is just a minor part of the story, but uh, what happened is that uh, two church bells were forged in memory of these sisters that were inseparable. Uh, and just as the sister shouldn't be, couldn't be taken away from each other, neither could the church bells. Uh, and this is actually a story that's been told about uh, the church bell in my hometown, Ringbu. Uh, and I decided to make a family story uh, based on, on a family that, um, on th that gave these church bells. Uh, so that hangs over them like a uh, universal law, the memory of the sisters. But the book itself takes place in uh, 1880. So this is just a minor start of it, but a very important yes. uh, piece of it. Yes. Um, a part of the story is um, someone is, is cultural heritage and people traveling between Germany and Norway. Um, that might be surprising, uh, especially as some of the cultural heritage traveling is a complete church. Uh, why did you choose exactly that? Well. I was uh, very intrigued by the relationship between uh, the German understanding of Norwegian culture and the fact that we Norwegians didn't understand or value our own uh, medieval architecture. So uh, in, the, in the book, one of our uh, the remaining stave churches is about to be uh, torn down and replaced by a new one. Uh, and. Uh, as, uh, some Germans decides to buy the remains of the church and re-erect it in Dresden. And that is actually based on a partly true story of something that happened in 1840. So my idea was to have the view on Norway, both from the locals and also from, uh, from, uh, fr from Germany. And uh, I understand that you are... Uh writing more about this story and that we are going to hear more about Germany. Is that right? Yes. Um, this is, uh, I was a bit shy when to, uh, to say that loudly when the first book came, but uh, the plan has always been uh, to write uh, three books in total. So it will form one, one full story where the relationship between the Norwegian family and also the German family are... Um, well, form a very important path, and uh, it will go on from 1880 and a few decades uh, up. Now, since our uh, subject matter is exotic Norway, is there anything in your story or your book that you yourself would consider exotic? Well, a great, a great deal of it. I, uh, <laughs> the whole book is... Uh, uh, an exploration into the, for example, the ancient beliefs uh, and uh, superstition uh, and uh, the contact Norwegians had with nature in, in a time where, for example, light, electric, or uh, el where almost all houses were dark and mm -hmm. all that surrounded us in wintertime was darkness. And the stories and the imagination that grew from uh, in, in our minds from the darkness is, uh, is a yes. major part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Something that fascinated me in your book very much is how little we can imagine everyday life in a rural area at that time. Just what it meant to get out of the house when it rains, when it get out down the hill when it's dark 
and slippery, um, what it means to produce your livelihood. And I think you have done a magnificent job on researching. Do you still have anything, a reminder of that in, in the area where you live? Is there, or is it everything modern and modern and new and shiny? No, a great deal of it is, uh, is still to be found. And um, I also grew up with the, the stories from uh, my, my parents and grandparents. And uh, what we Norwegians enjoy is stories about hardship and how we can <laughs> conquer nature and how we freeze yeah. and uh, our struggles yes. with, with nature. So yes. um, all of that is around that. And the, say, our oral tradition and the, uh -huh. the stories people yeah. tell is nearly always about okay. uh, the hardship. So <laughs> that's, okay. that's we'll everywhere. We'll uh, have more hardship coming our way here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Lars. Um, uh, this is a marvelous book, and I tell you, um, you can buy it, and he will sign it for you, and you will have something wonderful to start your autumn and winter with, I promise. Agnes Ravatten, um, you wrote a book about uh, the wish to live in nature, but not to work in nature anymore. Um, and uh, maybe you would like to read a little part of it for us? Absolutely. But I do work. Uh, oh, know? yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad you say that. So we'll, uh, um, I'll, I'll hear more about this. Uh, but just if you would like to read a little piece for us. I will, yeah. And you listen to the Norwegian. I <clears throat> går kom ut kjørende med de første eskene. Innredde et provisorisk soverom på loftet og la klea våre i gamle, flassende kommoder. Like etter, da J hadde sovnet i vognen sin under tuntreet, sto jeg meg rake i hendene og en fjollete stråhatt på hovedet. Nyslått gras lå sammenfiltret i små hauger rundt meg. Tre ørner sirkler høyt over oss. Og jeg tenkte, hva er det egentlig du innbilder deg? Vi skal låne det nedlagte vestle småbruket til svigerfamilien min i et halvt år. Vi vet ikke helt hvorfor. Vi hører om andre som flytter til New York, Buenos Aires, Bangkok i foreldrepermisjonen. Da så den vår var nyfødd. Diskuterte vi hvor vi skulle flytte hen. London? Paris? Før vi begge ropte, Valestrand? Hvor er Valestrand, Henn? Mange takk. Hvor er Valestrand? Yeah. That's a, a good question. Where is Valestrand? It's a, almost impossible to find. <laughs> It's a really, really tiny small town. It's uh, approximately 300 uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. It's... Um, For those of you who <laughs> know about uh, no Norway a little bit, it's on the west coast, um, in the middle between Bergen and Stavanger. Okay. And uh, you went there for uh, half a year and uh, you stayed, I understand. Is that right? That's uh, absolutely right. We, <laughs> we, <laughs> um, we uh, me, me and my husband had lived in Bergen and then Oslo for the mm -hmm. past 15 years and uh, when we became parents and mm -hmm. uh, talked about spending some time in a different place um, uh, my family in law has this um, yeah, small uh, farm where nobody had lived for the last 25 years and, um, and we had this romantic, naive dream about the simple life uh, in the country, uh, on the countryside, and we really, we wanted to uh, kill that dream <laughs> because we were tired of um, always questioning ourselves about s city life. Is this the right place for us? So we wanted to, to live on the countryside to see for ourselves that Yeah, the city is where we belong, <laughs> for sure. Um, so we were supposed to stay for half a year and uh, uh, then go back to Oslo. 
but um, only after a couple of months we looked at each other and said we can't leave this place okay, so uh, you um, you worked with a house and made it more comfortable for you to live in <laughs> I assume yeah we did because when we first moved uh, there we had okay we had a toilet but we had no real bathroom and we had no kitchen we had oh. no electricity so it's it was pretty basic but, yeah I, I understand <laughs> that it's uh, yeah. different now so uh, this uh, legendary Norwegian nature did it welcome you <laughs> <laughs> well um, the western coast is rainy it's is windy it? and it's rainy it's so rainy have so you heard that we live there in total in um, uh, despite of the weather but uh, but I am from the West Coast, so this is what I uh -huh. <laughs> this is what I do. Yeah. Uh, when I lived in Oslo, it was it was shocking uh, to realize that what uh, do is this uh, is this Norway too? <laughs> no rain, <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah. and it felt like no, th this is too good to be true. We. We need to go back to the you West want to Coast be more and Norwegian. feel the pain Less that we European, love. Less European, more Norwegian. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So well, this is now five years ago. And, uh, ah, yeah. So you still like it. Your book gives the impression as if you had, uh, uh, how can I say, growing pains in the beginning. But uh, the more I read this uh, slim and wonderful book, the more I got the impression that you had a prize Am I here? Am I here? Okay. That you, to your own surprise, uh, discovered that this is a life that you like much more than you assumed you would like it. That's uh, uh, right. Completely right. And, um, and now you said that you, and I said you live and don't work in nature. Um, do you? What kind of work do you do? Do you, do you have a garden? But you write. I write. Yes. So that's um, that's. Um, my main income still yes. and not the, the the dry and brown plants that mm -hmm. i grow in <laughs> my yeah. my silly garden yeah. but um we are now um we have actually become sheep farmers oh so you do <laughs> which uh, work was not the the, uh, part of the plan in the beginning <laughs> but uh, suddenly here we are we have uh, yeah 22 um beautiful <laughs> old norse sheep and they are called wild sheep, and they are. Yeah, and what do you do with them? Feed uh, them. We okay. Uh, well, they feed the, uh, their themselves uh, yes. mostly. <laughs> yes. During winter time, we need to give mm -hmm. them uh, a little bit extra. But um, we cuddle them, and uh, then we kill them. <laughs> <laughs> and you use the wool. Sorry. Do you use their wool? Yeah, we, we uh, have. We have. Uh, a guy who comes and uh, cuts, and <laughs> cuts the okay. sheds. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure, yes. Okay. And uh, I think they make uh, office carpets or something okay. from the <laughs> wool. And so we are looking forward to the next book, which is the sheep and I. Uh, right. <laughs> but a last question, uh, in no, but to, uh, the German talk. Ein kleines Buch vom Leben auf dem Land. That sounds very distant. The what is wrong with that microphone? What is wrong with me? The um, the Norwegian title is much more uh, rough. It is the world is a scandal? Well, is it exotic to live in the countryside? Uh, if it is exotic, is it exotic? And why is it a scandal? It's uh, yeah. Well, this uh, the world is a scandal. It's uh, I think it's a bit hard to explain, but. Um, a a big part of the book is my conversations with uh, my friend yes. Aina Rökland, who is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful part. Yeah, poet, essayist, and brilliant, all around brilliant uh, guy. He's 80, and he's, uh, he has uh, uh, he, uh, he has uh, been my. Um, if you've seen uh, Karate Kid, he's my Mr. Miyagi in <laughs> Valestrand. <laughs> Is, uh, he teaches us both to uh, how to um, lit the chainsaw <laughs> if we have trouble, and but also 
teaches us about yeah. Yeah, the bigger yes. yeah. topics in the human life. <laughs> and he said, the world is a scandal. He did. His words. Yeah. Okay. Well, we come to the next scandal. Thank you very much, Agnes. We come to the scandal <laughs> of uh, talking about uh, walking in uh, Norway and not liking it. Yeah, um, that's, uh, it's uh, the, the book on the, on the idealization of Norwegian nature where you don't work and don't live. Uh, and maybe you would like also to, to read a little piece from your book. I you like listen to, to the Norwegian and to Are. I would like to stress as well that I, I both live and work. Uh, just <laughs> <laughs> I'm alive. Uh, I just uh, not, in not in nature. Not in nature. Yeah, uh, right. I don't do very much in nature. This is a book about mountains and fjords and hiking. And unlike most books about nature and hiking, I'm against it. Um, <laughs> even though I grew up uh, in Western Norway, just like uh, Agnes, in a very picturesque, beautiful place, and this passage is about the place where I grew up, and I think this is the closest the book gets to being poetic. Fra Stavurs troppa ser du ut over markene på garn, og etter markene fjell. Kjører du i fire minutter i en eller annen retning fra garn, treffer du fjell. Dramatiske fjell. Fjell som er turistattraksjoner, fjell som folk reiser halve kloden rundt for å ta bilder av, og fjell med turterreng og alpinbakker. Vi har vår Norges mesterskap her. Vi har vår World Cup renn her. En av tre reklamefilmer som skal se skikkelig norsk ut er filmet her. To av tre reklamefilmer som skal se skikkelig norsk ut er filmet på New Zealand. Det er billigere. There's more. There's more. Og jeg har gått mine turer. Jeg har vært på fjellet. Jeg har hatt ski på beina, både bortover ski og nedover ski. Det var det en gjorde i helgene der jeg vaks opp. Om en ikke hadde en ufattelig god unnskyldning. Thank you. Um, you moved away. You learned to love the city very fast. I, I understand. And then you, you saw your friends doing weird things and you did not spare yourself. You threw yourself into an experiment. Can you tell us about that experiment? Yeah, well, the, the very short version is that uh, most of the people, I, m my friends when I was growing up, moved to cities to study or work or something, and so did I. And for uh, quite a few years, we all loved city life, and we loved meeting new people, new experiences, going to the pub, having fun. Uh, but I noticed at some point that my friends, well, this, this feeling seemed to pass. And one day I noticed that the people I used to go to the pub with are now out in the woods. They are now taking pictures of themselves with their arms outstretched on top of mountains and posting them on Facebook and Instagram. And I was just wondering what happened? Uh, was there a meeting I wasn't invited to? Uh, what went wrong? What are they doing out there? And these, these are people that I, I considered good friends and, and witty people who suddenly started to lose their sense of humor and their will to go to the pub with me, and uh, instead they wanted to seek out nature. And I wanted to find out why don't I feel this pull towards nature. So I decided um, to, I, I caved in, and I decided to go hiking for the first time in over 30 years, because I haven't done anything like that since I was in school, because in school you have to in Norway. Uh, and after, after school I, I, I've, I've never walked in the woods, I've never uh, been hiking until I decided to go out into nature to try to figure out what's happened to my friends, what's happening to everybody. Why is everybody out and about in nature now except me? Because that is the case, particularly in, in <coughs> my age group, uh, men between 40 and 50, everyone is out in nature except me. So it's possible there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with everybody else. <laughs> and that's what I wanted to find out. 
Okay, so I'm not going to ask you what was exotic about this, but because the whole book describes how extremely weird and exotic that was, your yeah, well, experience. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask you something else instead. Okay. I had an answer, uh, but you'll yes, never hear it. Uh, I'm ask you something that I really, I really, absolutely need to know in the few minutes that are left. You say people who hike are lying. How in the world can you say that people who hike are lying? How in the world can you not say that people <laughs> who hike are lying? That's all they do. They they lie and they brag. That's the main thing outdoor people do. They lie about how long the hike is. They lie about <laughs> how hard they found it. They lie about their blisters. They lie about everything. That's basically what they do. That's the main thing I found out, um, and uh, which is which is scary because uh, in civilization in the city, these are normal people, and some of them have have jobs with great responsibility, and out in nature, they lie. So I hope. I hope they don't do that all the time, because then we're all in trouble. Do you still have any friends left? I have friends. I just, know, I just don't know where they are when I <laughs> want to go to the pub with them. <laughs> uh, thank you three for th three very different uh, uh, possibilities to look at Norway and Norwegian nature. Uh, I wish to recommend all of the books you can see here in front of us. Um, they are going to gold make your, your autumn and your winter golden and uh, you, you go into very different worlds with these books. Um, all three authors will be over there to sign the books and you can also buy them there because if you don't buy books, we won't have authors on the scene any longer. So please, thank you very much.
Good afternoon here with Norwegian authors on the book fair. I'm happy to present you Reda Müller. Hello. Thank and you. Lars Lent. Hello. And we have a Tschüss. very Hallo. special Hallo. topic. We're talking about wolves mainly. Although I just learned from La La Lars that we have more wolves in Germany than they have in Norway. And I would have thought that's the other way around. You have 10 times as many wolves in Germany as uh, in Norway. 50 wolves in Norway and 500 in Germany, as far as we know, I just learned. But you are the wolf expert, Reda. You are a geologist, you're a science journalist, and you have written a wonderful book. And uh, he will be signing books afterwards. Lars will be signing books afterwards if you want to. It's called Wolves Trace, Trace of Wolves. It's in Norwegian the same. You were looking for things in the woods. You were researching the forest, the biggest ecological system we have on Earth. And you say, if we don't have this, everything will die. But then you found the wolves. How did it come about? Well, it started uh, actually, well, I ended up standing alone in the forest, howling uh, at the moment here. So that's uh, what happened after a while. But um, it started four years ago. And I uh, went down to a friend of mine, um, which uh, lives an hour outside Oslo. And he showed me uh, two photos of a wolf uh, that was taken by a wildlife camera. And um, I was just moderately interested in wolves before I saw that uh, photo but then my friend he started uh, which is a biologist he started to talk about how shy this animal animal is and how extremely difficult it is to actually come across a wolf and uh, that's uh, what uh, what should I say that that's uh, <laughs> that became a obsession uh, after a while to, to just seek after the, the, the wolf um, but more importantly that uh, at that moment I was also writing a popular science book about forests uh, I was um, exploring how of all this forest ecosystem actually is uh, how is, is, is it perceived by us humans uh, for example in the middle age it was a haunted place it was a feared place but now it's a place we seek rest uh, a place we seek uh, peace. So that's I combine these two stories in a way. This for the, all these facts about the forest and the wolf uh, story, which which is the what you say the narrative in this book. It's a narrative, and it's also um, yeah, a kind of a magical story because you combine facts with feelings. When did you know you would be obsessed and life would be meaningless without seeing one wolf at least at the end of the search? Um, no, I, I, uh, after a couple of months I, 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 I met this uh, Swedish guy and uh, his name is, he was called the Wolfman and he's an amazing guy. He, he has over hundreds of encounters with, with wolves and he also can actually communicate with wolves uh, and um, he I remember he sent me a text message I never met him before it was 11 at night he sent me this text message and he said meet me at the gas station in Sweden and that's two and a half hours drive fr from where I lived and I just jumped into the car and met this guy and we were driving around in the <laughs> on the forest roads in, in Sweden just to come over uh, wolves. So it's, it's very exciting. But explain to us what's, I what's the fascination? What is this once, because there are lots of people looking for wolves and they will never ever see one, but you wanted to see a whole pack. You wanted many. Why? What is the fascination? I, I think the fir my first goal to see a wolf is ex in the wild is extremely difficult because it's so shy. Uh, but my first goal was actually to hear a wolf and uh, with this I ca now, now I'm spoiling uh, the book a little bit but uh, uh, in chapter 7 or something I've been maybe on 15, 20 wolf trips then I suddenly hear a wolf and that's something of the most fantastic I ever experienced in nature actually 
I have read that there are lots of dialects that wolves speak, but we won't speak about this, but we will speak about the fascination. Lash, you have written a trilogy about crime. It's horrible stories out of nature. Nature seems to be a horrible very good... Horrible stories? Yes. People die in terrible ways in your books. But it seems to be a good place. Nature seems to be a good place for crime. You wrote about fishing, about fishing, fish that fly and about birds that are odd and about a man who hates wolves. He is not out in Germany yet. The other two, other two are out in Germany, the flying fish and the odd birds. Yeah, the so, next no, so now actually I'm uh, here to promote the Schräge Vögel singen nicht, which is out now. The Schräge Vögel singen nicht. Uh, it's, not t it's not actually birds, but... No, <laughs> it's... Schräge Vögel, I guess it's weird, uh, strange people, uh, it's, it's a word for that. But all three of them have something to do with nature. Yeah, uh, everything has something to do with nature. And um, for me, the, um, when I was trying to find a new uh, arena, a new subject um, to ha use as a backdrop in my, in my new novel, uh, I came across the wolf conflict. And, and, and for me it was quite obvious because the wolf conflict in Norway is, you wouldn't believe how hard it is. People hate each other. People uh, almost kill each other. In my books they actually kill each how other. How come? Um, it's um, a lot, a lot to do with feelings. Uh, the, the wolf becomes a symbol of uh, how the politicians uh, in Oslo, how they uh, impose uh, laws and regulations on, on the people living in the, in the countryside. So, so, so the wolf becomes kind of a, um, uh, an extra. Uh, the, the real war is between the people who uh, love wolves, the wolf lickers, as the wolf haters call them, and the wolf uh, people who don't want wolves, the wolf haters. And that's... Um, that's quite, it's the, the closest we come to civil war in, uh, in Norway, I would say. You're a f passionate fly fisher. You're a professional fly fisher. You're probably the most prominent fly fisher in Norway. You had TV, world, shows, say, yes. TV shows on fly fishing. How did you end up in the woods with your last book? It's far away from fish. Well, uh, fishing for the most part uh, takes place in the woods, so it's not that strange. Fishing takes place in the woods. Yeah. Uh, in Norway. We knew that you were strange up there in the north. They even fish in the rivers. No uh, fly fishing for trout, which is I mean, uh, what I mainly do, uh, is done in the, in the woods. But I would not say that uh, meeting a wolf is one of my biggest fears. About the fear, we will uh, talk a little bit later. Um, there are lots of questions about the wolves and about the area where they live. When you go into the woods, Reda, to find the wolf, do you have questions with you that are answered while you are there? Uh, questions about more than wolves, about the life as a whole? Uh, when I'm, what, sorry. Once again, w there are lots of questions. He just said there's lots of discussions and conflicts and questions about the wolves. Yeah. But when you go out looking for them in the woods, do you have questions that are answered in the woods that have not necessarily something to do only with the wolves, but also with life? Well, it's it's more. I think when I'm out in nature, I need a goal. I need something to look for, and and uh, uh, that's why I like to have actually the. You can look after mushroom you can fish a trout you can um, you can look for wolves so uh, or mushrooms or anything so that's uh, my goal but uh, for me it's being out in nature it's uh, it's actually try to understand what I see that's uh, something uh, I not I'm not sure if I'm <laughs> answering your questions but for me it's it's interesting just to to um, realize that uh, how important the forest is for, uh, for example, for for the biodiversity. Uh, it's around 80% of all species are actually living in, in forests, forested areas. Um, and also how it has transformed the atmosphere. 
So yeah. Do you feel the same? In I a never, way? I never quite understood people who uh, just love to be out in the woods without doing anything. Hmm. But um, they're looking for something. They do something. Yeah, but I, I promise you they're not going to find it. So I'm, um, when I go out there, I have to do something. I have to fish. I have to look for mushrooms. I have to look for berries. Do you look for, uh, do you look for uh, after wolf tracks? Uh, or are you just writing no, about I'm too uh, afraid to do that. So I, um, I, what? I'm afraid to do that. <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, for me, nature and um, uh, a theme in uh, everything I've done in, in writing and, uh, and making films about fishing and stuff is to try to uh, pinch a hole in the myth uh, that if you only go out into the woods, into the nature, everything will work out. It's a cleansing thing. Everything in the woods is clean, it's honest, it's, uh, it's a perfect world, while everything we do uh, in, in the big city and in civilization is somehow polluted and dirty. Is it? Uh, I mean, you live for in me, both no, worlds. No, no. So, so when people move, decide to move into the woods, for example, to live in a tent or a cave or uh, whatever, um, there's usually a reason for that. And but the reason is not that nature is beautiful. It's because uh, something has gone horribly wrong. <laughs> I agree, but, but in a way also, I also can have bad days in the forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, you uh, know, it, the, the feelings, if you, if you have a bad day, the feelings could be exaggerated out yeah, in the yeah, forest. Yeah. But, so but so I think that um, the forest is also a very good place uh, to leave all that fuss. I agree, but I, I, in the si you know, family, I have a hard time with that, work, but that's, that's yeah, probably all, me. All ex expectations. So yeah. I think that that's why I, I actually oh, go into the forest, do this forest bathing, which is very popular. <laughs> yes, I was going to ask you about that. Is that popular in Norway too? The forest bathing? People go in the, in the woods, breathe deeply, embrace the trees, and feel happy? Does it swim naked? Uh, <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. Uh, there we have it. <laughs> but I think we, we have much more nature in Norway than in, in Germany. <laughs> you yeah, know? but we have woods if you too. Go, you, you, you take, <laughs> but if, if you take the tram 15 minutes, uh, uh, you can take the fram, tram 15 minutes from the Oslo center and then you're out in the wilderness. And actually you can walk 6,000 kilometers in the wilderness, okay, you pass some roads and, and okay. stuff, but, but uh, to the east, uh, you can walk 6,000 kilometers to the east uh, to the Vladivostok in the same um, wilderness, uh, the taiga. So it's, it's um, you know, that's wilderness. But you can take the tram 20 minutes out of Frankfurt and you can walk in the woods, not 6,000 kilometers, but you can see the trees. I yeah, mean, if I, I if I understand you correctly, Ash, it doesn't matter where you are, woods is woods is not so good. Woods, can, good woods can be scary. I, I love woods, but I, I totally agree with having a bad day uh, in, a, in the woods by yourself. It's much worse than having a bad day um, back home. <laughs> How long did it take until you met a wolf? Oh, do you have to read the book? I can't tell. <laughs> okay, you have to read the book. You spoil <laughs> the book. <laughs> okay. Did you, you actually the book? Whole, wolf? That's the whole story, you know. How close to actually... But it's very important no. for you. But but, but, but the story you know, when I wrote this book, I never, I never knew how it would end. So that was a fun, funny thing, you know. When, when you write popular science, it's often a little bit boring. You know all the answers before you start. It just takes a lot of time to write it. But when I had this wolf narrative, uh, how far, how close could I actually get to the wolf? That was, you know, it was very exciting to write a book like that. Is it different for you as a scientist, as a geologist, as a journalist, to write also about yourself and about your feelings and about in between the lines? Because, I mean, you can l read a lot about wolves in Norway in his book, but you can also read a lot between the lines. Mm. No, I, I think um, I started to, uh, I, I wanted to avoid using myself in this book because, well, it, it it's, it could be a cliche, you know, uh, using yourself all the time. But uh, my editor, he was very keen on, you need to use yourself 
in this book. Personal. Because personal. <laughs> because it's it, 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 that's you know it, it, it became an obsession. This uh, wolf hunt. Was it different for you to write about something that you didn't like as much as birds and fish? Lash? No, I love wolves. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a wolf hugger? <laughs> but uh, uh, an interesting thing, uh, the, uh, the reason that it really captured my interest was that my, um, my parents, when I was like 25 or something, they moved from Oslo up uh, into the wolf territory, which is uh, the, the valleys east in Norway. Uh, that bordered to Sweden, uh, a place called Koppang, which is a real, uh, that's where the war is. And uh, my parents were like all uh, Norwegian normal uh, city dwellers. Uh, yeah, well, of course, we. why shouldn't we have some wolves? Norway is a big country, we, we should have some wolves. And it, for me, it was quite shocking. Just, um, I think it was the first Christmas. I've been <laughs> living there for four months, and we started talking about wolves. And they were like, um, I don't really understand why we, why do we need wolves in this country. And they had like turned <laughs> in just a few months, of course, to get the approval of the, of the other locals, not being the, not being the big city people coming up um, doing their thing. But that's quite interesting. Uh, that it's very, of course, very. Uh, it depends on what you do and where you live and uh, how, how you live. But you should be fascinated because you almost grew up with them, right? That would be um, stretching it a bit far, but uh, yes, I am fascinating, fascinated by wolves, but I'm even more fascinated by the people who hate wolves. So tell me a little bit about the book that's not out yet in Germany, about someone who hates wolves, the man. Yes, it starts out with um, with uh, because a big uh, thing for the wolf haters. They always say, "Now we have so many wolves. One of these days, a person is going to get killed, and probably a child." And uh, last time that happened was 206 years ago. And now suddenly, um, a small child uh, out in the woods with a mother is ripped apart by pack of wolves and all the wolf haters go yes what did we tell you this is what, we, what we've been saying all along uh, but then it, the story kind of uh, unfolds and uh, was it really wolves who killed the uh, killed the girl maybe not I actually uh, I read Lars book and um, and I was actually uh, I was thinking that Sometimes when I go out tracking wolves alone, it's uh, starting to get dark, the snow is deep, and I know that the wolves are very close to me. I can be thinking, okay, uh, I will be the next victim. Uh, you feel the fear? Uh, I'm not. F I'm just thinking it would be good for the book sale if I was yeah. killed by a wolf. And also, that's the way to go. Get killed by a wolf. He killed. Yeah. So, um, do you think it would be better for the book sale to have a bad image than to have a good image for the wolves? Um, because it's, it, it corresponds the conflict when you say most people... I don't people think so, because um, uh, the big thing is that the people who hate wolves in Norway, they don't read books, <laughs> period. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I met a few that read uh, reads books. Uh, but, uh, maybe two or three. Then. I, I know, I know. But uh, well, I'm actually uh, surprised by the knowledge about wolves to some of the... They're not... It's more... N there are many opinions regarding wolf. You have people that really hate wolf. They want to exterminate all wolves in Norway. And you have the other ones that actually want to have as many wolf and pos as possible. And you have many in the middle. Uh, so, so it's yeah. Most people are in the middle, of course. But yeah. uh, being a novelist, I concentrate on the extremes, of course. Uh, and they are quite extreme. I even um, entered the Facebook group uh, "Real Men Kill Wolves." I have a sticker actually that says "Real Men Kill Wolves," and uh, uh, we were out in Sweden, and um, uh, there were some uh, poachers driving. Uh, <laughs> On the, they were very close to us, so then I took the sticker 
real man kill wolves and just hold it uh, in the window just in case they will stop us because it's they're really crazy these guys would you or do you uh, interfere in the public discussion about the wolves in Norway as a scientist or as a novelist or do you keep calm I'm just I wrote one article about it, uh, and uh, that was because um, uh, me and my son, we met a hunter in the forest uh, right after I had published a book, and uh, he said, you have to take care of your kids because it's wolves here. And I think, what a crazy guy saying that my uh, kid, and he, he was scaring my kid. So then I was thinking, okay, there's... The, this, the, the fear for wolf is extremely exaggerated by some people. Yeah. But it has a bad image. I mean, in Germany, in, in, yeah. in, 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 German, in Germany, it's the bad, bad wolf in the fairy tale. Uh, probably in Norway too. Yeah. And the it people came with uh, Christianity. Uh, how, uh, but the wolf is uh, mm. very present in po popular culture. Yeah. So you, you're very interested in Fargo, for instance or in Quentin Tarantino, and we found even a wolf in Quentin Tarantino's movies. Yeah, they're, uh, it's such a potent symbol. It can be used for anything, uh, really. So that's, uh, of course, the wolf is used very much in, in popular c culture. Well, actually, I, I actually saw one on the stands uh, here in, at, the Frank at the book fair, and it was this girl standing, and it was, and she was surrounded by aggressive wolves. And it's, it's so it's even here we see this. But uh, there was a picture. Oh. Hmm? It was a picture. I'm not sure. Uh, the, the girl, it was a picture? Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it was a drawing, an illustration. Uh, yes. So it's, uh, you know, it's mm, the myth uh, about, you know, red l uh, <laughs> Little Red Hood riding. riding you have uh, the Fenris wolf in the Norse mythology. You have all this. Um, the, the wolf uh, <laughs> is, a, is a very strong s uh, symbol for, for the negative, yeah. for destruction. Since we don't know... The devil! <laughs> devil. Since we don't know how many of them are around us, and uh, what I learned from your book, they're much smarter than we are. They know where we are, but we don't know where they are. And if they don't want to show themselves, they just watch us. That's mm. what you write. Is mm. that the, the, the narrative, or is that the, the mystic around it? The sense, the, the wolf sense is extreme. You know, it's, it's, it can smell uh, the, the smelling sense. It's, the wolf is our only big nose. It, it, it has the smelling sense is ten time, hundred times more strong, stronger than for humans. So it's, um, it's an extreme animal. I don't know if it's smarter, but it's, uh, it knows when, uh, when we come. It also knows that when you howl that it's a human howl, but howling is to attract them. So would you please show us how you'd attract them uh, when I you're in the woods? I knew that would come. Uh, I've always dreamt about this because in my novel, one of the, one of the bad guys, he takes a letter, what do you call it, letter course, where you get like the things through the mail in wolf howling because he wants to attract the wolf. So can you can you maybe teach me uh, that? I can try to teach you, but uh, then we have to stand up. Please uh, do. I can stand up. And uh, I think that. So, um, but be careful that the wolves will not come here in the room. Uh, sure, but but I I, I think that uh, first time I was asked to hold, I was in the middle of the forest with uh, this uh, wolf man, which is called this amazing guy, and I was standing there, and I actually wanted just to observe him. Uh, howling, and suddenly said, "You have to hold, Radar. No, forget it. And um, yeah, you have to hold, or, or we go home." So uh, we started. Uh, <laughs> so he he teach me, and it it doesn't sound very good. I have to admit, I'm amateur. I still amateur. Uh, but you have to use your uh, stomach. Okay, the belly. And you have to have your chin up. Mm -hmm. But uh, and you, you could you hold a microphone? Could you hold the Assume the position. Okay, and you do it. Deep breath. Hello. You didn't do it? You didn't do it? It wasn't very good. 
That no? sounded like a deer. You, uh, I thought it was great. <laughs> okay. So we can have the wolves here in the Messe since you wanted them to come. But it works, right? I, I think it, it's, it it's, 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 when, very, when it's very fascinating. That is wolves men who teach you how to how. There are people who draw maps that so that we know where they are, how many there are. And uh, there are lots of people who try to make the image better. Do we have to be afraid of wolves or not? Uh, if uh, a big problem uh, was rabies before. And then the wolf uh, becomes crazy. So, so that was a big problem earlier. And, uh, and if, if they get used to humans, it's also a problem. But wolves are not dangerous, but you never know, of course. You can never be sure. It's a big, uh, it's a big uh, predator, uh, of course. It yeah. can be dangerous. Um, but in Norway, the people who don't want wolves, they use fear as a very important argument. Mm. And it goes, yes, we know uh, that the chance of getting uh, eaten by a wolf is very small, but you have to respect our fear. I think it's a question of respect. And that's also a question of being interested and read about it. You can read about it in his book, Wolf Spur, Reda Müller, Lars Lent. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much for coming. And they will both sign their books, The Flying Fish and The Schräge Vögel and The Wolf's Spur. And I guarantee you we have nice literature at home and you will be a little bit afraid. A tiny What? little bit. <laughs> But that's life. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Meine Damen und Herren, es geht gleich weiter im Programm. Ich begrüße Sie zu einem kleinen Streifzug durch Oslo, durch die Straßen und Viertel, geführt von zwei Herren, die es wissen müssen, Chetil Björnstad und Lars Torbe Christensen, Oslo-Autoren, wie sie im Buche stehen. Lars Torbe Christensen kennen Sie von seinem Buch, das in Deutschland ein großer Erfolg war, der Halbbruder. Er hat 1976 debütiert, hat zahlreiche Preise er erhalten und inzwischen über 40 Bücher geschrieben. Ähm, aktuell liegt von ihm vor Die Spuren der Stadt. Das ist äh, das erste Buch in einer Trilogie, ähm, übersetzt von Christel Hildebrand und gerade frisch erschienen. Erzählt dieses Buch die Geschichte der Familie Christoffersen im Nachkriegs-Oslo, schildert einen Mikrokosmos im Osloer Stadtteil Fagerborg. Band 2 und Band 3 sind bald hoffentlich zu erwarten. Ich habe das mit sehr großem Vergnügen gelesen. Und Käthe Björnstad, jetzt muss ich fragen, sieht man Käthe oder Käthe? My mother and my wife says Käthe, but very many, also some of my best friends call me Käthe. 
Okay. So but it's, it's a common name, both, but Kjetil is mo most common in Norway. Yeah, but actually. the way it's uh, it's uh, spelled, it would actually be uh, right to be to say Kjetil. Yes, yes, that's correct. So, but I'm neither not your mother nor your wife, so I say Kjetil, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kjetil Björnstad is, uh, uh, kennen Sie als uh, Musiker, als Pianist, um, aber auch als Autor, er hat 1972 mit einem Gedichtband debütiert und blickt inzwischen auf ein Werk von über 30 Büchern zurück. Ähm, Im Moment aktuell gibt es von ihm äh, eine fünf fünfbändige autobiografische Romanreihe, ähm, die ganz interessanterweise in Jahrzehnte eingeteilt ist. Und es beginnt in den 60er Jahren. Ich kann Sie Ihnen versprechen, Sie haben viel historischen Background da drin. Ähm, man erlebt nochmal die ganzen Jahrzehnte, wie wie so ein Filmtableau im Hintergrund seiner Lebensgeschichte. Die 60er Jahre und die 70er Jahre liegen aktuell vor, übersetzt von nicht weniger als fünf Übersetzern, Gabriele Hafs, Christine Reimers, Andres Brunstermann ne, und Nils Henrik Schulz. Ne, es sind nur vier, sehe ich gerade. Okay. Um, so we're talking about Oslo today. Oslo, the capital of Norway. Um, Actually, right now, it's like a little bit over half a million inhabitants uh, in, in Oslo. So it's still kind of a small and cozy capital to be a capital. Um, you both grew up there. You, you both um, almost lived in the same areas. Mm. And um, I mean, it's not necessary that you only because you grow up and live in a place when you're young that you always turn back to it in writing. What is so magical about Oslo, about Majorstua, Fageborg? Um, I don't know if, if that's the reason, but I grew up there. It's not, that, therefore, it's magical. But um, I think all writers, in a way, are local writers because. Every story has to take place some place, and I'm very cons uh, I'm, I, I have to find a place for my stories. And um, Oslo is that place for me. That's where my my characters belong. That's where my poetry I find my poetry, so to speak. And um, so uh, it's a very natural choice for me, but it took uh, some years before I understood that, uh, okay, Oslo is my literary town too. Because in your books, Oslo almost appears like an, like an own character. I mean, when I read um, um, Die Spuren der Stadt, it, it reminded me of uh, the half-brother, because also there Oslo is, is very strong, strongly yeah, yeah, present. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's also this local uh, part of it. It's a very close connection between the characters and the city or this part of the city I, I write about. And actually, the first time I, I began to think about this was when I heard Penny Lane by Beatles, uh, the biggest uh, rock group in the world, making a song about their own street. And that was kind of, uh, I, I began to understand something uh, just then, that um, you can just look out of your window and maybe you can find uh, mysteries, poetry, interesting characters just in front of you. Just in front of you. Yeah, I understand. What, what, and you also grew, grew up in Oslo. You moved a little bit around in the, in the city of Oslo. Uh, from the very west, like closer to the city center, if I understood that right. But you also, w what, what is the fascination of Oslo for you? What is, what's the magic in, in Oslo for you? You know, you know, it is uh, arena for so much of my life. And as you say, Lars, you have to find, find a scenario uh, for the story. And uh, still, Oslo has. It is so much changing these days in this city, and it is bigger than you said. Actually, I think now 700,000. It, it's a big pressure on the on the city, but still, we have the main street, Karl Johan. We have the area where Lars and I ha we have been living for many years, the Frognør Schillebeck area, and we have 
also the literary tradition for me, reading the Christiania Bohem, Hans Jäger's book, Fra Christiana Bohemen, yeah. which came out in 1885. It is uh, still one of the best Oslo novels I have been reading, and it is so full of atmosphere, and it is the same streets. It's even the Grand Café. And also for me, working so much with Edvard Munch, his paintings, and very much of his writing, is describing Oslo and the streets. And it's uh, such a pleasure to, to, to go back to those masters and but find a new uh, yeah, yeah. approach, actually. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, like Ketle says, uh, uh, what you are, have been reading, you, 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 the books you have read is also the part of your experience. So, so uh, I, I read uh, Knut Thompson's Hunger when I was early in my teen, in when I was a teenager, and it made a very strong and deep impression on me, and still does. And, and Hunger is the first modern novel about uh, about Oslo. Oslo. Yeah. And in 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 that novel, the city is uh, <laughs> a strong character uh, in 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 the in, in the story, so and and in language. So has something to do with that too. But it's it's also a very um, consistent city, isn't it? I mean, the things that were there a hundred years ago, uh, like the Br Br Bristol or the Grand Café, I mean, many things um, from these days when, when, when these authors describe that the, the, these places are still there. Do you think it has to do something with this um, continuous, with, with that it's kind of a safe place that doesn't change so much, actually? You know, Oslo is such a um, fantastic s city with, with the dynamics. You have the, the forest up in the hills, and you have the fjord. And if you look at the screen by Edvard Munch, you have the exact same uh, picture of Akershus. Uh, and uh, I, I feel that the city is especially inspiring. It could be, it's so many authors, as, as Lars says, with, with Homsen, but it's so many more authors going back to the streets there. It has also a brutality, but it has such also uh, lovely friendliness. Yeah. And it, it, is, it could be for many authors uh, an obvious uh, background for a story. It, 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 of course, if you live in Oslo, uh, it's, it's very easy to go to the streets and to the nature and find out what, what the story is about, what the actually. Stories are also, about. Yeah. Maybe we can just hear a little piece of what the stories in Oslo are about. And we hear uh, last reading a little part of um, uh, Bion Spur. And I'll then read the German translation for you. Uh, well, it's the first part of the prologue of the, the first book. And of all the three books, it's three books, uh, one, two, three. Uh, so it starts with an invitation from the narrator to the reader to, okay, take my hand and I walk you through these streets and I walk you through this story. Kirkeveien begynner på frogne plass der trikken svinger øst og vull mot Elisenberg og Soli. Vel å merke hvis man kommer i den retningen og vil bort fra Fagerborg bort fra Majorstua, bort fra denne byen som jeg tross alt elsker på godt og vondt, godt, den størrelse og antall trær passer mitt humør, vondt, at den stadig vil bli større tærer på det samme humøret. En by må være på sin egen alder, ellers ligner den et barn i småking eller en olding i matrostress. Da vekker den bare latter og ikke hjemlengsel, Gutten, nei, den unge mannen, for det er en mann han er i ferd med å bli. Han som sitter på trikken, han du ser i forbifarten denne tidlige morgenen, mens alle våkner til de sørgeligste nyheter en takknemlig befolkning kan få, vil bort, bort fra Fagerborg, bort fra byen, bort fra alt, bare bort. Han heter Jesper Kristoffersen og har en fullpakket sekk på sete ved siden av seg. Legg merke til blikket hans hvis du rekker det tomt og åpent på samme tid. Han ser og blir sett. Under det venstre øyet henger forresten en blå skygge, et minne. 
En gang fikk han diagnosen følsom. Der Schirkewein beginnt am folgenden Platz. Genau da, wo die Straßenbahn nach Osten zum Elisenberg und nach Solli abbiegt. Natürlich nur, wenn man in diese Richtung geht und weg will aus Fageborg, aus Majorstua. Weg aus dieser Stadt, die ich trotz allem liebe. In guten wie in schlechten Zeiten. Gut, ihre Größe und die Anzahl ihrer Bäume passen meiner Stimmung. Schlecht, ihr Wille immer größer zu werden, rüttelt genau an dieser Stimmung. Eine Stadt muss sich zu ihrem Alter bekennen. Ansonsten ähnelt sie einem Kind im Smoking oder einem Greis im Matrosenanzug. Und das erzeugt nur Gelächter, kein Heimweh. Der Junge? Nein, der junge Mann, denn er ist dabei, ein Mann zu werden, der in der Straßenbahn sitzt. Der Junge? den du an diesem frühen Morgen im Vorbeifahren siehst, während alle zu der traurigsten Nachricht aufwachen, die einer von Dankbarkeit erfüllten Bevölkerung beschieden sein kann. Er will weg. Weg aus Fagerborg. Weg aus der Stadt. Weg von allem. Einfach nur weg. Er heißt Jesper Christofferschen und hat eine vollgepackte Tasche auf dem Sitz neben sich stehen. Beachte seinen Blick wenn du es schaffst, leer und offen zugleich. Er sieht und wird gesehen. Übrigens hängt unter dem linken Auge ein blauer Schatten, eine Erinnerung. Früher einmal erhielt er die Diagnose sensibel. Um. I just want to say that it's translated by Crystal Hildebrandt yeah. and uh, we are, ex I think, Norwegian, or n Norwegian is a very good language, but very small. Uh, so uh, without the translators, we wouldn't have been here at all. Yes. Definitely. Yes. Mm. You can say the same. I think this is very important and especially here today in this, in, in this context, it's, it's so important to, to say it. Mm. I, I also named uh, all the four or five yeah, translators from... I appreciate uh, it very much, of course. Uh, yeah. Very grateful for and, it. And I think, I mean, it's... As a translator, you have to be, you have to know the place as well. I mean, it doesn't really... It, it's not enough to only look at the names and look at a map. If you want to carry on the feeling, from, for example, from Oslo, from the city, it helps mm. a lot if mm. you have been there, if you know it. Of course, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, because... Uh, uh, all the streets, names, and, and, and the addresses in, in, in the book are written in the Norwegian uh, uh, language. Because I, th I think these points or the addresses and, and so on are very important. If you don't understand it, it, together it will make a kind of architecture for you, poetic architecture, which is also kind of image of the of the city of the city yeah and you 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 are both describing um, um uh, the part of the city which is called Majorstua uh, and Fagerborg around that Frogne mm -hmm. and um can you tell like people who do not know Oslo what what's characteristic for these the, this part of the city Th that's very bourgeoisie area really at it is the um Embassies, but it's also normal life, as you are describing so uh, fantastic in your books. We, we lived there uh, in quite good conditions uh, when I came there in 1967. You you grew up there, but it it is uh, it is a, a wonderful area with a big park, you know, from the park and with the Vigeland. Um, the, the, the uh, part with the big statues you have yes. probably have seen. But, but then suddenly you, you are coming into what, what Lars describes. You, just, you can go 100 meters and you, you have a total different atmosphere. Up Kirkevein, everything gets uh, changed. It is a quite cosmopolitic uh, atmosphere, I think. I don't know if you agree with that, Lars, but uh, it is... Yeah, I, I, I agree, but... but uh, that's something which has changed very much from the time I write about. Yes. Uh, I write about Oslo in the past, in the two first uh, uh, novels in this uh, 
which is in the, in the beginning of the, of the 50s, yeah, we, yes, we, have, we, yes. we started and, this and book. And then I think Oslo was uh, every part of, of the of part of the town was like a village, and uh, the people who lived there very close connected to um, her or his village, and and there was no mobility in in the city. Um, as uh, Ketel said, I uh, I grew up at the west side of the river, and I never. Uh, cross the river of free will. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> just when I played football with my team, then we all was put into a bus and they drove us to the east to part the of town. And the east part and was then known we to played, be played the game and then we hurried home. And uh, because and the, the east part was somehow scary? Or no, no, it was scary, but there was no very little communication between between the east and, 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 and the west. That has something to do with, with economic, with yeah. uh, different, different classes and, and, and so on. But today that's it, that is very dif different. And uh, the mobility and people move all over town all, all the time. And that's something I really like. You like that it became yes, yes. more c more cosmopolitic yeah. in, in a way, yeah. But um, you said you you are you said it's uh, very bourgeois, and I think in Oslo, the further you come to the west and closer to the woods, the the more bourgeois it 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 gets in a way. Yeah, but we are not thinking so much about it. I think uh, uh, that's easy for me to say, perhaps because <laughs> I haven't. But you know, in in my school, because I I went to the Steiner School, uh, um, Waldorf, uh, Waldorf Schule, School, yeah. and uh, people came from all over the city. So I was very much in the east part in Böhler. Lombard said I visited my friends. Uh, it was people from all over. But something special both for Lars and me, I think, is that the main radio television station was in our... Uh, you have a fantastic uh, short story about NRK, NRK Huse, which they are now are deciding to, to sell and, uh, and, uh, and moving from. But I, as a pianist, I, I, I was able to practice up there. We were very close to a powerful building really uh, for me that that was important especially because i was a musician i think yeah but i uh, mean you, yeah. you 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 had your concerts there you had yeah. uh, your radio yeah. um uh, I mean it, I it gave very much energy you know and you saw all those uh, musicians coming in all the time and uh, actors and uh, you were in a part of the city where, where you felt that m miracles could happen yeah do you still live in the same areas yeah, close, close yeah. Uh, to it. So, so I'm still connected to this uh, part part of the city. But mm. still, like we're living in uh, in the year 2019, and you both, I mean, of course, it's natural because your books are autobiographical. So you you look back to your to your youth, and you also look back to the to the 50s, and you decided to write about um, the city as it used to be. And is there like a little uh, a little piece of nostalgia about it? And with what's what the city like you you are having in your heart? Is it the city from the old days, or is it is is the city in your heart growing with the actual city? Well, I think it's important to have both cities. I think it's important not to forget about how Oslo once uh, was, not so very very long ago. Uh, and that's what I'm writing about especially in the two first novels uh, and, and uh, kind of uh, I'm, I'm writing about Oslo uh, in the past I think it's it's and when I wrote it I, I realized that the, the time I'm writing about is it's gone it's it's over it, it's not there uh, anymore uh, and anymore and that made me kind of sad and I think this yeah very sad something is uh, definitely gone. Uh, so, so writing this is also using as my the craft of memory uh, to, to rem remember uh, the city how it used to be. And I think that's important enough, but that's not uh, the same to say that I'm longing back to this time. I, I, I really don't do, no. Yeah. But yes. I like to write about it. 
I, I think the it's craft easier. Of many, yeah. uh, craft of uh, memory, of course. Is, that's, mm -hmm. that's what your books are about, too. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's easy to misuse a uh, word like nostalgia because uh, it has something negative in it is, uh, that you are, are giving up your longing to another time, as you say. And it's not like that. And you know, those streets in this area, they are totally identical. I was a pilgrimage to a large building where he grew up. I had never seen Gabrielsgate <laughs> 19. I was not sure. I, I knew all Gabrielsgate and we have friends there, but I didn't know about 19. So uh, four weeks ago, I, I went to the 19 and looked up in the flat he's writing about uh, in his book. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm so happy that so much are, are still there and the past is there. And you have to, for me, the project is about also be comfortable with, with your past, not struggle with, with the past, but find back to it and use it as an inspiration for the life you are living just now. And uh, one other, th other thing, which is, uh, of course, very important for me, that uh, the past and is also uh, loaded with stories. And I'm trying to write some of those stories. And when you write a story and you give it to the reader, then you, at the same time, open for new stories. So uh, uh, I, 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 almost every day when I walk through Oslo after this was published, uh, uh, people approach me and, and telling me personal stories after they read my book because something in their memory are uh, it's triggered. triggered. And that's a wonderful thing uh, to, to give away a story and then, well, get the story back and that's kind of big wheel of, of, of stories uh, and poetry and, and that's, mm. uh, that's an enormous gift for a writer. What, what I really liked about uh, both of your books and, and not only these but also all of your, of your works is it's always very close connected music. Music and the, uh, the city are like the main, the main subjects that go through all of your books. And um, I mean, Kitty, you you are you are a musician and and, and an author yourself. And has it? In, I th I think in the seventies books you write somewhere. It has never been a question if you have to decide. You never wanted to decide either being a musician mm -hmm. or an author. And uh, but how do these two go together? Is it uh, do they match well? You know. Uh for many years, I tried to, d to divide very much because I wanted to be taken seriously in both fields. Okay. And uh, it was not so easy in the 70s because um, it was people were skeptical. But now, the, even after the Windingspiel and the Till Musikken, it opened up. Uh, I, I was thinking music is so important for me, so I, I thought as an author now I, I can write about this. But it took me some years, actually, this story I've been talking about this with Lars many times. But you, you know, Oslo has, is still and was a fantastic uh, cosmopolitan for music. And I grew up with the biggest, biggest uh, classical musicians, Wilhelm Kempf, Arthur Rubinstein, Marta Argerich, Every, everyone came to Norway to play for us. It was a fantastic rock uh, city and jazz city and, and still is an extremely interesting place for music. Is it, and is, is it still like this? Are yeah, okay. extremely. Uh, I and you know, the Oslo Philharmonic, I have to say, is one of really uh, uh, incredibly um, interesting orchestra these days. Yeah. Mm. And in, in your books, music, or especially piano music, plays, uh, plays a very important role. Do you, um, there's almost always a, a boy who goes to piano lessons or takes piano, or once dreams of taking piano lessons, and there's always uh, some awkward piano teacher <laughs> around somewhere. Mm -hmm. did, is, did, do you, did you ever learn to play the piano? Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I'm not that good. Um, <laughs> but but, but uh, uh, actually, I, I the, this uh, Italian piano teacher, yes. which is very important in, in this, this novel. Exactly. And that's a, that's a kind of literary portrait of my own piano teacher in the in in the si mid sixties when my mother sent me to to learn to play classical piano and uh, uh, I wasn't so fond of it then but I'm very happy now at least I met 
a wonderful man who had <laughs> whom I can write about uh, <laughs> today. And actually, he, when he was not teaching and willing young Norwegian boys to play piano, he, he was playing in the restaurant at Bristol yeah. every weekend. And uh, I always had my hour of learning uh, on Monday, and then he was very, very tired. <laughs> so but he's I'm still, still thinking of him. He's still there, you know, Lars. Yeah. Yeah, this yes, man is sitting, playing. No, yeah, he must be yeah, 160. Perhaps not the same, not the same but, but, but uh, a he's similar looking one. looking very much like. <laughs> but it, it, maybe <laughs> as, a, as a last question to, to sum up, it's like you are both also combining your literature and your music. I read about that you are having a common project which is called um, a, a Suite of Poems. What is that about? Um, when I was, was publishing, and this, this, this has been going on for more, almost 15 years because when I published my novel, The Half Brother, I, I was traveling, the year after that, I was traveling around in many countries to, 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 yeah, uh, with the book. Uh, and suddenly I found out that uh, I, I didn't want to go to the mini bar every night. I would write a poem instead. So I started to write the poem in English from all the hotels. I, I, stayed in and eventually I sent one and two and three to Ketil and he after some time put some composed some wonderful music for me. It okay. was a gift you know it was fantastic to get those poems and uh, they, they, it, it, it made it very hard to dare to, m to make music out of it but then we found Anneli Drekker former Belcanto singer, uh, still Belcanto singer, and, yes. uh, and it, it was also a gift that ACM, actually recording company, took, took this album and said we, we, we will publish it. It was a big inspiration, yeah. so we have been making concerts both in Bremen, no, not so many in Germany yet, but I hope more, and, and also in Oslo. I'm, also sure work with it. Yeah. I'm sure now you have an audience who's really curious about uh, about this project because I, I think it's, it combines the most uh, two wonderful gifts you two bring to us and have brought to us with so many books. And I thank you very much for that. And I ask you, everybody, please go and read these books. You, can, you don't have to go long. You can just go over there and buy them. And both Lars and Sietil will be sitting there and uh, signing the books for you. And um, yeah, go and listen to this wonderful music with the hotel room poems. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here.
Dear everyone, a very warm welcome to uh, the Norwegian Pavilion uh, and a very warm welcome to the House of Literature in Oslo's contribution to the Frankfurt Book Fair. My name is Andreas Telstedt, I'm the Artistic Director at the House of Literature in Oslo and I'm very proud uh, to be here to introduce uh, this production featuring three of the most interesting and distinct voices in European fiction today. Uh, the Politics of Emotions is the title of this uh, production, this performance, which was commissioned by the House of Literature in Oslo and produced by us. Uh, it has been on tour in Norway now, uh, in September, and now it's touring here in Germany. We played in Frankfurt uh, City uh, yesterday, and we're here today, and in Berlin to tomorrow. Uh, we have asked these three fine writers to explore the relationship between politics, emotions, and language with the current political situation in uh, Europe and the world as a backdrop. The writers are from Norway, Maria Schulz von, whose uh, novel Kinderhor is, has just been released in uh, German and to great reviews. Uh, she was also uh, nominated to the Norwegian Book Award last year for the, this novel. The second writer is from Denmark. Her name is Luna Aburas. Uh, she is the recipient of the Montana Literary Prize and her latest book is called The Black Book B-Sides, uh, just released in Danish. Uh, and the third writer is Kaio Chingoni from the UK, uh, whose uh, debut full-length uh, poetry collection Kumukanda was released last year and awarded him the Dylan Thomas Award. They are joined on stage by Sandra Kol Kolsta, who is a, a composer, who has composed original music for this production. She's also an artist and uh, a musician with many different fields. Some of you may have seen her here on stage earlier this week, uh, performing Jon Fosse poetry. Uh, and uh, also on guitar, Marianne Stranger, uh, a Norwegian multidisciplinary artist here playing guitar. So please welcome the politics of emotions. Lying on a carpet, the pills are like a white film over the memories, but they're somewhere down there, as if my head is a video game where the joystick has been handed over to a four-year-old, everything crashing and detonating, colors exploding. Then I heat up the spoon, fill the needle, think I'm reaping what I've sown, Find the vein, smack, boom. The bang makes that whole game short circuit. The screen turn white, a little white slice in the brain. I have 10 years of education as my own nurse. I woke up from an OD two days ago, or was it two weeks? I wasn't planning on dying, or maybe I was. I woke up in the ER. The blood pressure monitor draped around my arm, like a piece of clothing from the Salvation Army. That's a little too big. Or going out in the backyard with your mother's dress. Too early, too young, feeling the rain through the dress, through your skin. Too 
two feelings that are mine. Sedation and succumbing, shuffling more slowly than my heart. The slam and the smack before everything is still, still, still. The craving afterwards, the shaking, first a mild snot, and then it gets worse. Puke out my heart with craving. And then I get the tricks and the fix. The bills and the plastic bags rustle and everything is just as it's supposed to be. Putting in a needle is like sitting in an armchair with a cup of cocoa, cozy and warm, where it's winter outside and the cold has nothing to do with you. I own the clones of Pam I put under my tongue. I don't own my tongue. When I walk, I can see myself carved across the asphalt. A needle here, a beer can there, a pillbox there. All the pieces of me, plastic and aluminium. My body itself, skin hanging like a tattered dress over my skeleton. That has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with me. I'm lying there, spread across the ground. When I find the vein in my groin, I find your heart, I pull the trigger, I shoot. I shoot the years I don't remember because I remember them all too well. Like being a kid and being fed and nursed. Like being a kid and no longer owning your own mouth, your own throat. I buy chocolate and ice cream. Fill myself with something sweet until the taste of you is no longer in my mouth. Then my body expands. I feel it swelling up and go into the bathroom, deep throat myself until everything is gone. Get everything out, flush it away. It never happened. It's just gone. All the damage done. I played a game when I was little. It was called Doesn't Exist. I took everything I did not want to think about, strangled it in the bedsheet and thought, it doesn't exist. Once I tried to strangle myself, and as it tightened more and more against my throat, I thought, high on oxygen deprivation, I don't exist. And that was when I understood that the only thing I needed to be in this world was not to be there at all. But even though I don't exist and no one sees me, they see something. My teeth, for example. My smile is dark and full of holes, a bit like my memory, a bit like my skin, a bit like a map of the world. If I walk into a fucking cafe to buy coffee with money I've gotten myself, they just say it is not plain to warm up. I try to smile my way out of it just smile myself further out the door. Apparently, you can tell how old someone is by looking at their teeth. And a mine you can tell, I've never been young and I'll never be old. Records say that I'm 28, homeless, that I've been convicted for minor drug offenses, that I have dependence syndrome for benzos and opiates and bulimia and alcohol abuse. And these are facts I can read now and then, just to convince, convince myself that I exist somewhere, at least on paper. But I don't. I never accept money. I'm not a whore. 
I could never do that. And besides, I wouldn't like to know how, much, how little people would be willing to pay. Being at someone's place and drinking a few beers, and sharing, sharing a needle, and then fucking. That almost sounds, sounds like a normal thing people do. Minus the needle and the beer. But still, sleeping around a bit. People do that. Tinder and such. And so what if there's a little dope involved? Nothing more out of the ordinary than someone treating you to a beer. And if you get a little bit extra afterwards, nothing stranger than being treated to breakfast. I could never just take cash and get down on my knees. I'm not a minstrel begging to be fed. It's different with a baggie full of powder. It's entirely different. People are sick of my tricks. Tricks with dough, tricks with money, tricks with the truth and variations of it. I try to play, play tricks with my body, but it's bony and bloody like a dead bird. And I'm the cat standing on a doormat, presenting it. The price never changes, but there are many places, many ways to pay. And I'm completely broke in every way. During therapy, they said I had to have faith, trust in myself, in a system, maybe even in someone else. No. I trust that what's in the baggie is what the guy on the corner says is in the baggie. Out of his pocket and into my veins. No problem. I trust that if I put someone else's body in my mouth, I'll get pills and powder afterwards I can put in my pocket. That I pay for something I can swallow by swallowing. That someone could smile at me without a state having paid them to. That I could spend a night with someone and woke, and woke up with my money and phone. That's a fairy tale I outgrew long before I ever even heard it. So, I've never been a dependent on a person that, ha that hasn't been paid to help me. Not with shelter, or a place at an institution, or prescriptions, or dope. I don't need roof over my head either. I don't even need that much food. The dope keeps me warm and full. I don't need anyone or anything except from small baggies with brown powder. Completely free, in a way. Sleeping Beauty sticks herself on a spindle. When I put a spike into my vein, then I'll tell you things aren't quite the same. Drops of blood to the floor. Cause when the blood begins to flow, and it shoots up the dropper's neck. And she falls, falls. When I'm closing in on death, and sleep, in a vacuum in time then thank god that i'm good as dead and her body has nothing to do with her and thank you god that i'm not aware and thank you god that i just don't care After my kaka, my father's father 
who died before I was born. I was gifted this Luvali name, the self-same born by my kaka, brother to my father's mother, who hugged me at Kawunda Airport because his sister, my kaka, died before I had a chance to see her again. It is not only my body I've carried this long while to the side eye and scrutiny of border control, but the name your tongue stumbles on, an heirloom, a shibboleth. This is the word for a boy child in Darlington, whose mother heard my mother speak this name and wished one day her son would feel its weight when she called him or conjured him in conversation the way my mother did to think I thought myself unloved. What you might think a simple case of tomato, tomato is life and breath for somebody like me who could search all your histories and never find his epithet glowing among those annals and tracts, who does not exist according to your version of events. Did no one tell you naming is a magical act? Words giving shape to life, life revivified by utterance, so long as proper care is taken to pronounce the words correctly, thereby completing the spell. Variations on a theme, chicken eateries, bets, Checks cashed while you wait. Hit and run. Midday, did you see? Outside, a man shouts into his phone. She can be by herself. He is no small boy. In the background, Trap beats wander the stereo field from the windows of cars bent on avoiding the rush. At the bus stop, kids from Mayfield shout YOLO, crack jokes, wait for the 364 to take them to Barking, where they have siblings to pick up from school and dinner to make. so-called and how do you like your digs are you somewhere now bumping dark rhythms cut with a thread of light what a time to be alive everyone's going on spare not just my life going on pair have I told you about my recurring nightmare a hammer coming down on a tree stump. My hand waiting on the tree stump for the blow. I learned of your passing as I dressed for a wedding. 
Shifting the knot of my tie, I said, okay. Marveling at the way a stock phrase insinuates itself. The way certain men spread to fill a space. We hadn't spoken in months. If I had known the words, brav, what is good, would be the last words of our correspondence. I would have told you that the table and chairs in your mother's kitchen rebuilt me. I would have asked if you remembered the day we listened to Crystal Clear on Rinse FM and glimpsed joy for long enough to dance. Blind drunk, two friends that just left the party. Now they walk the street, bare feet, sipping neat Bacardi, clothed in the best finery that money can buy. Matching dresses, low cut, split to the thigh. Both without coats, though the night is far from balmy, one's sick beneath a street lamp, swaying like a palm tree, the other holds her hair back like a wayward auntie trying to teach her niece how to let her aura dance free. It's half three, early birds chirping already, wiping sick from lips, struggling to walk steady. They hold each other up, pausing now and then to glug as two bobbies on the beat walk past and shrug. Just another couple drunks walking from a club Sick to my back teeth of cleaning all this up I should be in bed with my wife Not fearing for my life All it takes is one drunk nutter with a knife And that's why I'm trying to change to desk duty When I was 25 it was fine But these nights don't suit me I sleep in the day and I don't get to see Judy They grow so fast She's my little princess but these years won't last one day she'll be mugging off boys who show no class and hide behind logos in no-go bars. These two friends walk slow past the buzzing kebab shop, man them with side bags, peddling cash crops through open car windows, surreptitious handshakes, late night drunkards, on the brink of rampage, Z-list celebrities wish for secondhand fame. Everybody's out here trying to dodge the rat race. The wind picks up like a political campaign. Picture me waiting for a bus with a sad face, taking it all in. The night turned morning. Relationships flounder, set adrift of their mooring. Nobody listens, but this guy's still talking. Watch when I catch them, man fam. It's a war thing. Even his friends ignore him, our actors keep walking. If you can call it walking, this act of contortion, proceeding with caution through streetlit distortion. Nighttime predators fiending for a portion. Nighttime revelers who won't heed the warning. Everyone's just trying to get away the same story. But hard times are coming like the rain, and it's pouring. Yes, hard times are coming like the rain and it's pouring. The latch capitulates. Stepdad doesn't whistle, walks through the cream door, hunched, plucks the remote from the coffee table, mutes Scooby-Doo on the Grundy.
walks through the cream door hunched, plucks the remote from the coffee table, mutes Scooby-Doo on the Grundig. Stepdad doesn't whistle, walks through the cream door hunched, plucks the remote from the coffee table, the latch capitulates. Stepdad doesn't whistle walks through the cream door, hunched, plucks the remote from the coffee table, mutes Scooby-Doo on the Grundy. Blues for Albert Prodigy Johnson and Carl Hasty Samuel. Another scribe of black trauma has passed. From this life into the spirit world or nothingness, depending on how much store you set by Nietzsche. Apt that the arch laureate of nihilism comes to mind when I think of Prodigy, old before his time, as I was old before mine. We passed an adroitly rolled zoot round a circle in Barking before it had a health spa. One of our number was confined these times to his room by shame, a death of some kind. Because lying under a sky pockmarked with stars, he asked his girlfriend why she was so quiet. When Hasty walked or fell in front of the lorry, did he pass away? If I can still hear him going back to back with Kesta and Raps. If I think of him standing shoulder to shoulder with Prodigy in a circle of dead MCs, screwing up his face, singing. Listen up, I'm so raw. You know I'm MC Hasty and I'm on tour. When I spit my lyrics, them I shout more. When I give you more, the people them will be so sore. In the year of our Lord, 2003, Tox was still passing himself off as little dizzy, though Tox was by then closer in height to Jamacabe. After Lord of the Mics dropped, the gas was such it just took a younger bussing a half-decent beatbox for the clash to start. Everyone played their part, from the hype men spitting lines back like a space echo to those standing just outside the cipher, but close enough to cuss the vanquished when a space opened for him to walk in the unforgiving light of mediocrity. This was before anyone in our circle had been stabbed or shifted. Some had shouldered a wooden box, but none of us understood the cost of the shanks and skengs in our lyrics. If we knew these days as halcyon, it's hard to say. The mind is some next ends. We wouldn't have been caught dead, slipping. Convinced as we were, the patch of grass beside the golden fish was big enough to constitute a world.
about the work I was commissioned to do. Like a woman possessed, I sat at the library. It's not easy having to write over all the lives I haven't suffered with, but I wanted to try. Like a king with his shit under control, I kept an eye on the northwest quarter. I wanted to see if I could penetrate the hood in the kingdom. My screen instilled in me all the hope I could ask for. My keyboard shone at me, I thought. The road I'm looking out at is a knife through the neighborhood. I was like a woman possessed at all the minds I was going to impose on. When at long last I reached what is called the disillusioned community, I was giving a hunt wine and a single skin rolled inside out as thanks for everything. Someone commended me on my dialogue, another on my ability to identify with others. I bowed and thanked them. I expressed that something was under transformation. Then I put on my ghetto voice, the one I had used to get into all their minds. I said, fuck your whiteness, you ivory feminism and Nazi children. Stand in the way of all the shattered hopes I was planning to heal. I was no longer possessed. I spoke with a straight tongue. Here in song, Kopai Hagen, rampant truth syndrome. I said, why not liquidate one another tonight? Death drives a moped, wearing a helmet and a puffer jacket of hate with the joint still shining so bright and orange. The gravitas was spread across what I assume were the appalled faces of my audience when shortly after I jumped down from the stage. And as I stage dived, as I metered out their punishment, I am bickerly. First, I wrapped out my arrest order. The time is 0223, I said in a voice befitting an admiral butterfly. And you are under arrest for your colonial charm, paradise papers, and grim ulterior motives. To take a seat in my flow TV with your easy unease. What's more that you think I'm steeped in authenticity, I said, and pointed at to my eye a particularly anal and one-track person will only come back on you. Hovering above us, a helicopter, tyrannous and jealous as a big brother, it drove me batty on an election night like this, where I dream that once and for all, the usual winners aren't emerging from behind glass doors and gates to proclaim the victory. The campaign posters are hanging by the dozen here on Red Square and dangling from a lamppost is a social democrat blindfolded and marked as a class trader or with the blood of, his, of the rose have written across his face. If black sonnets were my model back then, this is Danish time, my Ulrike Marie Meinhof. But the red currant bushes are not blooming like flames. Here the rain is bitter and hard like a local politician's stick. Now the basement is up to his nick and shit. Now Rat Daddy has had another party. Now there are gangbangs in all the provincial hovels. Now there's knocking and pounding in my pipes and badly built soil stacks. Say hi to Red Daddy, Mr. Sewer Inspector. Say hi to hillbillies and hobos. Say hi to neglected children on my morning radio when they are subjected to serial incest on my Netflix in an infinite season finales. My brain has switched to flight mode due to streaming and radiation due to drones and dodgy dope. So don't ask me if the moon is a melon rent or old cheese, if it's still lovely out in the country, if there is a third way, because I don't know. Instead, 
come and help me, story-eyed offspring born in March, last to arrive on the equinox at that. Give me a hand when I live stream from the lawn of the breastfeeding clinic and the lattice of indifference. Help me make hits and tells of things that should go without saying, such as uprising and fire, fire for the damned. Then I'll set you free as best I can. Because I still hate where nothing is forgotten, nothing is forgiven. Nevertheless, it's peaceful here today in the recesses of my heart. Though I'll probably never have a Christian stage in my life and will fly on the wings of forgiveness, I swear on my father's Quran that this day will remain good. Like Strunge, I need to dream of anything but hospital attacks and collapsed systems of infants and brain-damaged boys in search of parents in ruins and rubble, in Mosul, in Thais, in Qatar. Because I can fill the halls of mercy with that shit. And I don't trust pacifists and priests. I don't trust myself when with my macro mouth I bite off more that I can chew and preach to those who care to listen. Don't be such a keep peacekeeper. You could be your own radicalized self in my company. So therefore I beseech you, besmirch you. Were you a tourist in the slum yesterday? Were you feeling luxurious and apocalyptic? Apolitically, did you distinguish between bodies and lies? And then went home and masturbated to the destruction. Then you went home and scraped secretion and gold leaf of the horror of the experience and hung it around your neck like a blood dripping diamond that you can write a poem about. I have no paradoxical reactions to the political events. I see everything perfectly clear. There's professional hatred in the politicians' eyes, paranoia and nostalgia. I'm tormented once again by the useless guilt shamefully bear, a pain that is not mine, but I offer no resistance. Just write a satirical poem, contrafactual and historyless, about one of the beloved, about the Nazi history stored on his browser. For there is no dynamite, no other techniques when they attack with cannons. Only bad poetry and placards held up in front of the entrance to the Ministry of so-called Justice. I have attended meetings and protests since I was 16, but I no longer believe in that. I have violent dreams in a language that is stupid and simple. Judgment Day, Flag Day, Saturday. Victory tunes and hymns on my Spotify on my birthday. And in every near future, a fetishization of fins and crystal clear skin. I have no sense of Western values. I'm not going to force the election curtain once more to participate in democracy. Our relationship is as good as dead. What then is left other than American-led road maps that lead into an abyss of empty frets and contrived consternation over chlorine gas and sarin, an oxygen mask on a chilled face in Duma, followed by a press seance in Washington. The obli the obli the obli sorry, meeting on the Security Council, a show of French, German, British, now Saudi Arabian compassion at the use of chemical warfare with nerve agents. Capitalism's wonderful, steely-faced smile, certain of success, after the US State Department makes it clear that once again, America will not respond militarily. Oh, to be a small burst of missiles racing anonymously across the sky to destroy the Pharisaic face.
So don't hold out any hope. I'm not going to extinguish the glow, the gall that flows so quickly and unimpeded from my black sensation seeking heart because I only just begun. Agit prop today and manifesto tomorrow. As to literature, they say I'm indifferent. To that I say, all of that toying with death, all of the co catches car voting, when my face becomes as smooth as a high school student's, I smash it against a rock. Otherwise, what's the point? An entire people fucked over, poisoned and caught between soldiers and inadequate sewage treatment plants. Gaza, godforsaken and soon uninhabitable. So don't lecture me. Instead, explain to me the proportionality about the use of force at every single Friday protest, about illegal orders, about the shooting of unarmed people who pose no threat, about the UN asking both parties to show restraint. Talk to me about that, because I too have intransigence as a coat of arms, not democracy tattooed on my upper arm like some pathetic yearning to belong an internal half-blood with the potential for terrorism. And I don't do pilgrimages. So better to die standing than to live kneeling, as the bikers say, even though it was the communist leader, the woman, who during the Spanish Civil War, La Pasinaria, invented the slogans. But of course you can try as you stand there, pressed and patriotic, to pierce the shell of brightest abhorrence you believe I bear like a heavy-handed insignia. You thought you were a ticking bomb on the democracy, that you should be kept on a short leash, that the recipe for revolution and fire was in your black book, but the only thing you found was the discarded identity of an artist sitting half-lying, wallowing, if not in your own, then in the death of others. Nevertheless, you continue to sing, leave the faint days behind you, set aside sorrow organs and death violence. For if they use chicanery, they're in for sabotage. Go back, go back but we only want to go forward. When they make the terrible intolerable, they get uprising and fire. And now, completely drained of feelings and endorphins, just a cluster of molecules all haplessly arranged with HBO under the skin, so as not to think. Fatal summer, soon nuclear winter. Red ranking at the summer house, the sun shone brightly while I grew strong in the belief that nothing gets better. All of that I want to say, but dare not to friends and editors. In your refugees and sheltered workshops, all of that freedom of speech is so wide and so easy. But like a French suburb in flames, I too am returned to order. Simply lie still, regretting everything. Afraid that the changing of seasons is becoming infinitesimal. For there is no catharsis, no relief. Wake up still torn to pieces and utterly apprehensive, like an Ola Jolene poem with Italian violence in my sleepless night's eyelids. And under the flyover, on plastic sheeting, in chattered sleeping bags, with history's fist in the face, in border towns and small backwaters with pensioners barricaded inside stone houses and the contempt in full bloom, Europe dies a little more.
Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, you just heard Kayo Chingoni, Maria uh, Chusfon, Luna Aberas, Sandra Kolsta, and Marianne Stranger perform The Politics of Emotions. And uh, now uh, Maria will sign her books, uh, Kinderhor, uh, at the table over there. Uh, and then there will be more music here on this stage in only a few minutes.
just touch? So we just touch? Snart är sex och tjug Och i dig är så drug Ischu trut i den tid och eva om Gifte lucka skulle falla mig så tom Bela röre vänta mange Och i dig är så mange Möjkär ing må i gang Ischu kan du köra hos dig att dig Gud är inte bela vill till mig Hur mig och sedan laga Fyr fem år tjugo hiv Ringar oss hur djur giv Lejer i giva sil tjugo hur Kista midan är smekande full Skinnfällar är vi många Kyr i vägar på båsen Här är på jag halv och råsen Sen vi hivit på en stad inne ni Sy med stad en och sy med stad tri Ändå kom han den dåsen Dam di du di du di dam di du di di do Dam di du di du di dam di du di di do Dam di du di di dam di du di di do Dam di du di di dam di du di di do Dam di du di dam di du di di do Dam di du di 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 dam di du di di do Dam di du di 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 dam di du di di do This was a traditional song from Norway about a woman who couldn't care less if she was married or not, because if she wasn't married, she would have even more time to drink brandy and smoke pipe. Uh, the rest of our little program will be uh, uh, poets from Norway that we made music to. And the first poet that we brought That is Jon Fosse. Maybe you know him. He's a famous uh, playwright, foremost, and also poet. And it is his uh, 60 years uh, anniversary this year, so we have had a Fosse festival in Oslo, and we made this uh, uh, song to that uh, to that festival. And uh, the poem is called "Auge i Wind." Uh, Auge im Wind. And I think that it is about trying to reach out to each other from a dark and lonely place within and to reach each other from this place. Men det er vel noe vi kanskje kan forstå 
Thank you, sir. The next uh, poet that we brought is Hans Bøhrli. He was called the poet of the forest. He, he worked all his life as a timberman cutting down trees in the forest besides writing poems. And uh, you can feel the nature in his uh, poems in a very special way. I know that he is translated into German and many other languages as well. Uh, in this poem, Veverskin Tid, he sees the time itself as a blonde woman sitting under a tree, weaving on her cloth, weaving your life into her cloth and weaving sorrow uh, into song and darkness into light. Then 
have a poem by Ragnar Hovland that is called Ute på havet it's out on the ocean out at sea and um, it's a lot of sea alongside Norway's coastline so there have been many fishermen and fisherwomen and there they still are uh, and now we are fishing and we are sitting in a little boat out in the big ocean and we have just survived a storm and we are fishing a little bit but we're singing and we are drinking and we're glad that we survived the storm Dum da 
The music for this song was actually made by Gabriel Flifet, so we have said that. Um, the next poem is by the same poet, Ragnar Hovland. And you know this old myth about wolves bringing up human children that are 
being set out in the forest. This uh, is a kind of a sweet poem about that and how exhausting it is for the wolves to bring up all these human children that are being put out and put out and put out in the forest. And uh, the children, this they... This was before birth control. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's the reason why it was so exhausting for the wolves. And, uh, and uh, the children, they was drinking uh, wolf milk and learned the wolf language and they got very sharp teeth. And this is our last song. Lucky to be the last uh, concert here <laughs> tonight, so we got permission to take another song only if you want to hear. Oh, oh. 
Welcome to our concert tomorrow night at Monstone. <laughs> 